Section 0 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Frude. Introduction. The mythic element cannot be eliminated out of history. Men who play leading parts on the world stage gather about them the admiration of friends and the animosity of disappointed rivals or political enemies. The atmosphere becomes charged with legends of what they have said or done. Some inventions, some distortions of facts, but rarely or never accurate. Their outward acts, being public, cannot be absolutely misstated. Their motives, being known only to themselves, are an open field for imagination. And, as the disposition is to believe evil rather than good, the portraits drawn may vary indefinitely, according to the sympathies of the describer, but are seldom too favourable. The more distinguished a man is, the more he is talked about. Stories are current about him in his own lifetime, guaranteed apparently by the highest authorities, related, insisted upon, time, place and circumstance accurately given, most of them mere malicious lies. Yet, if written down to reappear in memoirs a hundred years hence, they are likely to pass for authentic, or at least probable. Even when there is no malice, imagination will still be active. People believe or disbelieve, repeat or suppress, according to their own inclinations. And death, which ends the feuds of unimportant persons, lets loose the tongues over the characters of the great. Kings are especially sufferers. When alive, they hear only flattery. When they are gone, men revenge themselves by drawing hideous portraits of them, and the more distinguished they may have been, the more minutely their weaknesses are dwelt upon. C'est un plaisir indicible, says Voltaire, de donner des décrets contre des souverains morcons on ne peut en lancer contre eux de leur vivant de peu de perdre ses oreilles. The dead sovereigns go their way. Their real work for good or evil lives after them. But they themselves are where the opinions expressed about their character affect them no more. To Caesar or Napoleon, it matters nothing what judgment the world passes upon their conduct. It is of more importance for the ethical value of history that acts which, as they are related to appear wicked, should be duly condemned that acts which are represented as having advanced the welfare of mankind should be duly honoured, than that the real character of individuals should be correctly appreciated. To appreciate any single man with complete accuracy is impossible. To appreciate him even proximately is extremely difficult. Rulers of kingdoms may have public reasons for what they do, which at the time may be understood or allowed for. Times change and new interests arise. The circumstances no longer exist which would explain their conduct. The student looks, therefore, for an explanation in elements which he thinks he understands. In pride, ambition, fear, avarice, jealousy, or sensuality. And, settling the question thus to his own satisfaction, resents or ridicules attempts to look for other motives. So long as his moral judgment is generally correct, he inflicts no injury, and he suffers none. Cruelty and lust are proper objects of abhorrence. He learns to detest them in studying the Tiberius of Tacitus, though the character described by the great Roman historian may have been a mere creation of the hatred of the old Roman aristocracy. The manifesto of the Prince of Orange was a libel against Philip II, but the Philip of Protestant tradition is an embodiment of the persecuting spirit of Catholic Europe, which it would now be useless to disturb. The tendency of history is to fall into wholesome moral lines, whether they be accurate or not, and to interfere with harmless illusions may cause greater errors than it aspires to cure. Crowned offenders are arraigned at the tribunal of history for the crimes which they are alleged to have committed. It may be sometimes shown that the crimes were not crimes at all, that the sufferers had deserved their fate, that the severities were useful and essential for some great and valuable purpose but the reader sees in the apology for acts which he had regarded as tyrannical a defence of tyranny itself. Preoccupied with the received interpretation, he finds deeds excused which he had learned to execrate, And, 
in learning something which, even if true, is of no real moment to him, he suffers in the maiming of his perceptions of the difference between right and wrong. The whitewashing of the villains of tradition is, therefore, justly regarded as waste of labour. If successful, it is of imperfect value. If unsuccessful, it is a misuse of industry which deserves to be censured. Time is too precious to be squandered over paradoxes. The dead are gone. The censure of mankind has written their epitaphs, and so they may be left. Their true award will be decided elsewhere. This is the common sense verdict. When the work of a man is done and ended, when, except indirectly and invisibly, he affects the living world no more, the book is closed, the sentence is passed, and there he may be allowed to rest. The case is altered, however, when the dead still live in their actions, when their principles and the effects of their conduct are still vigorous and operative, and the movements which they initiated continue to be fought over. It sometimes happens that mighty revolutions can be traced to the will and resolution of a single man, and that the conflict continues when he is gone. The personal character of such a man becomes then of intrinsic importance as an argument for attack or defence. The changes, introduced by Henry VIII, are still denounced or defended with renewed violence. The ashes of a conflict which seem to have been decided are again blown into a flame. And what manner of man Henry was, and what the statesmen and churchmen were who stood by him and assisted him in reshaping the English constitution, becomes a practical question of our own time. By their fruits ye shall know them. A good tree cannot bear evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Roman Catholics argue from the act to the man, and from the man back to the act. The Reformation, they say, was a rebellion against an authority appointed by God for the rule of the world. It was a wicked act in itself. The author, or the authors of it, were presumably therefore themselves wicked, and the worst interpretation of their conduct is antecedently probable, because a revolt against the Church of Christ could only have originated in depraved hearts. Or again, inverting the argument, they say with sufficient plausibility that the sins and crimes of the king are acknowledged facts of history, that from so bad a man no good thing could ever rise, that Henry was a visible servant of the devil, and therefore the Reformation, of which he was the instrument, was the devil's work. If the picture drawn of him by his Catholic contemporaries is correct, the inference is irresistible. That picture, however, was drawn by those whose faith he wounded, and whose interests he touched, and therefore might be regarded with suspicion. Religious animosity is fertile in calumny, because it assumes beforehand that every charge is likely to be true in proportion to its enormity, and Catholic writers were credulous of evil when laid to the charge of so dangerous an adversary. But the Catholics have not been Henry's only accusers. All sorts and sects have combined in the general condemnation. The Anglican High Churchman is as bitter against him as Reginald Pole himself. He admits and maintains the separation from Rome which Henry accomplished for him, but he abhors as heartily as Pole or lingered the internal principles of the Reformation. He resents the control of the clergy by the civil power. He demands the restoration of the spiritual privileges which Henry and his parliaments took away from them. He aspires to the recovery of ecclesiastical independence. He therefore, with equal triumph, points to the blots in Henry's character, and deepens their shade with every accusation, proved or unproved, which he can find in contemporary records. With him, too, that a charge was alleged at the time is evidence sufficient to entitle him to accept it as a fact. Again, Protestant writers have been no less unsparing, from an imprudent eagerness to detach their cause from a disreputable ally. In Elizabeth's time, it was a point of honour and loyalty to believe in the innocence of her mother. If Anne Boleyn was condemned on forged or false evidence to make way for Jane Seymour, what appears so clearly to us must have been far clearer to Henry and his council. Of all abominable crimes committed by tyrannical princes, there was never one more base or cowardly than Anne's execution. And insisting on Anne's guiltlessness, they have condemned the king, his ministers, and his parliaments. Having discovered him to have murdered his wife, they have found him also to have been a persecutor of the truth. 
the Reformation in England was at its outset political rather than doctrinal. The avarice and tyranny of the church officials had galled the limbs of the laity. Their first steps were to break the chains which fretted them and to put a final end to the temporal power of the clergy. Spiritual liberty came later and came slowly from the constitution of the English mind. Superstition had been familiarised by custom, protected by natural reverence, and shielded from inquiry by the peculiar horror attaching to unbelief. The nation had been taught from immemorial time that to doubt on the mysteries of faith was the worst crime which man could commit, and while they were willing to discover that on their human side the clergy were but brother mortals of questionable character, they drew a distinction between the church as a national institution and the doctrines which it taught. An old creed could not yield at once. The king did much. He protected individual Lutherans to the edge of rashness. He gave the nation the English Bible. He made Latimer a bishop. He took away completely and forever the power of the prelates to punish what they called heresy ex officio and on their own authority. But the zeal of the ultra-Protestants broke loose when the restraint was taken off. The sense of the country was offended by the irreverence to which objects and opinions were treated, which they regarded as holy, and Parliament, which had put a bit in the mouth of the ecclesiastical courts, was driven to a substitute in the Bill of the Six Articles. The advanced section in popular movements is usually unwise. The characteristic excellence of the English Reformation is that throughout its course it was restrained by the law and the Six Articles Bill, tempered as it was in the execution, was a permissible, and perhaps useful, measure in restraint of intemperance. It was the same in Germany. Anabaptists continued to be burnt in Saxony and Hesse long after Luther's revolt. Calvin thought the stake a fitting penalty for doubts upon the Trinity. John Knox in Scotland approved of witch-burning and sending mass priests to the gallows. Henry could not disregard the pronounced feeling of the majority of the English people, he was himself but one of them, and changed slowly as they changed. Yet Protestant tradition has assumed that the bloody whip with six strings was an act of arbitrary ferocity. It considers that the king could, and ought to, have advanced at once into an understanding of the principle of toleration, toleration of the new opinions, and a more severe repression of the old. The Puritans and Evangelicals forgot that he had given them the English Testament. They forgot that by setting his foot upon the bishops he had opened the pulpits to themselves, and they classed him among the persecutors, or else joined in the shallow laughs of the ultramontane Catholics at what they pleased to call his inconsistency. Thus from all sides a catena of invective has been wrapped about Henry's character. The sensible part of the country held its tongue. The speakers and writers were the passionate and fanatical of both persuasions, and by them the materials were supplied for the Henry VIII who has been brought down to us by history, while the candid and philosophic thinkers of the last and present centuries have accepted the traditional figure. In their desire to be impartial, they have held the balance equal between Catholics and Protestants, inclining slightly to the Catholic side from a wish to conciliate a respectable body who had been unjustly maligned and oppressed, while they have lavished invectives upon the early reformers violent enough to have satisfied even Pole himself, whose rhetoric has formed the base of their declamation. Liberal philosophy would have had a bad time of it in England, perhaps in all Europe, if there had been no Henry the Eighth to take the Pope by the throat. For one service, writers like Macaulay have undoubtedly accomplished. They have shown that it is entirely impossible to separate the king from his ministers, to condemn Henry and to spare Cranmer. Protestant writers from Burnet to Southey have tried to save the reforming bishops and statesmen at Henry's expense. Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley have been described as saints, though their master was a villain. But the cold impartiality of Macaulay has pointed out unanswerably that in all Henry's most questionable acts, his own ministers and his prelates were active participants that his privy council, his parliaments, his judges on the bench, the juries impanelled to try the victims of his tyranny, were equally his accomplices, some actively assisting, the rest, if these acts were really criminal, permitting themselves to be bribed or terrified into acquiescence. The leading men of all descriptions, the nation itself, through the guilt of its representatives, 
were all stained in the same detestable colours. It may be said, indeed, that they were worse than the king himself, for the king at least may be pleaded the coarse temptations of a brutal nature, but what palliation can be urged for the peers and judges who sacrificed Anne Boleyn, or Moore, or Fisher, according to the received hypothesis? Not even the excuse of personal fear of an all-powerful despot, for Henry had no janissaries or praetorians to defend his person or execute his orders. He had but his hundred yeomen of the guard, not more numerous than the ordinary followers of a second-rate noble. The Catholic leaders, who were infuriated at his attacks upon the church, and would, if they could, have introduced foreign armies to dethrone him, insisted on his weakness as an encouragement to an easy enterprise. Beyond those few yeomen, they urged that he had no protection save in the attachment of the subjects whom he was alienating. What strange influence was such a king able to exercise that he could overawe the lords and gentry of England, the learned professions, the municipal authorities? How was it that he was able to compel them to be the voluntary instruments of his cruelty? Strangest of all, he seems to have needed no protection, but rather to have been personally popular, even among those who disapproved his public policy. The air was charged with threats of insurrection, but no conspiracy was ever formed to kill him, like those which so often menaced the life of his daughter. When the North was in arms and the pilgrimage of grace, and a question arose among the leaders whether in the event of victory the king was to be deposed, it was found that any one who proposed to remove him would be torn in pieces by the people. Granting that Henry the Eighth was, as Dickens said of him, a spot of blood and grease on the page of English history, the contemporary generation of Englishmen must have been fit subjects of such a sovereign. Every country, says Carlyle, gets as good a government as it deserves. The England of the Cromwells and the Cranmers, the Howards and the Fitzwilliams, the Rothsleys and the Pagets, seems to have been made of baser materials than any land of which mankind has preserved a record. Roman Catholics may fairly plead that out of such a race no spiritual reform is likely to have arisen which could benefit any human soul. Of all the arguments which can be alleged for the return of England to the ancient fold, this is surely the most powerful. Yet England shows no intention of returning. History may say what it pleases, yet England remains tenacious of the liberties which were then won for us, and unconscious of the disgrace attaching to them. Unconscious also that the version of the story which it accepts contains anything which requires explanation. The legislation of Henry VIII, his Privy Council and his Parliaments, is the Magna Charta of the modern world. The Act of Appeals and the Act of Supremacy asserted the national independence and repudiated the interference of foreign bishop, prince or potentate within the limits of the English Empire. The clergy had held for many centuries an imperium in imperio, subject themselves to no law but their own. They had asserted an irresponsible jurisdiction over the souls and bodies of the people. The act for the submission of these persons reduced them to the common condition of subjects under the control of the law. Popes were no longer allowed to dispense with ordinary obligations. Clerical privileges were abolished. The spiritual courts, with their intolerable varieties of iniquity, were swept away, or coerced within rational limits. The religious houses were suppressed, their enormous wealth was applied for the defence of the realm, and the worse than Orgean dunghill of abuses was cleared out with a resolute hand. These great results were accomplished in the face of papal curses, in defiance of superstitious terrors, so despicable when bravely confronted, so terrible while the spectre of supernatural power was still unexorcised. In the face, too, of earthly perils which might make stout hearts shake, of an infuriated priesthood stirring the people into rebellion, of an exasperated Catholic Europe threatening fire and sword in the name of the Pope. These were distinguished achievements, not likely to have been done at all by an infamous prince and infamous ministers yet done so well that their work is incorporated in the Constitution almost in the form in which they left it, and this mighty revolution, the greatest and most far-reaching in modern times, was accomplished without a civil war, by firmness of hand, by the action of Parliament, and a resolute enforcement of the law. 
nor has the effect of Henry's legislation been confined to England. Every great country, Catholic or Protestant, has practically adopted its chief provisions. Popes no longer pretend a power of deposing princes, absolving subjects from their allegiance, or selling dispensations for offences against the law of the land. Appeals are no longer carried from the national courts to the court of the Rota. The papal treasury is no longer supplied by the plunder of the national clergy, collected by resident papal officials. Bishops and convocations have ceased to legislate above and independent of the secular authority, and clerks who commit crimes bear the same penalties as the profane. The high quality of the Reformation statutes is guaranteed by their endurance, and it is hard to suppose that the politicians who conceived and carried them out were men of base conditions. The question is not of the character of the king. If nothing was at issue but the merits or demerits of a single sovereign, he might be left where he lies. The question is of the characters of the reforming leaders, who jointly with the king were the authors of this tremendous and beneficent revolution. Henry and all that he did acted with these men and through them. Is it possible to believe that qualities so opposite as the popular theory requires existed in the same persons? Is it possible, for instance, that Cranmer, who composed or translated the prayers in the English liturgy, was the miserable wretch which Macaulay or Lingard describes? The era of Elizabeth was the outspring of the movement which Henry VIII commenced, and it was the grandest period in English history. Is it credible that so invigorating a stream flowed from a polluted fountain? Before accepting a conclusion so disgraceful, before consigning the men who achieved so great a victory and risked and lost their lives in the battle to final execration, it is at least permissible to pause. The difficulty can only be made light of by impatience, by prejudice, or by want of thought. To me, at any rate, who wished to discover what the real history of the Reformation had been, it seemed so considerable that, dismissing the polemical invectives of later writers, I turned to the accounts of their conduct, which had been left behind by the authors of it themselves. Among the fortunate anomalies of the situation, Henry departed from previous custom in holding annual parliaments. At every step which he took, either in the rearrangement of the realm or of his own domestic confusions, he took the lords and commons into his council, and ventured nothing without their consent. The preambles of the principal statutes contain a narrative clear and precise of the motives of everything that he did. A narrative which at least may have been a true one, which was not put forward as a defence, but was a mere explanation of acts which on the surface seemed violent and arbitrary. If the explanation is correct, it shows us a time of complications and difficulties, which on the whole were successfully encountered. It shows us severe measures severely executed, but directed to public and necessary purpose, involving no sycophancy or baseness, no mean subservience to capricious tyranny, but such as were the natural safeguards during a dangerous convulsion, or remedies of accidents incidental to hereditary monarchy. The story told is clear and distinct, pitiless but not dishonourable. Between the lines can be read the storm of popular passions, the beating of the national heart when it was stirred to its inmost depths. We see established institutions rooted out, idols overthrown, and injured worship has exasperated to fury. The air, as was inevitable at such a crisis, full of flying rumours, some lies, some half-lies with fragments of truth attaching to them, bred of malice or dizzy brains, the materials out of which the popular tradition has been built. It was no insular revolution. The stake played for was the liberty of mankind. All Europe was watching England, for England was the hinge on which the fate of the Reformation turned. Could it be crushed in England? The Catholics were assured of universal victory, and therefore tongues and pens were busy everywhere throughout Christendom, Catholic imagination representing Henry as an incarnate Satan, for which, it must be admitted, his domestic misadventures gave them tempting opportunities. So thick fell the showers of calumny, that bold as he was, he at times himself winced under it. He complained to Charles V that the libels circulated about him in France and Flanders. Charles, too, had suffered in the same way. 
he answered humorously, that if kings gave occasion to be spoken about, they would be spoken about. Kings were not kings of tongues. Henry the Eighth was an easy mark for slander. But of all slanders are to pass as true which are flung at public men whose policy provides them with an army of calumniators, the reputation of the best of them is but a spotted rag. The clergy were the vocal part of Europe. They had the pulpits. They had the writing of the books and pamphlets. They had cause to hate Henry. They hated him with an intensity of passion which could not have been more savage had he been the devil himself. But there are men whose enmity is a compliment. They libelled Luther almost as freely as they libelled the English king. I myself, after reading and weighing all that I could find forty years ago in print civil manuscripts, concluded that the real facts of Henry's conduct were to be found in the statute book and nowhere else, that the preambles of the Acts of Parliament did actually represent the sincere opinion about him of the educated layman of England, who had better opportunities of knowing the truth than we can have, that a modern Englishman may be allowed to follow their authority without the imputation of paradox or folly. With this impression, and with the statute book for a guide, I wrote the opening portion of my history of England from the fall of Wolsey to the defeat of the Armada. The published criticisms upon my work were generally unfavourable. Catholic writers inherited the traditions and the temper of their forefathers, and believed the catena of their own historians. Protestants could not believe in a defence of the author of the Six Articles Bill. Secular reviewers were easily witty at the model husband whom they supposed me to be imposing upon them, and resented the interference with a version of the story authenticated by great names among my predecessors. The public, however, took an interest in what I had to say. The book was read and continues to be read. At the close of my life, therefore, I have to go once more over the ground. And as I am still substantially alone in maintaining an opinion considered heretical by orthodox historians, I have to decide in what condition I am to leave my work behind me. In the thirty-five years which have elapsed since those early volumes appeared, large additions have been made to the materials for the history of the period. The vast collection of manuscripts in the English record office, which then were only partially accessible, have been sorted, catalogued and calendared by the industry of my friends Mr. Brewer and Mr. Gebner. Private collections in great English houses have been examined and reported on by the Historical Manuscripts Commission. Foreign archives at Paris, Simonacus, Rome, Venice, Vienna and Brussels have been searched to some extent by myself, but in a far larger degree by able scholars specially appointed for the purpose. In the dispatches thus made accessible of the foreign ambassadors resident at Henry's court, we have the invaluable, if not impartial, comments of trained and responsible politicians who related from day to day the events which were passing under their eyes. Being Catholics and representatives of Catholic powers, they were bitterly hostile to the Reformation, hostile alike on political grounds and religious, and therefore inclined to believe and report the worst that could be said both of it and of its authors. But they wrote before the traditions had become stereotyped. Their accounts are fresh and original, and being men of the world and writing in confidence to their own masters, they were as voracious as their prejudices would allow them to be. Unconsciously, too, they render another service of infinite importance, being in close communication with the disaffected English peers and clergy, and engage with them secretly in promoting rebellion. The ministers of Charles V reveal with extraordinary clearness the dangers with which the government had to deal. They make it perfectly plain that the act of supremacy, with its stern and peremptory demands, was no more than a legitimate and necessary defence against organised treason. It was thus inevitable that much would have to be added to what I had already published. When a microscope is applied to the petal of a flower or the wing of an insect, simple outlines and simple surfaces are resolved into complex organisms with curious and beautiful details. The effect of these dispatches is precisely the same. We see with the eyes, we hear with the ears of men who were living parts of the scenes which they describe. Stories afterwards elaborated into established facts we trace to their origin and rumours of the hour. We read innumerable anecdotes, some with a clear stamp of truth on them, many mere creations of passing wit or malice, no more authentic than the thousands like them which circulate in modern society, guaranteed by the positive assertions of personal witnesses, yet visibly recognisable as lies. Through all this, the reader must pick his way and use his own judgment. 
He knows that many things are false which are reported about his own eminent contemporaries. He may be equally certain that lies were told as freely then as now. He will probably allow his sympathies to guide him. He will accept as fact that which fits in with his creed or his theory. He will share the general disposition to believe evil, especially about kings and great men. The exaggerated homage paid to princes when they are alive has to be compensated by suspecting the worst of them as soon as they are gone. But the perusal of all these documents leaves the broad aspect of the story, in my opinion, precisely where it was. It is made more interesting by the greater fullness of particulars. It is made more vivid by the clear view which they afford of individual persons who before were no more than names. But I think now, as I thought forty years ago, that through the confusions and contradictions of a stormy and angry time, the statute book remains the safest guide to follow. If there be any difference, it is that actions which, till explained, appeared gratuitously cruel, like the execution of Bishop Fisher, are seen beyond dispute to have been reasonable and just. Bishop Fisher is proved by the words of the Spanish ambassador himself to have invited and pressed the introduction of a foreign Catholic army into England in the Pope's interest. Thus I find nothing to withdraw in what I then wrote, and little to alter save in correcting some small errors of trivial moment. But on the other hand, I find much to add, and the question rises in what way I had better do it, with fair consideration for those who have bought the book as it stands. To take the work to pieces, and introduce the new material into the text or the notes, will impose a necessity of buying a new copy, or of being left with an inferior one, on the many friends who least deserve to be so treated. I have concluded, therefore, on writing an additional volume, where such parts of the story as have had important light thrown upon them can be told over again in ampler form. The body of the history I leave as it stands. It contains what I believe to be a true account of the time of the immediate causes which brought about the changes of the 16th century, and of the characters and principles of the actors in them. I have only to fill up certain deficiencies and throw light into places hitherto left dark. For the rest, I do not pretend to impartiality. I believe the Reformation to have been the greatest incident in English history, the root and source of the expansive force which has spread the Anglo-Saxon race over the globe, and imprinted the English genius and character on the constitution of mankind. I am unwilling to believe more evil than I can help of my countrymen who have accomplished so beneficent a work, and in a book written for such convictions the mythical element cannot be wholly wanting. Even things which immediately surround us, things which we see and touch, we do not perceive as they are. We perceive only our own sensations, and our sensations are a combined result of certain objects and of the faculties which apprehend them. Something of ourselves must always be intermixed before knowledge can reach us. In every conclusion which we form, in every conviction which is forced upon us, there is still a subjective element. It is so in physical science. It is so in art. It is so in our speculations on our own nature. It is so in religion. It is so even in pure mathematics. The curved and rectilineal figures on which we reason are our own creation and have no existence exterior to the reasoning mind. Most of all, it is so in history, for we have no direct perceptions to help us, but are dependent on the narratives of others whose beliefs were necessarily influenced by their personal dispositions. The first duty of an historian is to be on his guard against his own sympathies, but he cannot wholly escape their influence. In judging of the truth of particular statements, the conclusion which he will form must be based partly upon evidence, and partly upon what he conceives to be likely or unlikely. In a court of justice, where witnesses can be cross-examined, uncertain elements can in some degree be eliminated. Yet, after all care is taken, judges and juries have often been blinded by passion and prejudice. When we have nothing before us but rumours set in circulation, we know not by whom or on what authority, and we are driven to consider probabilities. The Protestant, who believes the Reformation to have been a victory of truth over falsehood, cannot come to the same conclusion as the Catholic, who believes it to have been a curse, or perhaps to the same conclusion as the indifferent philosopher, who regards Protestant and Catholic alike with benevolent contempt. For myself, I can but say that I have discriminated with such faculty as I possess. I have kept back nothing. 
I have consciously distorted nothing which conflicts with my own views. I have accepted what seems sufficiently proved. I have rejected what I can find no support for, save in hearsay or prejudice. But whether accepting or rejecting, I have endeavoured to follow the rule that incidents must not be lightly accepted as authentic, which are inconsistent with the universal laws of human nature, and that to disprove a calumny, it is sufficient to show that there is no valid witness for it. Finally, I do not allow myself to be tempted into controversy with the particular writers whose views disagree with my own. To contradict in detail every hostile version of Henry VIII's or his minister's conduct would be as tedious as it would be irritating and unprofitable. My senses have been so many that a reply to them all is impossible, and so distinguished that a selection would be invidious. Those who wish for invectives against the King or Cranmer or Cromwell can find them everywhere from school manuals to the grave works of elaborate historians. For me, it is enough to tell the story as it presents itself to my own mind, and to leave what appears to me to be the truth to speak for itself. The English nation throughout their long history is born in honourable reputation. Luther quotes the saying of Maximilian that there were three real sovereigns in Europe, the Emperor, the King of France, and the King of England. The Emperor was a King of Kings. If he gave an order to the Princes of the Reich, they obeyed or disobeyed as they pleased. The king of France was a king of asses. He ordered about his people at his will, and they obeyed like asses. The king of England was a king of a loyal nation, who obeyed him with heart and mind as loyal and faithful subjects. This was the character born in the world by the fathers of the generation whom popular historians represent as having dishonoured themselves by subserviency to a bloodthirsty tyrant. It is at least possible that popular historians have been mistaken, that the subjects of Henry VIII were neither much better nor much worse than those who preceded or came after them. End of section zero. Chapter one of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 1. In the year 1526, the political prospects of England became seriously clouded. A disputed succession had led in the previous century to a desperate civil war. In that year, it became known in private circles that if Henry VIII was to die, the realm would again be left without a certain heir, and that the strife of the roses might be renewed on an even more distracting scale. The sons who had been born to Queen Catherine had died in childbirth, or had died immediately after it. The passionate hope of the country that she might still produce a male child who would survive had been constantly disappointed, and now could be entertained no longer. She was eight years older than her husband. She had certain diseases, which made it impossible that she should again be pregnant, and Henry had for two years ceased to cohabit with her. He had two children still living, the Princess Mary, Catherine's daughter, then a girl of eleven, and an illegitimate son born in 1519, the mother being a daughter of Sir John Blount, and married afterwards to Sir Gilbert Torboys. By presumptive law, the princess was the next heir, but no woman had ever sat on the throne of England alone and in her own right, and it was doubtful whether the nation would submit to a female sovereign. The boy, though excluded by his birth from the prospect of the crown, was yet brought up with exceptional care, called a prince by his tutors, and probably regarded by his father as a possible successor should his sister go the way of her brothers. In 1525, after the king had deliberately withdrawn from Catherine, he was created Duke of Richmond, a title of peculiar significance, since it had been borne by his grandfather, Henry the Seventh, and he was granted precedence over the rest of the peerage. Illegitimacy was a serious, but, it might be thought, was not an absolute bar. The conqueror had himself been a bastard. The church, by its habits of granting dispensations for irregular marriages, or of dissolving them on pleas of affinity or consanguinity or other pretext, had confused the distinction between legitimate and illegitimate. A church court had illegitimatized the children of Edward the Fourth and Elizabeth Grey, 
on the ground of one of Edward's previous connections. Yet no one regarded the princes murdered in the tower as having been illegitimate in reality, and to prevent disputes and for an adequate object, the Duke of Richmond, had he grown to manhood, might, in the absence of other claims, have been recognised by Parliament. But the Duke was still a child, and might die as Henry's other sons had died, and other claims there were which, in the face of the bar sinister, could not fail to be asserted. James V of Scotland was next in blood, being the son of Henry's eldest sister Margaret. There were the Greys, inheriting from the second sister, Mary. Outside the royal house there were still the popular representatives of the White Rose, the Marquis of Exeter, who was Edward IV's grandson, the Countess of Salisbury, daughter of Edward's brother, the Duke of Clarence, and sister of the murdered Earl of Warwick. And Henry's life was the only obstacle between the collision of these opposing pretensions. James, it was quite certain, would not be allowed to succeed without a struggle. National rivalry forbade it. Yet it was no less certain that he would try, and would probably be backed by France. There was but one escape from convulsions that might easily be the ruin of the realm. The king was in the flower of his age, and might naturally look for a prince of Wales to come after him if he was married to a woman capable of bearing one. It is neither unnatural, nor under the circumstances a matter to be censured, if he and others began to reflect upon the peculiar character of his connection with Catherine of Aragon. It is not sufficiently remembered that the marriage of a widow with her husband's brother was then, as it is now, forbidden by the laws of all civilised countries. Such a marriage at the present day would be held ipso facto invalid, and not a marriage at all. An irregular power was then held to rest with the successors of St. Peter to dispense, under certain conditions, with the inhibitory rules. The popes are now understood to have never rightly possessed such an authority, and therefore, according to modern law and sentiment, Henry and Catherine never were husband and wife at all. At the time, it was uncertain whether the dispensing power extended so far as to sanction such a union, and when the discussion rose upon it, the Roman canonists were themselves divided. Those who maintained the widest view of the papal faculty, yet, agreed that such a dispensation could only be granted for urgent cause, such as to prevent foreign wars or internal seditions. And no such cause was alleged to have existed when Ferdinand and Henry the Seventh arranged the marriage between their children. The dispensation had been granted by Pope Julius with reluctance, had been acted upon after considerable hesitation, and was of doubtful validity, since the necessary conditions were absent. The marriages of kings were determined with little reference to the personal affections of the parties. Between Henry and Catherine there was probably as much and as little personal attachment as there usually is in such cases. He respected and perhaps admired her character, but she was not beautiful, and she was not attractive, while she was as proud and intractable as her mother Isabella. The union had been settled by the two fathers to cement the alliance between England and Spain. And such connections rest on a different foundation from those which are voluntarily entered into between private persons. What is made up for political reasons may pardonably be dissolved when other reasons of a similar kind require it, and when it became clear that Catherine could never bear another child, that the penalty threatened in the Levitical law against marriages of this precise kind had been literally enforced in the death of the male offspring, and that civil war was imminent in consequence upon the king's death, Henry may have doubted in good faith whether she had ever been his wife at all. Whether, in fact, the marriage was not of the character which everyone would now allow to attach to similar unions, had there been a Prince of Wales, the question would never have arisen, and Henry, like other kings, would have borne his fate. But there was no prince, and the question had risen, and there was no reason why it should not. There was no trace at the outset of an attachment to another woman. If there had been, there would be little to condemn. But Anne Boleyn, when it was first mooted, was no more to the king than any other lady of the court. 
he required a wife who could produce a son to secure the succession. The powers which had allowed an irregular marriage could equally dissolve it, and the king felt he had a right to demand a familiar concession, which other sovereigns had often applied for in one form or another, and rarely in vain. Thus, as early as 1526, certainly, and probably as much as a year before, Cardinal Wolsey had been feeling his way at Rome for a separation between Henry and Catherine. On September the 7th in that year, the Bishop of Bath, who was English ambassador at Paris, informed the Cardinal of the arrival there of a confidential agent of Pope Clement the Seventh. The agent had spoken to the Bishop on this especial subject, and had informed him that there would be difficulties about it. The blessed divorce, Benedictum Divorcium, the bishop calls it, had been already under consideration at Rome. The difficulties were not specified, but the political features of the time obliged Clement to be circumspect, and it was these that were probably referred to. Francis I had been defeated and taken prisoner by the imperialists at Pavia, he had been carried to Spain, and had been released at Henry's intercession, under severe conditions, to which he had reluctantly consented, and his sons had been left at Madrid as hostages for the due fulfilment of them. The victorious army, half Spanish, half German, remained under the Duke of Bourbon to complete the conquest of Italy, and Charles V, with his already vast dominions and a treasury which the world believed to be inexhaustibly supplied from the gold mines of the New World, seemed advancing to universal empire. France, in the preceding centuries, had been the hereditary enemy of England. Spain and Burgundy, her hereditary friends. The marriage of Catherine of Aragon had been a special feature of the established alliance. She was given first to Prince Arthur, and then to Henry, as a link in the confederacy which was to hold in check French ambition. Times were changing. Charles V had been elected emperor, largely through English influence. But Charles was threatening to be a more serious danger to Europe than France had been. The Italian princes were too weak to resist the conqueror of Pavia. Italy once conquered, the papacy would become a dependency of the empire, and with Charles's German subjects in open revolt against it, the church would lose its authority and the organisation of the Catholic world would fall into hopeless decrepitude. So thought Wolsey, the most sharp-sighted of English ministers. He believed that the maintenance of the papacy was the best defence of order and liberty. The only remedy which he could see was a change of partners. England held the balance between the great rival powers. If the English alliance could be transferred from the empire to France, the emperor could be held in check, and his supposed ambition neutralised. Wolsey was utterly mistaken. But the mistake was not an unnatural one. Charles, busy with his Italian wars, had treated the Lutheran schism with suspicious forbearance. Notwithstanding his Indian ingots, his finances were disordered. Bourbon's lansquenet had been left to pay themselves by plunder, they had sacked monasteries, pillaged cathedral plate, and ravished nuns with irreverent ferocity. The estates of the church had been as little spared by them as Lombardy, and to Clement the Seventh, the invasion was another inroad of barbarians, and Bourbon a second Attila. What Bourbon's master meant by it, and what he might intend to do, was as uncertain to Clement as perhaps it was to Charles himself. In the prostrate, degraded, and desperate condition into which the church was falling, any resolution was possible. To the clearest eyes in Europe, the papacy seemed tottering to its fall, and Charles's hand, if he chose to raise it, might precipitate the catastrophe. To ask a pope at such a time to give mortal offence to the Spanish nation by agreeing to the divorce of Catherine of Aragon was to ask him to sign his death warrant. No wonder, therefore, that he found difficulties. Yet it was to France and England that Clement had to look for help in his extremities. The divorce, perhaps, had as yet been no more than a suggestion, a part of a policy which was still in its infancy. He could wait, at any rate, for a more convenient season. Meantime, he sent his secretary, Sanger, to Paris to beg aid. 
and to Henry personally he made a passionate appeal, imploring him not to desert the apostolic see in its hour of extreme need. He apologised for his importunacy, but he said he hoped that history would not have to record that Italy had been devastated in the time of Clement the Seventh to the dishonour of the king and of Wolsey. If France and England failed him, he would himself be ruined. The emperor would be universal monarch. They would open their eyes at last, but they would open them too late. So piteous was the entreaty that Henry, when he read the Pope's letter, burst into tears. Clement had not been idle. He had brought his own small army into the field to oppose Bourbon. He joined the Italian League and prepared to defend himself. He was called the father of Christendom, yet he was at open war with the most Catholic king. But Wolsey reasonably considered that unless the Western powers interfered, the end would come. If England was to act, she could act only in alliance with France, the change of policy was ill understood and was not popular among Henry's subjects. The divorces yet had not been spoken of. No breath of such a purpose had gone abroad. But English sentiment was imperial and could endure with equanimity even the afflictions of a pope. The king was more papal than his people. He allowed Wolsey to guide him, and negotiations were set on foot at once for a special treaty with France one of the conditions of which was to be the marriage of the Princess Mary, allotted like a card in a game, either to Francis or to one of his sons. Another condition being that the English crown should be settled upon her should Henry die without a legitimate son. Sir John Russell was simultaneously dispatched to Rome with money to help the Pope in paying his troops and garrisoning the city. The ducats and the kind words which accompanied them created incredible joy, encouraged His Holiness to reject unjust conditions which had been offered, and restored him, if for the moment only, from death to life. If Russell described correctly what he saw passing through Italy, Clement had good cause for anxiety. The Swabians and Spaniards, he wrote, had committed horrible atrocities, they had burnt houses to the value of two hundred million ducats, with all the churches, images, and priests that fell into their hands. They had compelled the priests and monks to violate the nuns. Even where they were received without opposition, they had burned the place, they had not spared the boys, and they had carried off the girls. And whenever they found the sacrament of the church, they had thrown it into a river into the vilest place they could find. If God did not punish such cruelty and wickedness, men would infer that he did not trouble himself about the affairs of this world. The news from Italy gave a fresh impulse to Wolsey's policy and the Anglo-French alliance, which was pushed forward in spite of popular disapproval. The emperor, unable to pay and therefore unable to control his troops, became himself alarmed. He found himself pressed into a course which was stimulating the German revolt against the papacy, and he professed himself anxious to end the war. Inigo de Mendoza, the Bishop of Burgos, was dispatched to Paris to negotiate for a general pacification. From Paris he was to proceed to London to assure Henry of the Emperor's inalienable friendship, and above all things to gain over Wolsey, by the means which experience had shown to be the nearest way to Wolsey's heart. The great cardinal was already Charles's pensionary, but the pension was several years in arrear. Mendoza was to tell him not only that the arrears should be immediately paid up, but that a second pension should be secured to him on the revenues of Milan, and that the emperor would make him a further grant of 6,000 ducats annually out of the income of Spanish bishoprics. No means was to be spared to divert the hostility of so dangerous an enemy. Wolsey was not to be so easily gained. He had formed large schemes which he did not mean to part with, and in the matter of pensions, Francis I was as liberal in promises as Charles. The Pope's prospects were brightening. Besides the English money, he had improved his finances by creating six new cardinals and making 240,000 crowns out of the disposition of these sacred offices. A French embassy, with the Bishop of Darb at its head, came to England to complete the treaty with Henry in the Pope's defence. Demands were to be made upon the Emperor. 
If those demands were refused, war was to follow, and the cement of the alliance was to be the marriage of Mary with a French prince. It is likely that other secret projects were in view also of a similar kind. The marriage of Henry with Catherine had been intended to secure the continuance of the alliance with Spain. Royal ladies were the counters with which politicians played, and probably enough there were thoughts of placing a French princess in Catherine's place. However this may be, the legality of the king's marriage with his nominal queen was suddenly and indirectly raised in the discussion of the terms of the treaty, when the Bishop of Tarbes inquired whether it was certain that Catherine's daughter was legitimate. Mr. Brewer, the careful and admirable editor of the Foreign and Domestic Calendar of State Papers, doubts whether the bishop did anything of the kind. I cannot agree with Mr. Brewer. The Bishop of Tarbes was among the best-known diplomatists in Europe. He was actively concerned during subsequent years in the process of the divorce case in London, in Paris, and at Rome. The expressions which he used on this occasion were publicly appealed to by Henry in his addresses to the peers and to the country, in the public pleas which he laid before the English prelates, in the various repeated defences which he made for his conduct. It is impossible that the bishop should have been ignorant of the use which was made of his name, and impossible equally to suppose that he would have allowed his name to be used unfairly. The bishop of Tarb was unquestionably the first person to bring the question publicly forward, it is likely enough, however, that his introduction of so startling a topic had been privately arranged between himself and Wolsey as a prelude to the further steps which were immediately to follow. For the divorce had by this time been finally resolved on as part of a general scheme for the alteration of the balance of power. The domestic reasons for it were as weighty as ever were alleged for similar separations. The Pope's hesitation, it might be assumed, would now be overcome since he had flung himself for support upon England and France, and his relations with the Emperor could hardly be worse than they were. The outer world, and even the persons principally concerned, were taken entirely by surprise. For the two years during which it had been under consideration, the secret had been successfully preserved. Not a hint had reached Catherine herself, and even when the match had been lighted by the Bishop of Tarbes, the full meaning of it does not seem to have occurred to her. Mendoza, on his arrival in England, had found her disturbed. She was irritated at the position which had been given to the Duke of Richmond. She was angry, of course, at the French alliance. She complained that she was kept in the dark about public affairs. She was exerting herself to the utmost among the friends of the imperial connection to arrest Wolsey's policy and maintain the ancient traditions. But of the divorce... She had not heard a word. It was to come upon her like a thunderstroke. Before the drama opens, a brief description will not be out of place of the two persons who were to play the principal parts on the stage, as they were seen a year later by Ludovico Falieri, the Venetian ambassador in England. Of Catherine, his account is brief. The Queen is of low stature and rather stout, very good and very religious speaks Spanish, French, Flemish, and English, more beloved by the islanders than any queen that has ever reigned, about forty-five years old, and has been in England thirty years. She has had two sons and one daughter. Both the sons died in infancy. One daughter survives. On the king, Falieri is more elaborate. In the eighth Henry is such beauty of mind and body as combined as to surprise and astonish grand stature, suited to his exalted position, showing the superiority of mind and character. A face like an angel's, so fair it is, his head bald like Caesar's, and he wears a beard, which is not the English custom. He is accomplished in every manly exercise, sits his horse well, tilts with his lance, throws the quoit, shoots with his bow excellent well. He is a fine tennis player, and he practices all these gifts with the greatest industry. Such a prince could not fail to have cultivated also his character and his intellect. He has been a student from his childhood. He knows literature, philosophy, and theology, speaks and writes Spanish, French, and Italian, besides Latin and English. He is kind, gracious, courteous, liberal, especially to men of learning, whom he is always ready to help. He appears religious also, 
generally hears two masses a day, and on holy days high mass besides. He is very charitable, giving away ten thousand gold ducats annually among orphans, widows, and cripples. Such was the king, such the queen, whom fate and the preposterous pretensions of the papacy to dispense with the established marriage laws had irregularly mated, and whose separation was to shake the European world. Pope Clement complained in subsequent years that the burden of decision should have been thrown at the first instance upon himself. If the king had proceeded at the outset to try the question of the English courts, if a judgment had been given unfavourable to the marriage, and had he immediately acted upon it, Queen Catherine might have appealed to the Holy See. But accomplished facts were solid things. Her case might have been indefinitely protracted by legal technicalities till it died of itself would have been a characteristic method of escape out of the difficulty, and it was a view which Wolsey himself perhaps at first entertained. He knew that the Pope was unwilling to take the first step. On the 17th of May, 1527, after a discussion of the treaty with France, he called a meeting of his legatine court at York Place. Archbishop Warren sat with him as assessor. The king attended, and the cardinal, having stated that a question had arisen on the lawfulness of his marriage, inquired whether the king, for the sake of public morals, and for the good of his own soul, would allow the objections to be examined into. The king assented, and named a proctor. The bull of Julius II was introduced and considered. Wolsey declared that in a case so intricate the canon lawyers must be consulted, and he asked for the opinions of the assembled bishops. The bishops, one only excepted, gave dubious answers. The aged Bishop of Rochester, reputed the holiest and wisest of them, said decidedly that the marriage was good, and that the bull which legalised it sufficient. These proceedings were not followed up, but the secrecy which had hitherto been observed was no longer possible, and Catherine and her friends learnt now for the first time the measure which was in contemplation. Mendoza, writing on the day following the York Place meeting to the Emperor, informed him, as a fact which he had learnt on reliable authority, that Wolsey, for a final stroke of wickedness, was scheming to divorce the Queen. She was so much alarmed that she did not venture herself to speak of it, but it was certain that the lawyers and bishops had been invited to sign a declaration that, being his brother's widow, she could not be the wife of the King. The Pope, she was afraid, might be tempted to take part against her, or the cardinal himself might deliver judgment as papal legate. Her one hope was in the emperor. The cause of the action taken against her was her fidelity to the imperial interests. Nothing as yet had been made formally public, and she begged that the whole matter might be kept as private as possible. That the Pope would be willing, if he dared, to gratify Henry at Charles's expense was only too likely. The German Lutherans and the German Emperor were at the moment his most dangerous enemies. France and England were the only powers who seemed willing to assist him, and a week before the meeting of Wolsey's court he had experienced in the most terrible form what the imperial hostility might bring upon him. On the 7th of that same month of May, the army of the Duke of Bourbon had taken Rome by storm. The city was given up to pillage, Reverend cardinals were dragged through the streets on mules' backs, dishonoured and mutilated. Convents of nuns were abandoned to the licentious soldiery. The horrors of the capture may have been exaggerated, but it is quite certain that to holy things or holy persons no respect was paid, and that the atrocities which in those days were usually perpetrated in stormed towns were on this occasion eminently conspicuous. The unfortunate Pope, shut up in the castle of St. Angelo, looked down from his battlements upon scenes so dreadful that it must have appeared as if the papacy and the church itself had been overtaken by the final judgment. We regard the Spaniards as a nation of bigots. We consider it impossible that the countrymen of Charles and Philip could have been animated by any such bitterness against the centre of Catholic Christendom. Charles himself was not likely to have intended the humiliation of the Holy See, but Clement had reasons for his misgivings, and Wolsey's policy was not without excuse. Lope de Soria was Charles's minister at Genoa, and Lope de Soria's opinions, freely uttered, 
may have been shared by many a Catholic besides himself. On the 25th of May, a fortnight after the storm, he wrote to his master the following noticeable letter. The sack of Rome must be regarded as a visitation from God, who permits his servant the emperor to teach his vicar on earth and other Christian princes that their wicked purposes shall be defeated. The unjust wars which they have raised shall cease. Peace be restored to Christendom, the faith be exalted, and heresy extirpated. Should the emperor think that the church of God is not what it ought to be, and that the pope's temporal power emboldens him to promote war among Christian princes, I cannot but remind your majesty that it will not be a sin, but a meritorious action to reform the church, so that the pope's authority be confined exclusively to his own spiritual affairs, and temporal affairs to be left to Caesar, since by right what is God's belongs to God, and what is Caesar's to Caesar. I have been twenty-eight years in Italy, and I have observed that the popes have been the sole cause of all the wars and miseries during that time. Your imperial majesty as supreme lord on earth is bound to apply a remedy to that evil. Heretical English and Germans were not the only persons who could recognise the fitness of the secular supremacy of princes over popes and churches. Such thoughts must have passed through the mind of Charles himself, and of many more besides him. Tesoria's words might have been dictated by Luther or Thomas Cromwell. Had the emperor at that moment placed himself at the head of the Reformation, all later history would have been different. One statesman, at any rate, had cause to fear this might be what was about to happen. Wolsey was the embodiment of everything most objectionable and odious to the laity in the ecclesiastical administration of Europe. To defend the papacy and to embarrass Charles was the surest method of protecting himself and his order. The divorce was an incident in the situation, but not the least important. Catherine represented the imperialist interest in England. To put her away was to make the breach with her countrymen and kindred irreparable. He took upon himself to assure the king that after the last outrage the Pope would agree to anything that France and England demanded of him and would trust to his allies to bear him harmless. That the divorce was a thing reasonable in itself to ask for, and certain to be conceded by any pope who was free to act on his own judgment, was assumed as a matter of course. Sir Gregory Casalis, the English agent at Rome, was instructed to obtain access to Clement in St. Angelo, to convey to him the indignation felt in England at his treatment, and then to insist on the illegality of the king's relations with Catherine, on the king's own scruples of conscience, and on the anxiety of his subjects that there should be a male heir to the crown. The urgent cause, such as was necessary to be produced when exceptional actions were required of the popes, was the imminence or even certainty of civil war if no such heir was born. Catherine, meanwhile, had again communicated with Mendoza. She had spoken to her husband, and Henry, since further reticence was impossible, had told her that there had been living in mortal sin, that a separation was necessary. A violent scene had followed, with natural tears and reproaches. The king endeavoured to console her, but it was not a matter where consolation could avail. Wolsey advised him to deal with her gently, till it was seen what the Pope and the King of France would do in the matter. Wolsey himself was to go immediately to Paris to see Francis, and consult with him on the measures necessary to be taken in consequence of the Pope's imprisonment. It was possible that Clement, finding himself helpless, might become a puppet in the Emperor's hands. Under such circumstances, he could not be trusted by other countries with the spiritual authority attaching to his office, and schemes were being formed for some interim arrangement by which France and England were to constitute themselves into a separate patriarchate, with Wolsey as its head, as Archbishop of Rouen. Mendoza says that this proposal had been actually made to Wolsey by the French ambassador. In Spain, it was even believed to be contemplated as a permanent modification of the ecclesiastical system. The imperial councillors at Valladolid told the Venetian minister that the cardinal intended to separate the churches of England and France from that of Rome, saying that as the Pope was a prisoner, he was not to be obeyed, and that even if the emperor released him, he still would not be free until his fortresses and territory now in the Emperor's hands were restored to him. Wolsey had reason for anxiety, 
for Catherine and Mendoza were writing to the emperor insisting that he should make the pope revoke Wolsey's legatine powers. In spite of the efforts to keep secret the intended divorce, it soon became known throughout England. The queen was personally popular. The nation generally detested France and looked on the emperor as their hereditary friend. The reasons for the divorce might influence statesmen, but did not touch the body of the people. They naturally took the side of an injured wife, and if Mendoza can be believed, and there is no reason why he should not be believed, the first impression was decidedly unfavourable to a project which was regarded as part of the new policy. Mendoza made the most of the opposition. He told the emperor that if six or seven thousand men were landed in Cornwall, forty thousand Englishmen would rise and join them. He saw Wolsey, he reasoned with them, and when he found reason ineffectual, he named the bribe which the emperor was willing to give. Knowing what Francis was bidding, he baited his hook more liberally. He spoke of the papacy. Now the chair was now in the emperor's hands, and the emperor, if Wolsey deserved it, would no doubt promote his elevation. The glittering temptation was unavailing. The papal chair had been Wolsey's highest ambition, but he remained unmoved. He said that he had served the emperor in the past out of disinterested regard. He still trusted that the emperor would replace the pope and restore the church. Mendoza's answer was not reassuring to an English statesman. He said that both the spiritual and temporal powers were now centred in his master, and he advised Wolsey, if he desired an arrangement, to extend his journey from France, go to Spain, and see the emperor in person. It was precisely this centering which those who had charge of English liberties had a right to resent. Divorce or no divorce, they could not allow a power possessed of so much authority in the rest of Christendom to be the servant of a single prince. The divorce was but an illustration of the situation, and such a papacy as Mendoza contemplated would reduce England and all Catholic Europe into fiefs of the empire. End of chapter 1 In chapter 2 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 2 It was believed at the time, and it was the tradition afterwards, that Wolsey, in his mission to Paris, intended to replace Catherine by a French princess, the more surely to commit Francis to the support of Henry in the divorce, and to strengthen the new alliance. Nothing can be inherently more likely. The ostensible reason, however, was to do away with any difficulties which might have been suggested by the objection of the Bishop of Tarbes to the legitimacy of the Princess Mary. If illegitimate, she would be no fitting bride for the Duke of Orléans, but she had been born bona fide parentum. There was no intention of infringing her prospect of rights or of altering her present position. Her rank and title were to be secured to her in amplest measure. The cardinal went upon his journey with the splendour attaching to his office, and befitting a churchman who was aspiring to be the spiritual president of the two kingdoms. On his way to the coast, he visited two prelates whose support to his policy was important. Archbishop Warham had been cold about the divorce, if not openly hostile. Wolsey found him not much changed from his first fashion. But admitting that, although it might be unpleasant to the Queen, truth and justice must prevail. Bishop Fisher was a more difficult subject. He had spoken in the legate's court in Catherine's favour. It was from him, as the King supposed, that Catherine herself had learnt what was impending over her. Wolsey called at his palace as he passed through Rochester. He asked the bishop plainly if he had been in communication with the Queen. The bishop, after some hesitation, confessed that the queen had sought his advice, and said that he had declined to give an opinion without the king's command. Before Wolsey left London, at a last interview at York Place, the king had directed him to explain the whole matter to the bishop. He went through the entire history, mentioned the words of the bishop of Tarbes, and discussed the question which had risen upon it, on account of which he had been sent into France. Finally, he described the extreme violence with which Catherine had received the intelligence. 
The bishop greatly blamed the conduct of the queen, and said he thought that if he might speak to her, he might bring her to submission. He agreed, or seemed to agree, that the marriage had been irregular, though he did not himself think that it could now be broken. Others of the bishops, he thought, agreed with him, but he was satisfied that the king meant nothing against the laws of God, and would be fully justified in submitting his misgivings to the Pope. Mendoza's and the Queen's letters had meanwhile been dispatched to Spain, to add to the anxieties which were overwhelming the Emperor. Nothing could have been less welcome at such a juncture than a family quarrel with his uncle of England, whose friendship he was still hoping to retain. The bird that he had caged at Rome was no convenient prisoner. The capture of Rome had not been ordered by himself, though politically he was obliged to maintain it. The time did not suit for the ambitious church reforms of Lope de Soria. Peace would have to be made with the Pope on some moderate conditions. His own Spain was hardly quieted after the revolt of the Comunidades. Half Germany was in avowed apostasy from the Church of Rome. The Turks were overrunning Hungary and sweeping the Mediterranean with their pirate fleets, and the passionate and restless Francis was watching his opportunity to revenge Pavia and attack his captor in the Low Countries and in Italy. The great emperor was moderate, cautious, prudent to a fault. In a calmer season he might have been tempted to take the church in hand, and none understood better the condition into which it had fallen. But he was wise enough to know that if a reform of the papacy was undertaken at all, it must be undertaken with the joint consent of the other Christian princes, and all his present efforts were directed to peace. He was Catherine's natural guardian. Her position in England had been hitherto a political security for Henry's friendship. It was his duty and his interest to defend her, and he meant to do it. Not, however, by sending roving expeditions to land in Cornwall and raise a civil war. All means were to be tried before that. To attempt such a thing, he well knew, would throw Europe into a blaze. The letters found him at Valladolid. He replied, of course, that he was shocked at a proceeding so unlooked for and so scandalous, but he charged Mendoza to be moderate, and to confine himself to remonstrance. He wrote himself to Henry, confidentially, as from friend to friend, enciphering his letter with his own hand. He was unable to believe, he said, that Henry could contemplate seriously bringing his domestic discomforts before the world, even supposing the marriage illegitimate, even supposing that the Pope had no power to dispense in such cases, it would be better and more honourable to keep the matter secret and to work out a remedy. He bade Mendoza remind the king that to question the dispensing power affected the position of other princes besides his own, that to touch the legitimacy of his daughter would increase the difficulties with the succession and not remove them. He implored the king to keep the matter secret as he would do himself. Meanwhile, he told Mendoza, for Catherine's comfort, that he had written to demand a mild brief from the Pope to stop the scandal. He had requested him, as Catherine had suggested, to revoke Wolsey's powers, or at least to command that neither he nor any English court should try the case. If heard at all, it must be heard before His Holiness in the Sacred College. But he could not part with the hope that he might still bring Wolsey to his own and the Queen's side. Council of Cardinals was to meet at Avignon to consider the Pope's captivity. The Cardinal of England was expected to attend. Charles himself might go to Perpignan. Wolsey might meet and there discuss the state of Europe and settle the King's secret affair at the same time. Should this be impossible, he charged Mendoza once more to leave no stone unturned to recover Wolsey's friendship. In our name, he said, you will make him the following offers. 1. The payment of all arrears on his several pensions, amounting to 9,000 ducats annually. 2. 6,000 additional ducats annually until such time as a bishopric or other ecclesiastical endowment of the same revenue becomes vacant in our kingdom. 3. The duke who is to have Milan to give him a marquisate in that duchy, with an annual rent of 12,000 ducats, or 15,000 if the smaller sum be not enough the said marquisite, to be held by the cardinal during his life, and to pass after him to any heir whom he shall appoint. 
As if this was not sufficient, the emperor paid a yet further tribute to the supposed all-powerful cardinal. He wrote himself to him as to his good friend. He said that if there was anything in his dominions which the cardinal wished to possess, he had only to name it, as he considered Wolsey the best friend that he had in the world. For the ministers of great countries deliberately to sell themselves to foreign princes was the custom of the age. The measure of public virtue which such a custom indicates was not exalted, and among the changes introduced by the Reformation the abolition or suspension of it was not the least beneficial. Thomas Cromwell, when he came to power, set the example of refusal and corruption of public men on a scale so scandalously enormous was no more heard of. Gold, however, had flowed in upon Wolsey in such enormous streams and from so many sources that the emperor's munificence and attention failed to tempt him. On reaching Paris, he found Francis bent on war and willing to promise anything for Henry's assistance. The belief at the French court was that the emperor, hearing that the churches of England and France meant to decline from their obedience to the Roman communion, would carry the Pope to Spain. Clement would probably be poisoned there, and the Apostolic See would be established permanently in the peninsula. Wolsey himself wrote this and believed it, or desired Henry to believe it, proving the extreme uncertainty among the best informed of contemporary politicians as to the probable issue of the capture of Rome. The French cardinals drew and sent an address to the Pope, intimating that as long as he was in confinement they could accept no act of his as lawful and would not obey it. Wolsey signed at the head of them. The cardinals Salviati, Bourbon, Lorraine, and the Chancellor Cardinal of Saint assigned after him. The first stroke of the game had been won by Wolsey. Had the Pope recalled his powers as legate, an immediate schism might have followed. But a more fatal blow had been prepared for him by his master in England. Trusting to the Cardinal's promises that the Pope would make no difficulty about the divorce, Henry had considered himself at liberty to choose a successor to Catherine. He had suffered once in having allowed politics to select a wife for him. This time he intended to be guided by his own inclination. When Elizabeth afterwards wished to marry Leicester, Lord Sussex said she had better fix after her own liking. There would be the better chance of the heir that her realm was looking for. Her father fixed also, after his liking, in selecting Elizabeth's mother. Anne Boleyn was the second daughter of Sir Thomas Boleyn, a Norfolk knight of ancient blood, and himself a person of some distinction in the public service. Lady Boleyn was a Howard, daughter of the Duke of Norfolk. Anne was born in 1507, and by birth and connection was early introduced into the court. When a girl, she was taken to Paris to be educated. In 1522 she was brought back to England, became a lady-in-waiting, and being a witty, brilliant young woman, attracted and encouraged the intentions of the fashionable cavaliers of the day. Wyatt, the poet, was among her adorers, and the young Percy, afterwards Earl of Northumberland. It was alleged afterwards that between her and Percy there had been a secret marriage which had been actually consummated, that she had been involved in some dangerous intrigue or other she herself subsequently confessed. But she was attractive. She was witty. She drew Henry's fancy, and the fancy became an ardent passion. Now, for the first time, in Wolsey's absence, the Lady Anne's name appears in connection with the divorce. On the 16th of August, Mendoza informed Charles, as a matter of general belief, that if the suit for the divorce was successful, the king would marry a daughter of Master Bolin, whom the emperor would remember as once ambassador at the imperial court. There is no direct evidence that before Wolsey had left England, the king had seriously thought of Anne at all. Catherine could have had no suspicion of it, or her jealous indignation would have made itself heard. The Spanish ambassador spoke of it as a new feature in the case. The Boleyns were Wolsey's enemies, and belonged to the growing faction most hostile to the church. The news as it came upon him was utterly distasteful. Anne, in turn, hated Wolsey, as he probably knew that she would, and she compelled him to stoop to the disgrace of suing for her favour. 
The inference is reasonable, therefore, that the king took the step which in the event was to produce such momentous consequences when the cardinal was not at hand to dissuade him. He was not encouraged even by her own family. Her father, as will be seen hereafter, was from the first opposed to his daughter's advancement. He probably knew her character too well. But Henry, when he had taken an idea into his head, was not to be moved from it. The lady was not beautiful. She was rather short than tall. Her complexion was dark, her neck long, her mouth broad, her figure not particularly good. The fascinating features were her long, flowing brown hair, a pair of effective dark eyes, and a boldness of character which might have put him on his guard, and did not. The immediate effect was to call Wolsey's ardour for the divorce. His mission in France, which opened so splendidly, eventuated in little. The French cardinals held no meeting at Avignon. They had signed the address to Clement, but they had not made the Cardinal of York into their patriarch. Rouen was not added to his other preferments. Could he but have proposed a marriage for his sovereign with the princes of Alençon, or might have been different? But it had fared with him as it fared with the Earl of Warwick, whom Henry's grandfather had sent to France to woo a bride for him, and in his absence married Elizabeth Grey. He perhaps regretted the munificent office of the emperor which he had so hastily rejected, and he returned to England in the autumn to feel the consequences of the change in his situation. Mr. Brewer labours in vain to prove that Wolsey was unfavourable to the divorce from the beginning. Catherine believed that he was the instigator of it. Mendoza was of the same opinion. Unquestionably, he promoted it with all his power and made it a part of a great policy. To maintain that he was acting thus against his conscience and to please the king is more dishonouring to him than to suppose that he was either the originator or the willing instrument. All, however, was altered when Anne Boleyn came upon the stage, and she made haste to make him feel the change. The legate has returned from France, wrote Mendoza on the 26th of October. He went to visit the king at Richmond and sent to ask where he could see him. The king was in his chamber. It happened that the lady, who seemed to entertain no great affection for the cardinal, was in the room with the king, and before the latter could answer the message, she said for him, Where else is the cardinal to come? Tell him he may come here where the king is. The legate felt that such treatment boded no good to him, but concealed his resentment. The cause, said Mendoza, is supposed to be that the said lady bears the legate a grudge, for other reasons, and because she has discovered that during his visit to France the legate proposed to have an alliance for the king found in that country. Wolsey persuaded Mendoza that the French marriage had been a fiction, but at once he began to endeavour to undo his work, and to prevent the dissolution of the marriage with Catherine. He tried to procure an unfavourable opinion from the English bishops before legal proceedings were commenced. Mendoza, however, doubted his stability if the king persisted in his purpose, and advised that a papal decision on the case should be procured and forwarded as soon as possible. The Pope's captivity, however, would destroy the value of any judgment which he might give while he continued endurance. The Emperor, encouraged by the intimation that Wolsey was wavering, reverted to his previous hope. When a special memorandum and measures to be taken, the most important, notwithstanding the refusal of the previous offers, was still thought to be to bribe the Cardinal. He must instantly be paid the arrears of his pensions out of the revenues of the seas of Palencia and Badios. If there was not enough money in the treasury, a further and larger pension of twelve or fourteen thousand crowns was to be given him out of some rich bishopric in Castile. The emperor admitted that he had promised the Cortes to appoint no more foreigners to Spanish seas, but such a promise could not be held binding, being in violation of the liberties of the church. Everyone would see that it was for the good of the kingdom. The renewed offer was doubtless conveyed to Wolsey, but he probably found that he had gone too deep to retire. If he made such an effort as Mendoza relates, he must have speedily discovered that it would be useless. He had encouraged the king in the belief that the divorce would be granted by the Pope as a matter of course, and the king, having made up his own mind, was not to be moved from it. If Wolsey now drew back, the certain inference would be that he had accepted an imperial bribe, there was no resource, therefore, but to go on. 
While Wolsey had been hesitating, the king had, unknown to him, sent a secretary, Dr. Knight, to Rome with directions to obtain access, if possible, to the Pope, and procure the dispensation which had already been applied for to enable him to marry a second time without the formalities of a judgment. Such an expedient would be convenient in many ways. It would leave Catherine's position unaffected, and the legitimacy of the Princess Mary unimpugned. Knight went. He found that without a passport he could not even enter the city, still less be allowed an interview. With ten thousand crowns he could not bribe his way into St. Angelo. He contrived, however, to have a letter introduced, which the Pope answered by telling Knight to wait in some quiet place. He, the Pope, would there send him all the king's requests in as ample a form as they were desired. Knight trusted in a short time to have in his custody as much perfect speed and underled as his highness had long time desired. Knight was too sanguine. The emperor, finding the pope's detention as a prisoner embarrassing, allowed him on the ninth of December to escape to Orvieto, where he was apparently at liberty. But he was only in a larger cage all his territories being occupied by imperial troops, and he himself watched by the general of the observance, and warned at his peril to grant nothing to Catherine's prejudice. Henry's secretary followed him, saw him, and obtained something which on examination proved to be worthless. The negotiations were left again in Wolsey's hands, and were pressed with all the eagerness of a desperate man. Pope Clement had ceased to be a free agent. He did not look to the rights of the case. He would gladly have pleased Henry, could he have pleased him without displeasing Charles. The case itself was peculiar, and opinions differed on the rights and wrongs of it. The reader must be from time to time reminded that, as the law of England has stood ever since, a marriage with a brother's widow was not a marriage. As the law of the church then stood, it was not a marriage unless permitted by the Pope. And according to the same law of England, the Pope neither has, nor ever had, any authority to dispense with the law. Therefore Henry, on the abstract contention, was in the right. He had married Catherine under an error. The problem was to untie the knot with as little suffering to either as the nature of the case permitted. That the negotiations were full of inconsistencies, evasions and contradictions was natural and inevitable. To cut the knot without untying it was the only direct course, but that all means were exhausted before the application of so violent a remedy was rather a credit than a reproach. The first inconsistency was in the king. He did not regard his marriage as valid. Therefore, he thought himself at liberty to marry again. But he did not wish to illegitimatize his daughter or degrade Catherine. He disputed the validity of the dispensation of Julius II. Yet he required a dispensation from Clement, which was equally questionable, to enable him to take a second wife. The management of the case having reverted to Wolsey, fresh instructions were sent to Sir Gregory Casalis, the regular English agent at the papal court, to wait on Clement. Casalis was bid consider how much the affair concerned the relief of the king's conscience, the safety of his soul, the preservation of his life, the continuation of his succession, the welfare and repose of all his subjects now and hereafter. The Pope at Orvieto was personally accessible. Casalis was to represent to him the many difficulties which had arisen in connection with the marriage, and the certainty of civil war in England should the king die, leaving the succession no better provided for. He was, therefore, to request the Pope to grant a commission to Wolsey to hear the case and to decide it, and perhaps as an alternative, to sign a dispensation, a draft of which Wolsey enclosed. The language of the dispensation was peculiar. Wolsey explained it by saying that the king, remembering by the example of past times what false claims to the crown had been put forward, to avoid all colour or pretext of the same, desired this of the Pope as absolutely necessary. If these two requests were conceded, Henry undertook on his part to require the Emperor to set the Pope at liberty, or to declare war against him if he refused. A dispensation which was to evade the real point at issue, yet to convey to the King a power to take another wife, 
was a novelty in itself, and likely to be carefully worded. It has given occasion among modern historians to important inferences disgraceful to everyone concerned. The sinister meaning, supposed to be obvious to modern critics, could not have been concealed from the Pope himself. Here, therefore, follow the words which have been fastened on as forever fatal to the intelligence and character of Henry and his ministers. The Pope, after reviewing the later history of England, the distractions caused by rival claimants to the crown, after admitting the necessity of guarding against the designs of the ambitious and empowering Henry to marry again, was made to address the king in these words. In order to take away all occasion from evil doers, we do in the plenitude of our power hereby suspend hac vice all canons forbidding marriage in the fourth degree, also all canons de impedimento publici honestatis, preventing marriage in consequence of clandestine espousals. Further, all canons relating to pre-contracts clandestinely made but not consummated, also all canons affecting impediments created by affinity rising ex illicito coeto, in any degree even in the first, so far as the marriage to be contracted by you, the petitioner can be objected to or in any wise be impugned by the same. Further, to avoid canonical objections on the side of the woman by reason of former contract clandestinely made, or impediment of public honesty, or justice arising from such clandestine contract, or of any affinity contracted in any degree even the first, ex illicito coito, and in the event that has proceeded beyond the second or third degrees of consanguinity, whereby, otherwise you, the petitioner, would not be allowed by the canons to contract marriage, we hereby license you to take such woman for wife and suffer you and the woman to marry free from all ecclesiastical objections and censures. The explanation given by Wolsey of the wording of this document is that it was intended to preclude any objections which might be raised to the prejudice of the offspring of a marriage in itself irregular was therefore made as comprehensive as possible. Dr. Lingard, followed by Mr. Brewer and other writers, see in it a transparent personal application to the situation in which Henry intended to place himself by making a wife of Anne Boleyn. Two years subsequent to the period when this dispensation was asked for, when the question of the divorce had developed into a battle between England and the papacy, and the passions of Catholics and reformers were boiling over in recrimination and invective, the king's plea that he was parting from Catherine out of conscience was met by stories set floating in society that the king himself had previously intrigued with the mother and sister of the lady whom he intended to marry. Precisely the same obstacle existed, therefore, to his marriage with Anne, being further aggravated by incest. No attempt was ever made to prove these charges. No particulars were given of time or place. No witnesses were produced, nor other evidence, though to prove them would have been of infinite importance. Queen Catherine, who, if any one must have known it, if the accusation was true, never alludes to Mary Boleyn in the fiercest of her denunciations. It was heard of only in the conversation of disaffected priests or secret visitors to the Spanish ambassador, and was made public only in the manifesto of Reginald Pole, which accompanied Paul III's bull, for Henry's deposition. Even this authority, which was not much in itself, is made less by the fact that in the first draft of Pole's book sent to England to be examined in 1535, the story is not mentioned. Evidently, therefore, Pole had not then heard of it, or did not believe it. The guilt with the mother is now abandoned as too monstrous. The guilt with the sister is peremptorily insisted on, and the words of the dispensation are appealed to as no longer leaving room for doubt. To what else, it is asked, can such extraordinary expressions refer unless to some disgraceful personal liaison? The uninstructed, who draw inferences of fact from the verbiage of legal documents, will discover often what are called mare's nests. I will request the reader to consider what this supposition involves. The dispensation would have to be copied into the Roman registers, subject to the inspection of the acutest canon lawyers in the world. The meaning is so clear to us, it must have been clear to them. We are, therefore, to believe that Henry, when demanding to be separated from Catherine as an escape from mortal sin, 
for the relief of his conscience and the surety of his succession, was gratuitously putting the Pope in possession of a secret which had only to be published to extinguish him and his plea in an outburst of scorn and laughter. There was no need for such an acknowledgement, for the intrigue could not be proved. It could not be required for the legitimation of the children that were to be born, for a man of Wolsey's ability must have known that no dispensation would be held valid that was granted after so preposterous a confidence. It was as if a man, putting in a claim for some great property before the case came on for trial, privately informed both judge and jury that it was based on forgery. We go on to explain further why, when all Europe was shaken by the controversy, no hint is to be found in any public document of a fact which, if true, would be decisive, and yet more extraordinary, why the Pope and the Curia, when driven to bay in all the exasperation of a furious controversy, left a weapon unused which would have assured them an easy victory. Wolsey was not a fool. Is it conceivable that he would have composed a document so fatal and have drawn the Pope's pointed attention to it? My credulity does not extend so far. We cannot prove a negative. We cannot prove that Henry had not intrigued with Mary Boleyn, or with all the ladies of his court. But the language of the dispensation cannot be adduced as an evidence of it unless King, Pope, and all the interested world had parted with their senses. As to the story itself, there is no ground for distinguishing between the mother and the daughter. When it was first set circulating, both were named together. The mother only has been dropped, lest the improbability should seem too violent for belief. That Mary Boleyn had been the king's mistress before or after her own marriage is now asserted as an ascertained fact by respectable historians. A fact sufficient, can it be proved, to cover with infamy forever the English separation from Rome, king, ministers, parliaments, bishops, and every one concerned with it. The effectiveness of the weapon commends it to Catholic controversialists. I have only to repeat that the evidence for the charge is nothing but the floating gossip of Catholic society, never heard of, never whispered, till the second stage of the quarrel, when it had developed into a passionate contest never even then alleged in a form in which it could be met and answered. It could not have been hid from Queen Catherine if it was known to Reginald Pole. We have many letters of Catherine, eloquent on the story of her wrongs, letters to the Emperor, letters to the Pope, yet no word of Mary Boleyn. What reason can be given save that it was a legend which grew out of the temper of the time? Nothing could be more plausible than to meet the King's plea of conscience with an allegation which made it ridiculous but in the public pleadings of a cause which was discussed in every capital in Europe by the keenest lawyers and diplomatists of the age, an accusation which, if maintained, would have been absolutely decisive, is never alluded to in any public document till the question had passed beyond the stage of discussion. And the silence of all responsible persons is sufficient proof of its nature. It was a mere floating calumny, born of wind and malice. Mr. Brewer does indeed imagine that he has discovered what he describes as a tacit confession on Henry's part. When the Act of Appeals was before the House of Commons, which ended the papal jurisdiction in England, a small knot of opposition members used to meet privately to deliberate how to oppose it. Among these, one of the most active was Sir George Throgmorton, a man who afterwards, with his brother Michael, made himself useful to Cromwell and played with both parties but then was against the divorce and against all the measures which grew out of it. Throckmorton, according to his own account, had been admitted to an interview with the King and Cromwell. 1537, after the pilgrimage of grace, while the ashes of the rebellion were still smouldering, after Michael Throckmorton had betrayed Cromwell's confidence and gone over to Reginald Pole, Sir George was reported to have used certain expressions to Sir Thomas Dingley and to two other gentlemen, which he was called on by the council to explain. The letter to the king in which he replied is still extant. He said that he had been sent for by the king after a speech on the act of appeals, that he saw his grace's conscience was troubled about having married his brother's wife. He professed to have said to Dingley that he had told the king that if he did marry Queen Anne, his conscience would be more troubled at length, for it was thought that he had meddled both with the mother and the sister. That his grace said, Never with the mother. 
and my Lord Privy Seal Cromwell standing by said, Nor with his sister neither, so put that out of your mind. Mr. Brewer construes this into an admission of the King that Mary Boleyn had been his mistress, and omits, of course, by inadvertence, that Throgmorton, being asked why he had told this story to Dingley, answered that he spake it only out of vainglory to show that he was one that durst speak for the common wealth. Nothing is more common than for vainglorious men, when admitted to conversations with kings, to make the most of what they said themselves, and to report not very accurately what was said to them. Had the conversation been authentic, Throgmorton would naturally have appealed to Cromwell's recollection. But Mr. Brewer accepts the version of a confessed boaster, as if it was a complete and trustworthy account of what had actually passed does not ask himself whether if the king or Cromwell had given their version, it might not have borne another complexion. Henry was not a safe person to take liberties with. Is it likely that if one of his subjects, who was actively opposing him in Parliament, had taxed him with an enormous crime, he would have made a confession which Throgmorton had only to repeat in the House of Commons to ruin him and his cause? Mr. Brewer should have added also that the authority which he gave for the story was no better than Father Petto, afterwards Cardinal Petto, as bitter an enemy of the Reformation as Pole himself. Most serious of all, Mr. Brewer omits to mention that Throgmorton was submitted afterwards to a severe cross-examination before a committee of council, the effect of which, if he had spoken truly, could only be to establish the authenticity of a disgraceful charge. The last evidence alleged is the confession made by Anne Boleyn after her condemnation, of some mystery which had invalidated her marriage with the king, and had been made the ground of an act of Parliament. The confession was not published, and Catholic opinion concluded, and concludes still, that it must have been the Mary Boleyn intrigue. Catholic opinion does not pause to inquire whether Anne could have been said to confess an offence of the king and her sister. The cross-examination of Throgmorton turns the conjecture into an absurdity. When asked in 1537, whom he ever heard say such a thing, he would have had but to appeal to the proceedings in Parliament in the year immediately preceding. Is it likely, finally, that if Throgmorton's examination proves what Mr. Brewer thinks it proves, a record of it would have been preserved among the official state papers? If all the stories current about Henry VIII were to be discussed with as much detail as I have allowed to this, the world would not contain the books which should be written, an Irish lawyer told me in my youth to believe nothing which I heard in that country which had not been sifted in a court of justice, and only half of that. Legend is as the air invulnerable, and blows aimed at it, if not malicious mockery, a waste of effort. Charges of scandalous immorality are precious to controversialists, for if they are disproved ever so completely, the stain adheres. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Frood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 3 The story returns to Orvieto. The dispensation was promised on condition that it should not be immediately acted on. Catherine, having refused to acquiesce in a private arrangement, Wolsey again pressed the Pope for a commission to decide the cause in England and to bind himself at the same time not to revoke it, but to confirm any judgment which he might himself give. There were secret causes, he said, which could not be committed to writing which made such a concession imperative. Certain diseases in the Queen defying all remedy, for which, as for other causes, the King would never again live with her as his wife. The Pope, smarting from ill-treatment and grateful for the help of France and England, professed himself earnestly anxious to do what Henry desired. But he was still virtually a prisoner. He had been obliged by the general of the observance, when in St. Angelo, to promise to do nothing whereby the king's divorce might be judged in his own dominions. He pleaded for time. He promised a commission of some kind, but he said he was undone if action was taken upon it while the Germans and Spaniards remained in Italy. He saw evident ruin before him, he said, but he professed to be willing to run the hazard rather than that Wolsey should suspect him of ingratitude. 
He implored the cardinal, cum suspirius et lacrimis, not to precipitate him forever, and precipitated he would be, if on receiving the commission, the cardinal at once began the process. A fortnight later, Casales described a long conversation with the Pope and cardinals on the course to be pursued. Henry had desired that a second legate should be sent from Rome to act with Wolsey. To consent to this would directly compromise the papal court. Clement had no objection to the going forward with the cause, but he did not wish to be himself responsible. He signed an imperfect commission, not inconsistent with his promise to the general of the observance. On this Wolsey might act, or if he preferred it, might proceed in his own legatine authority. For himself, instead of engaging to confirm Wolsey's sentence, he said that no doctor could better resolve the pointed issue than the king himself. If he was resolved, said the Pope, let him commit his cause to the legate, marry again, follow up the trial, and then let a public application be made for a legate to be sent from the consistory. The Queen was cited first, she would put in no answer, save to protest against the place and judges. The imperialists would demand a prohibition, and the king could not marry, or if he did, the offspring would be illegitimate. They would also demand a commission for the cause to be heard at Rome, which the Pope would be unable to refuse. But the king being actually married again, they could not ask for a prohibition. They could only ask that the cause should be re-examined at Rome, and the Pope would give sentence and a judgment would be passed which would satisfy the whole world. This was the Pope's own advice, but did not wish it to be known that it had come from himself. Casalis might select the legate to England after the first steps had been taken. Campeggio he thought the fittest, being already an English bishop. At any rate, the Pope begged Casalis to say he would do his best to satisfy the king, though he knew the emperor would never forgive him. It is not certain what would have followed had Henry acted on the Pope's suggestion. The judgment which Clement promised might have been in his favour. Clement evidently wished him to think that it would, but he might, after all, have found himself required to take Catherine back. Either alternative was possible. At any rate, he did not mean, if he could help it, to have recourse to violent methods. Charles himself, though he intended to prevent, if he could, a legal decision against his aunt, had hinted at the possibility, and even desirableness, of a private arrangement, if Catherine would agree. Catherine, unfortunately, would agree to nothing, but stood resolutely upon her rights, and Charles was forced to stand by her. Henry was equally obstinate, and the Pope was between the rock and the whirlpool. The Pope had promised, however, and had promised with apparent sincerity. The Papal States remaining occupied by the Imperial troops, Henry carried out his own part of the engagement by joining France in a declaration of war against the Emperor. Trasondor and Clarencieux appeared before Charles at Burgos on the 22nd of January, Charles sitting on his throne to receive their defiance. Trasondor said the Emperor had opened Christendom to the Turks, had imprisoned the Pope, had allowed his armies to sack Rome and plunder churches and monasteries, had insulted the holy relics, slain or robbed princes of the church, cardinals, patriarchs, archbishops, outraged nunneries and convents, had encouraged Lutheran heretics in committing these atrocities, etc. For these reasons, France declared open war with the emperor. The English herald, he was accused afterwards of having exceeded his instructions, was almost as peremptory. Henry, in earlier times, had lent Charles large sums of money which had not been repaid. Florencieux said that, unless the Pope was released and the debt settled, the King of England must make common cause with his brother of France. Six weeks' interval was allowed for the Emperor to consider his answer before hostilities on the side of England should commence. The Emperor replied with calmness and dignity. War with France was inevitable. As to England, he felt like Hikaru, when doubting whether he should quarrel with Caesar, that it was inconvenient to be in debt to an enemy. If England attacked him, he said he would defend himself, but he declined to accept the defiance. Mendoza was not recalled from London. At the end of the six weeks, the situation was prolonged by successive truces until the peace of Cambrai. But Henry had kept his word to the Pope. 
England appeared by the side of France in the lists as the armed champion of the papacy, and the Pope was expected to fulfil his promises without disguise or subterfuge. Clement's method of proceeding with the divorce was rejected. The dispensation and commission which had been amended with a view to it were rejected also as worthless. Dr. Fox and Stephen Gardiner were dispatched to Orvieto with fuller powers and with a message peremptory and even menacing. They were again to impress on the Pope the danger of a disputed succession. They were to hint that, if relief was refused in deference to the Emperor, England might decline from obedience to the Holy See. The Pope must, therefore, pass the commission and the dispensation in the form which had been sent from England. If he objected that it was unusual, they were to announce that the cause was of great moment. The king would not be defrauded of his expectation through fear of the emperor. If he could not obtain justice from the Pope, he would be compelled to seek it elsewhere. The language of these instructions shows that the king and Wolsey understood the Proteus they were dealing with and the necessity of binding his hands if he was not to slip from them. It was now not the fountain of justice, the august head of Christendom that they were addressing, but a shifty old man, clad by circumstances with the robe of authority, but whose will was the will of the power which happened to be strongest in Italy. It was not tolerable that the emperor should dictate on a question which touched the vital interests of an independent kingdom. Spanish diplomatists had afterwards to excuse and explain away Clement's concessions on the ground that they were signed when he was angry at his imprisonment, had been extorted by threats, and were therefore of no validity. He struggled hard to avoid committing himself. The unwelcome documents were recast into various forms. The dispensation was not signed after all, but in the place of it other briefs were signed of even graver importance. The Pope yielded to the demand to send a second legate to try the cause with Wolsey in England, where it was assumed as a matter of course that judgment would be given for the king. The legate chosen was Campeggio, who was himself, as was said, an English bishop. The Pope also did express in writing his own opinion on the causes favourable to the king's plea. For Pastor Dovieto was thus afterwards compendiously related by Henry in a published statement of his case. On his first scruple, the king sent to the Bishop of Rome, as Christ's vicar, who had the keys of knowledge, to dissolve his doubts. The said bishop refused to take any knowledge of it, and desired the king to apply for a commission to be sent into the realm authorised to determine the cause, thus pretending it might nowise be entreated at Rome, but only within the king's own realm. He delegated his whole powers to Campeggio and Wolsey, giving them also a special commission in form of a decretal, wherein he declared the king's marriage null and empowered him to marry again. In the open commission also he gave them full authority to give sentence for the king. Secretly, he gave them instructions to burn the commission decretal and not proceed upon it. But at the time of sending the commission, he also sent the king a brief, written in his own hand, admitting the just of his course, and promising sanctissime sub verbo pontificus that he would never advocate it to Rome. Engagements, which he intended to keep or break according to the terms of war between Francis and Charles, did not press very heavily perhaps on Clement's conscience, but they were not extorted from him without many agonies. He has granted the commission, Casalus wrote. He is not unwilling to please the king and Wolsey, but fears the Spaniards more than ever he did. The friar general has forbidden him in the emperor's name to grant the king's request. He fears from his life from the imperialists if the emperor knows of it. Before he would grant the brief, he said weeping that it would be his utter ruin. The Venetians and Florentines desired his destruction. His sole hope of life was from the emperor. He asked me to swear whether the king would desert him or not. Satisfied on this point, he granted the brief, saying that he placed himself in the king's arms, as he would be drawn into perpetual war with the emperor. Wolsey might dispose of him, and the papacy as if he were Pope himself. The Emperor had insisted, at Catherine's desire, that the cause should not be heard in England. The Pope had agreed that it should be heard in England. Consent had been wrung from him, but his consent had been given, and Campeggio was to go and make the best of it. His open commission was as ample as words could make it. He and Wolsey were to hear the cause and decide it. 
The secret decretal, which he had wept over while he signed it, declared, before the cause was heard, the sentence which was to be given, and he had pledged his solemn word not to revoke the hearing to Rome. All that Clement could do was to instruct the legate before he started to waste time on his way, and on his arrival in England to use his skill to accommodate matters, and to persuade the Queen, if he found her persuadable, to save him from his embarrassments by taking the veil. This was a cause which Charles himself in his private mind would have recommended, but was too honourable to advise it. The fatal decretal was to be seen only by a very few persons, and then, as Henry said, Campeggio was to burn it. He was instructed also to pass no sentence without first referring back to Rome, and if driven to extremity, was to find an excuse for postponing a decision. Very natural conduct on the part of a weak, frightened mortal. Conduct not unlike that of his predecessor, Alexander the Third, in the quarrel between Becket and Henry the Second. But in both cases purely human, not such as might have been looked for in a divinely guided vicar of Christ. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Frude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 4 The marriage with Anne Boleyn was now a fixed idea in Henry's mind. He had become passionately attached to her, though not perhaps she to him. The evidence of his feeling remains in a series of letters to her. How preserved for public inspection, no one knows. Some of them were said to have been stolen by Campeggio. Perhaps they were sold to him. At any rate, they survive. A critic in the Edinburgh Review described them as such as might have been written by a potboy to his girl. The potboy must have been a singular specimen of his kind. Juan, at any rate, remains to show that, though Henry was in love, he did not allow his love to blind him to his duty as a prince. The lady though obliged to wait for the full gratification of her ambition, had been using her influence to advance her friends, while Wolsey brought upon himself the rebuke of his master by insufficient care in the distribution of church patronage. The correspondence throws an unexpected light upon the king's character. The abbess of Wilton had died. The situation was a pleasant one. Among the sisters who aspired to the vacant office was a certain Eleanor Carey, a near connection of Anne, and a favourite with her. The appointment rested virtually with the crown. The Lady Anne spoke to the king. The king deputed Wolsey to inquire into the fitness of the various candidates with a favourable recommendation of Eleanor Carey's claims. The inquiry was made, and the result gives us a glimpse into the habits of the devout recluses in these sacred institutions. As for the matter of Wilton, wrote Henry to Anne, my lord cardinal here had the nuns before him, and examined them in the presence of Master Bell, who assures me that she whom we would have had abbess has confessed herself to have had two children by two different priests, and has been since kept not long ago by a servant of Lord Broke that was. Wherefore I would not for all the gold in the world clog your conscience nor mine to make her ruler of a house which is of so ungodly demeanour, nor I trust you would not that, neither for brother nor sister, I should so disdain my honour or conscience. And as touching the prioress, Isabella Jordan, or Dame Eleanor's elder sister, though there is not any evident cause proved against them, and the prioress is so old that of many years she could not be as she was named, yet notwithstanding, to do you pleasure I have done that neither of them shall have it, but that some other good and well-disposed woman shall have it, whereby the house shall be better reformed, whereof I assure you it have much need, and God much the better served. This letter is followed by another to the cardinal. Wolsey, in whose hands the king had left the matter, in a second letter which is lost, instead of looking out for the good and well-disposed woman, though Isabella Jordan's reputation was doubtful, yet chose to appoint her, and the king's observations upon this action of his are worth attending to, as addressed by such a person as Henry is supposed to have been to a cardinal archbishop and legate of the Holy See. Many of the letters signed by the king were the composition of his ministers and secretaries. This to Wolsey, 
was his own. The great affection and love I bear you causeth me, using the doctrine of my master, quem diligo castigo, thus plainly as now ensueth to break to you my mind, ensuring you that neither sinister report, affection to my own pleasure, interest, nor mediation of any other body beareth part in this case. Wherefore, whatsoever I do say, I pray you think it spoken of no displeasure but of him that would you as much good both of body and soul as you would yourself. Methinks it is not the right train of a trusty, loving friend and servant when the matter is put by the master's consent into his arbitra and judgment, especially in a matter wherein his master hath both royalty and interest, to elect and choose a person who was by him defended. And yet another thing which displeaseth me more, that is to cloak your offence made by ignorance of my pleasure, saying that you expressly knew not my determinate mind in that behalf. Alas, my lord, what can be more evident or plainer than these words, especially to a wise man? His grace careth not who, but referreth it all to you, so that none of those who either be or have been spotted with incontinence like as by report the prioress hath been in her youth, have it. And also in another place in the letter. And therefore his highness thinketh her not meet for that purpose. Thirdly, in another place in the same letter, by these words, and though his grace speaketh not of it so openly, yet me seemeth his pleasure is that in no wise the prioress have it, nor yet Dame Eleanor's elder sister, for many considerations the which your grace can and will best consider. Now, my lord, it is a double offence both to do ill and to colour it too. But with men that have wit it cannot be accepted so. Wherefore, good my lord, use no more that way with me, for there is no man living that more hateth it. These things, having been thus committed, either I must have reserved them in pectore, whereby more displeasure might happen to breed, or else thus soundly and plainly to declare them to you, because I do think that cum amico et familiari sincere semper et agendum, and especially the master to his best beloved servant and friend, for in so doing the one shall be more circumspect in his doing, the other shall declare and show the loathness that is in him to have any occasion to be displeased with him. And as touching the redress of religion, convent discipline, if it be observed and continued, undoubtedly it is a gracious act. Notwithstanding, if all reports be true, ab imbecilis imbecile expectantur. Howbeit, Mr. Bell hath informed me that the prioress's age, personage, and manner, preset fert gravitatum, I pray God it be so indeed, seeing she is preferred to that room. I understand furthermore, which is greatly to my comfort, that you have ordered yourself to Godward as religiously and virtuously as any prelate or father of Christ's church can do, where in so doing and persevering there can be nothing more acceptable to God, more honour to yourself, nor more desired of your friends, among the which I reckon myself not the least. I pray you, my lord, think it not that it is upon any displeasure that I write this unto you, for surely it is for my discharge before God, being in the room that I am in, and secondly, for the great zeal I bear unto you, not undeserved in your behalf. Wherefore I pray you take it so, and I assure you, your fault acknowledged, there shall remain in me no spark of displeasure, trusting hereafter you shall recompense that with a thing much more acceptable to me. Thus fare you well. Advertising you that, thanked be God, I and all my folk be and have been since we came to Amptill, which was on Saturday last, July the 11th, in marvellous good health and clearness of air. Written with the hand of him that is and shall be your loving sovereign lord and friend, Henry R. Campeggio, meanwhile, was loitering on his way as he'd been directed, pretending illness, pretending difficulties of the road. In sending him at all, the Pope had broken his promise to Charles. He engaged, however, that no sentence should be given which had not been submitted first to Charles's approval. The Emperor, anxious to avoid a complete rupture with England, let the legate go forward, but he directed Mendoza to inform Wolsey that he must defend his aunt's honour. 
Her cause was his, and he would hold it as such. Wolsey, though afraid of the consequence of opposing the divorce to himself and the church, yet at heart had ceased to desire it. Mendoza reported that English opinion was still unfavourable, and that he did not believe that the commission would have any result. The Pope would interpose delays. Wolsey would allow and recognise them. Both legates would agree privately to keep the matter in suspense. The English cardinal appeared to be against the Queen, but everyone knew that secretly he was now on her side. Catherine only was seriously frightened. She had doubtless been informed of the secret decretal by which the Pope appeared to have prejudged her cause. She supposed that the Pope meant it, and did not understand how lightly such engagements sate upon him. The same Clement, when Benvenuto Cellini reproached him for breaking his word, replied, smiling, that the Pope had power to bind and to loose. Catherine came before long to know him better, to understand the bearings of the singular privilege. But as yet she thought that words meant what they seemed to say. When she heard that Campeggio was actually coming, she wrote passionately to the Emperor, flinging herself upon him for protection. Charles calmed her alarm. She was not, he said, to be condemned without a hearing. The Pope had assured him that the legates should determine nothing to her detriment. The case should be decided at Rome as she had desired. Campeggio's orders were to advise that it should be dropped. Apart from his present infatuation, the king was a good Christian and would act as one. If he persisted, she might rely on the Pope's protection. She must consent to nothing which would imply the dissolution of her marriage. The worst came, the king would be conscious of his duties. In the middle of October, the legate arrived. He had been ill in earnest from gout and was still suffering. He had to rest two days in Calais before he could face the channel. The passage was wild. A deputation of peers and bishops waited to receive him at Dover. Respectful demonstrations had been prepared at the towns through which he was to pass, and a state ceremonial was to accompany his entrance into London. But he was, or pretended to be, too sick to allow himself to be seen. He was eight days on the road from the coast, and on reaching his destination he was carried privately in a state barge to the house provided for his residence. Wolsey called the next morning. The king was absent, but returned two days later to the Bridewell Palace. There Campeggio waited on him, accompanied by Wolsey. The weather continued to frown. I wish, wrote Gerardo Mozza to the Marchioness of Mantua, that you could have seen the two cardinals abreast, one on his mule, the other carried in his chair, the rain falling fast, so we were all drenched. The king, simple man, believed that the documents which he held secured him. The Pope, in sending the legate, had acted in the teeth of the Emperor's prohibition, and no one guessed how the affair had been soothed down. The farce was well played, and the language used was what Henry expected. Messer Floriano, one of Campeggio's suite, made a grand oration, setting out the storming of Rome, the perils of the Church, and the misery of Italy with moving eloquence. The crowd was so dense in the hall of audience that some of the Italians lost their shoes and had to step back barefoot to their lodgings through the wet streets. The legate was exhausted by the exertion, but he was not allowed to rest, and the serious part of the business began at once behind the scenes. He had hoped, as the emperor said, that the case might be dropped. He found Henry immovable. An angel from heaven, he wrote on the 17th of October, would not be able to persuade the king that his marriage was not invalid. The matter had come to such a pass that it could no longer be borne with. The Cardinal of York and the whole kingdom insisted that the question must be settled in some way. One road out of the difficulty alone presented itself. The Emperor had insisted that the marriage should not be dissolved by Catherine's consent, objecting reasonably that a judgment invalidating it would shake other royal marriages besides hers. But no such judgment would be necessary if Catherine could be induced to enter lax religion, to take vows of chastity, which at her age and under her conditions of health would be in their form. The Pope could then allow Henry to take another wife without offence to anyone. 
the legitimacy of the princess would not be touched, and the king undertook that the succession should be settled upon her if he had no male heir. The queen, in consenting, would lose nothing, for the king had for two years lived apart from her and would never return to cohabitation. The emperor would be delivered from an obligation infinitely inconvenient to him, and his own honour and the honour of Spain would be equally untouched. These arguments were laid before the queen by both the legates, and urged with all their eloquence. In the interests of the realm, in the interests of Europe, in the interests of the church, in her own and her daughter's interest as well, it would have been wiser if she had complied. Perhaps she would have complied had the king's plea been confined, as at first, to the political exigencies of the succession. But the open and premature choice of the lady who was to take her place was an indignity not to be borne. She had the pride of her race. Her obstinacy was a match for her husband's. She was shaken for a moment by the impassioned entreaties of Compedio, and she did not at once absolutely refuse. The legate postponed the opening of his court. He referred to Rome for further instructions, complaining of the responsibility which was thrown upon him. Being on the spot, he was able to measure the danger of disappointing the king after the secret commission, the secret decretal, and the Pope's private letter telling Henry that he was right. Campeggio wrote to Salviati, after his first interview with Catherine, that he did not yet despair. Something might be done if the emperor would advise her to comply. He asked Fisher to help him, and Fisher seemed not wholly unwilling. But, after a few days' reflection, Catherine told him that before she would consent, she would be torn limb from limb. She would have an authoritative sentence from the Pope, and would accept nothing else. Nothing should make her alter her opinion, and if, after death, she could return to life, she would die over again, rather than change it. Wolsey was in equal anxiety. He had set the stone rolling, but he could not stop it. If Clement failed the king now, after all that he had promised, he might not only bring ruin on Wolsey himself, but might bring on the overthrow of the temporal power of the Church of England. Catherine was personally popular, but in the middle classes of the laity, among the peers and gentlemen of England, the exactions of the church courts, the Pope's agents and collectors, the despotic tyranny of the bishops, had created a resentment, the extent of which none knew better than he. The entire gigantic system of clerical dominion, of which Wolsey was himself the pillar and representative, was tottering to its fall. If the king was driven to bay, the favour of a good-natured people for a suffering woman would be a poor shelter either for the church or for him. Campeggio turned to Wolsey for advice on Catherine's final refusal. The Pope, he said, had hoped that Wolsey would advise the king to yield. Wolsey had advised. He told Cavendish that he had gone on his knees to the king, but he could only say to Campeggio that the king, fortified and justified by reasons, writings and counsels of many learned men who feared God, would never yield. If he was to find that the Pope had been playing with him, and the succession was to be left undetermined, the church would be ruined, and the realm would be in infinite peril. How great, how real, was the dread of a disputed succession, appears from an extraordinary expedient which had suggested itself to Campeggio himself, in which he declares that some perplexed politicians had seriously contemplated. They have thought, he wrote on 28th of October, of marrying the Princess Mary to the King's natural son, the Duke of Richmond, if it could be done by dispensation from his holiness. The legate said that at first he had himself thought of this as a means of establishing the succession, but did not believe it would satisfy the king's desire. If anything could be more astonishing than a proposal for the marriage of a brother and sister, it was the reception which the suggestion met with at Rome. The Pope's secretary replied that, With regard to the dispensation for marrying the son to the daughter of the king, if on the succession being so established the king would abandon the divorce, the Pope would be much more inclined to grant it. Clement's estimate of the extent of the dispensing power was large. But the situation was desperate. He had entangled himself in the meshes. He had promised what he had no intention of performing. 
he was finding that he had been trifling with a lion, that the lion was beginning to rouse himself. Again and again, Wolsey urged the dangers upon him. He wrote on the 1st of November to Casalus that the king's honour was touched, having been so great a benefactor to the Holy See. The Pope would alienate all faith and devotion to the Apostolic See. The sparks of opposition which had been extinguished with such care and vigilance would blaze out to the utmost anger of all, both in England and elsewhere. Clement and his cardinals heard, but imperfectly believed. He tells us, wrote Sanger, that if the divorce is not granted, the authority of the apostolic see in England will be annihilated. He is eager to save it, because his own greatness is bound up with ours. The curio was incredulous, and thought that Wolsey was only alarmed for himself. Wolsey, however, was right. Although opinions might have varied on the merits of the king's request, people were beginning to ask what value as a supreme judge a pope could have, who could not decide on a point of canon law. The excitement was growing. Certain knowledge of what was going on was confined to the few who had access to the secret correspondence, and they knew only what was meant for their own eyes. All parties, English and imperial alike, distrusted the Pope. He had impartially lied to both, and could be depended on by neither, except so far as they could influence his fears. Catherine was still the favourite with the London citizens, she had been seen accidentally in a gallery of the palace, and had been enthusiastically cheered. The king found it necessary to explain himself. On the 8th of November, he summoned the Lord Mayor and Aldermen, the Privy Council, and a body of peers, and laid the situation before them from his own point of view. He spoke of his long friendship with the Emperor, and of his hope that it would not be broken, and again of his alliance with France, and of his desire to be at peace with all the world. He had wished, he said, to attach France more closely to him by marrying his daughter to a French prince, and the French ambassador, in considering the proposal, had raised the question of her legitimacy. His own mind had long misgiven him on the lawfulness of his marriage. Monsieur de Tarbes words had added to his uneasiness. The succession to the crown was uncertain. He had consulted his bishops and lawyers, and they had assured him that he had been living in mortal sin. He meant only to do what was right, and he warned his subjects to be careful of forming hasty judgments on their prince's actions. Apart from the present question, the king was extremely popular, and reports arriving from Spain touched the national pride. There was a talk of calling Parliament. Mendoza and Catherine again urged Charles to speak plainly. The Pope must inhibit Parliament from interfering. The nuncio in London would present the order, and Parliament, they thought, would submit. They were mistaking the national temper. Mendoza's letters had persuaded the Spanish council that the whole of England was in opposition to the king. The Spanish chancellor had said publicly that if the cause was proceeded with, there would be war, and the king would be dethroned by his own subjects. The words were reported to Wolsey, were confirmed by an English agent, Sylvester Darius, who had been sent to Valladolid on business connected with the truce. Darius had spoken to the Chancellor on the probability of England taking active part with France. "'Why do you talk of the King of England?' the Chancellor had answered. "'If we wished, we could expel him from his kingdom in three months. What force had the King? His own subjects would expel him. He knew how matters were.' It was one thing for a free people to hold independent opinions on the arrangements of their own royal family. It was another to be threatened with civil war at the instigation of a foreign sovereign. Wolsey quoted the dangerous language at a public meeting in London, and a voice answered, The Emperor has lost the arts of a hundred thousand Englishmen. A fresh firebrand was thrown into the flames immediately after. The national pride was touched on a side where it was already sensitive from interest. There were 15,000 Flemish artisans in London. English workmen had been jealous of their skill and had long looked askance at them. The cry rose that they had an army of traitors in their midst who must be instantly expelled. The Flemings' houses were searched for arms and watched by a guard, and the working city population, traders, shopkeepers, mechanics, apprentices, came over to the king's side and remained there. Meantime, the cause itself hung fire. 
A new feature had been introduced to enable Campeggio to decline to proceed, and the Pope to withdraw decently from his promises. The original bull, the Pope Julius, permitting the marriage, had been found to contain irregularities of form which were supposed fatal to it. The validity of the objection was not denied, but was met by the production of a brief alleged to have been found in Spain, and bearing the same date with the bull which exactly met that objection. No trace of such a brief could be found in the Vatican Register. It had informalities of its own, and its genuineness was justly suspected. But it answered the purpose of a new circumstance. A copy only was sent to England, which was shown by Catherine in triumph to Henry, but the original was detained. It would be sent to Rome, not to London. Without it, Campeggio could pretend inability to move, and meanwhile he could refuse to proceed on his commission. Subterfuges which answer for the moment revenged themselves in the end. Having been once raised, it was absolutely necessary that a question immediately affecting the succession should be settled in some way. Many of the peers who had been hitherto cool began to back the king's demands. An address was drawn up, having among others the Duke of Norfolk's signature, telling the Pope that the divorce must be conceded, and complaints were sent through Casalis against Campeggio's dilatoriness. The king, he was to say, would not submit to be deluded. Casalis delivered his message, and describes the effect which it produced. The Pope, he wrote, very angry, laid his hand on my arm and forbade me to proceed, saying there was but too good ground for complaint, and he was deluded by his own counsellors. He granted the decretal only to be shown to the king, and then burnt, Wolsey now wished to divulge it. He saw what would follow, and would gladly recall what had been done, even with the loss of one of his fingers. Casalis replied that Wolsey wished only to show it to a few persons whose secrecy might be depended on. Was it not demanded for that purpose? Why had the Pope changed his mind? The Pope, only the more excited, said he saw the bull would be the ruin of him, and he would make no more concessions. Casalis prayed him to consider. Waving his arms violently, Clement said, I do consider. I consider the ruin which is hanging over me. I repent what I have done. If heresies arise, is it my fault? I will not violate my conscience. Let them, if they like, send the legate back because he will not proceed. They can do as they please, provided they do not make me responsible. Did the Pope mean, then, Casalus asked, that the commission should not proceed? The Pope could not say as much as that. He had told Campeggio, he said, to dissuade the king and persuade the queen. What harm could there be? Casalis inquired, and showing the decretal under oath to a few of the privy council. The Pope said the decretal ought to have been burnt and refused to discuss the matter further. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froder this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 5 Human pity is due to the unfortunate Pope, Vicar of Christ, Supreme Judge in Europe, whose decrees were the inspirations of the Holy Ghost, spinning like a whipped top under the alternate lashes of the King of England and the Emperor. He had hoped that his decretal would not be known. It could not be concealed from Mendoza, who discovered putting the worst interpretation upon it, that the Pope and the King had been endeavouring to intimidate the Queen into retiring into a convent. Finding that he, too, could put no faith in Clement, the Emperor's representative at Rome now forced a new promise from him. The proceedings in England were not to be opened without a fresh direct order from the Pope, and this the Pope was to be forbidden to give. If the King was obstinate and the Queen demanded it, Campeggio was to leave England, and notwithstanding his engagements to the contrary, Clement was to advocate the cause to Rome. The new brief was sufficient plea. Without it, the legates could come to no conclusion, the whole right of the Queen being based upon its contents. The Emperor had it in his hands, and by refusing to allow it to be examined, except at Rome, might prevent them from moving. There was little doubt that the brief had been forged for the occasion. 
The Pope, having sent a commission to England, the King considered that he had a right to the production of documents essential to the case. It required Catherine to write to Charles to ask for it. Catherine did as he desired, and the messenger who carried her letter to the Spanish court was sworn to carry no private or separate missive from her. Mendoza dared not write by the same hand himself, lest his dispatches should be examined. He made the messenger therefore learn a few words by heart, telling the emperor that the queen's letter was not to be attended to. We thought, he said, that the man's oath was thus saved. Thus time drifted on. The new year came, and no progress had been made, though Campeggio had been three months in England. The Pope, more helpless than dishonest, continued to assure the king that he would do all that by law could be required of him, and as much as he could do ex plenitudine potestatis. No peril should prevent him. If the king thought his resigning the papacy would conduce to his purpose, he could be content, for the love he bore his highness rather than fail to do the same. If the Pope was so well disposed, the king could not see where the difficulty lay. The queen had refused his entreaty that she should enter religion. Why should not the Pope then allow the decretal to be put into execution? But Cardinal Salviati informed Casalis that a sentence given in virtue of the decretal would have no effect, but would only cause the Pope's deposition. Visibly and unpleasantly, it now became apparent to Henry to what issues the struggle was tending. He had not expected it. Wolsey had told him that the Pope would yield, and the Pope had promised what was asked, but his promises were turning to vapour. Wolsey had said that the Emperor could not afford to quarrel with him. The King found that war with the Emperor in earnest was likely enough unless he himself drew back, and draw back he would not. Poor Pope was as anxious as Henry. He had spoken of resigning, he was near being spared the trouble. Harassed beyond his strength, he fell ill and was expected to die. And before Wolsey there was now apparently the strange alternative either of utter disgrace or of himself ascending the chair of St. Peter as Clement's successor. His election, perhaps, was really among the chances of the situation. The cardinals had not forgiven the sack of Rome. A French or English candidate had a fair prospect of success, and Wolsey could command the French interest. He had boundless money, and money in the sacred college was only not omnipotent. He undertook, if he was chosen, to resign his enormous English preferments and reside at Rome, and the vacancy of his three bishoprics in his abbey would pour a cataract of gold into the cardinal's purses. The bulls for English bishoprics had to be paid for on a scale which startled Wolsey himself. Already Archbishop of York, Bishop of Winchester and Abbot of St Albans, he had just been presented to Durham. He had paid 8,000 ducats to expedite his bulls for Winchester. The cardinals demanded 13,000 ducats for Durham. The ducat was worth five shillings, and five shillings in 1528 were worth 50 shillings of modern money. At such a rate were English preferments bled to support the College of Cardinals. And if all these great benefices were again vacated, there would be a fine harvest to be gathered. For a week or two, the splendid vision suspended even the agitation over the divorce. But the Pope revived, and the legates and he had to resume their ungrateful burden. It was still really uncertain what Clement would do. Weak, impulsive men often leave their course to fate or chance to decide for them. Casalis, when he was able to attend to business again, told him in Wolsey's name that he must take warning from his late danger. By the willfully suffering a thing of such high importance to be unreformed to the doing whereof Almighty God worked so openly, he would incur God's displeasure and peril his soul. The imperialists were as anxious as Wolsey, and equally distrustful. In the sacred college, English gold was an influence not to be despised, and Henry had more to give than Charles. Mysa May, the imperial agent at Rome, found as the spring came on that the Italian cardinals were growing cold. Salviati insisted to him that Catherine must go into a convent. Casalis denounced the new brief as a forgery, and the sacred college seemed to be of the same opinion. 
the fiery Mai, complained in the Pope's presence of the scant courtesy which the ministers of the Emperor were meeting with, while the insolent and overbearing were regaled like the prodigal son. The Pope assured him that, come what might, he would never authorise the divorce. But Mai only partially believed him. At trying moments, Mai was even inclining to take the same view of the papacy as Lope de Soria. At other times, he said, many things could be got out of the Pope by sheer intimidation. But now that could not be tried, for he would fall into despair, and the imperialists would lose him altogether. They owed him something for what he had done for them before, otherwise he would be of the opinion that it would be for God's service to reduce them to their spiritual powers. Occasionally Mai's temper broke through, and he used language worth observing. One of the cardinals had spoken slightingly of the emperor. I did not call on his holiness, he wrote to Charles, but sent him a message, adding that if it ever came to my notice that the same cardinal or any member of the college had dared to speak in such an indecent manner of the emperor, I took my most solemn oath that I would have him beheaded or burnt alive within his own apartment. I had this time refrained out of respect for his holiness, but should the insult be repeated, I would not hesitate. They might do as they would with their bulls and other rogueries, grant or refuse them as they liked, but they were not to speak evil of princes, or make themselves judges in the affairs of kingdoms. This remarkable message was conveyed to the Pope, who seemed rather pleased than otherwise. Mai, however, observed that the revolt of the Lutherans was not to be wondered at, and in what they said of Rome he considered they were entirely right, except on points of faith. Cardinals had been roughly handled in the sack of the holy city at but a year's distance. The possibility was extremely real. The imperial minister, it appeared, could still command the services of the Spanish garrisons in the papal territories as severity was needed, and the members of the sacred college had good reason to be uneasy. But King Henry might reasonably object to the trial of his cause in a country where the assessors of the supreme judge were liable to summary execution if they were insubordinate. But Charles could allow his representative to write in such terms to him proves that he and Mai, and Henry himself, were in tolerable agreement on church questions. The Pope knew it. One of his chief fears was that the Emperor, France, England, and the German princes might come to an understanding to his own disadvantage. Perhaps it might have been so had not the divorce kept Henry and Charles apart. Campeggio wrote to Sanger on the 3rd of April that certain advances had been made by the Lutherans to Henry, in which they promised to relinquish all heresies on articles of faith, and to believe according to divine law if he and the king of France would reduce the ecclesiastical state to the condition of the primitive church, taking from it all its temporalities. He had told the king this was the devil dressed in angels' clothing, and made design against the property of the church, that had been ruled by councils and theologians that it was right for the church to hold temporal property. The king said, those rules have been made by churchmen themselves, and now the laity must interfere. He said also that churchmen were said to be leading wicked lives, especially about the court of Rome. Growled at on both sides, in terror for himself, in terror for the church, the Pope drifted on, hoping for some accident to save him which never came, and wishing perhaps that his illness had made an end of him. The Emperor complained of Campeggio as partial to the King because he held an English bishopric. If the Pope leaves the succession undetermined, insisted Wolsey on the other side, no prince would tolerate such an injury. Nothing was done, wrote the Pope's secretary to Campeggio, and nothing will be done. The Pope was in great trouble between the English and imperial ambassadors. He wished to please the king, but the king and cardinal must not expect them to move until they had forced the Venetians to restore the papal territories. Stephen Gardner, who knew Clement well and watched him from day to day, said, He was a man who never resolved anything unless compelled by some violent affection. He was in great perplexity and seemed willing to gratify the king if he could, but when it came to the point, did nothing. He would be glad if the king's cause could be determined in England by the legates, and if the emperor made any suit against what should be done there, they would serve him as they now serve the king, and put off the time. So matters would go on, unless Campeggio would frankly promise to give sentence in the king's favour, 
otherwise such delays would be found as the counterfeit brief had caused. Sir Francis Bryan, who was also at the papal court, wrote to the king that the Pope would do nothing for him, and whoever had told the king that he would had not done the best service. He was very sorry to write thus, but the king must not be fed with their flattering words. To wait longer on the Pope's action was now seen in England to be useless. The Pope dared not offend the Emperor further, and the Emperor had interposed to prohibit further action. Clement had himself several times suggested that the best way was to decide the case first in England in the legate's court, and leave Catherine to appeal. He had promised Charles that no judgment should be given in England by the legates, but he had worn so double a face that no one could say which truly belonged to him. Gardiner and Bryan were recalled. The king, finding the Pope's ingratitude, resolved to dissemble with him, and proceed on the commission granted to Wolsey and Compeggio. The Cardinal of York encouraged his brother Legate by assuring him that if the marriage was now dissolved, means would be found to satisfy the Emperor. Catherine would be left with her state undiminished, would have anything that she desired except the person of the king. The Emperor's natural daughter might be married to the Duke of Richmond, and all would be well. So Wolsey wrote, but his mind was less easy than he pretended. Unless Henry was supported actively by the French, he knew that the Pope would fail him in the end, and Francis had been disappointed in the hope that Henry would stand actively by him in the war. Without effectual help from that quarter, Wolsey saw that he was himself undone. The French ambassador represented to his court that Wolsey was sincerely attached to the French alliance, that the king had only been induced to enterprise the affair by the assurance which the cardinal had always given that he had nothing to fear from the emperor. Wolsey had advanced the divorce as a means to break off forever the alliance with the emperor, and Francis, by now declaring himself, would confer a very great favour on the king, and would oblige Wolsey as much as if he had made him pope. His master was not only now concerned for the discharge of his conscience and his desire to have issue, but the very safety and independence of England was at stake. He could not have it said that he left the succession to the throne uncleared for the threats of his enemy. The Duke of Suffolk was dispatched to Paris to bring Francis to the point. Francis professed the warmest good will to his brother of England. He undertook to advise the Pope. He assured Suffolk that if the Emperor attempted force, Henry would find him at his side. But further, he would not pledge himself. The time was passed for a Wolsey patriarchate, and Francis, curiously enough, expressed doubts whether Wolsey was not, after all, betraying Henry. There are some, he said, which the king, my brother, does trust in that matter that would it should never take effect. Campeggio told me he did not think the divorce would be brought about, but should be dissembled well enough. When the Cardinal of England was with me, as far as I could perceive, he desired that the divorce might take place, for he loved not the queen but advised my brother not to trust any man too much and to look to his own matters. The Cardinal has great intelligence with the Pope, and Campeggio, and they are not inclined to it. Things could not go on thus forever. There would have been an excuse for Clement, if, with a consciousness of his high office, he had refused to anticipate a judgment until the case had been heard and considered. But from the first, the right or wrong of the cause itself had been disregarded as of no moment. Nothing had been thought of but the alternate dangers to be anticipated from the king or the emperor. Had the French driven the imperialists out of Italy, the divorce would have been granted without further question. The supreme tribunal in Christendom was transparently influenced by no motive save interest or fear. Clement, in fact, had anticipated judgment, though he dared not avow it. He had appointed a commission, and by the secret decretal had ruled what the decision was to be. The decretal could not be produced, but with or without it, the king insisted that the court should sit. Campeggio had been sent to try the cause, and try it he should. Notice was given that the suit was to be heard at the end of June. Wolsey, perhaps, had chosen a date not far from the close of term, that the vacation might suspend the process and give time for further delay. Since a trial of some kind could not be avoided, Final instructions were sent from Rome to Campeggio. If, wrote Sangaturn, the Pope was not certain that he remembered the injunctions which he had given him by word of mouth, and which had been written to him many times, he would be very anxious. 
His Holiness had always desired that the cause should be protracted in order to find some means by which he could satisfy the king without proceeding to sentence. The citation of the cause to Rome, which he had so often insisted on, had been deferred, not because it was doubted whether the matter could be treated with less scandal at Rome than there, but because His Holiness had ever shrunk from a step which would offend the king. But since Campeggio had not been able to prevent the commencement of the proceedings, his holiness warned him that the process must be slow, and that no sentence must in any manner be pronounced. He would not lack a thousand means and pretexts, if on no other point, at least upon the brief which had been produced. According to Casalis, the view taken of the general situation at Rome was this. The Pope would not openly declare for the Emperor till he saw how matters went. He thought the Emperor would come to Italy, if there was a war would be victorious, so that it would be for His Holiness's advantage to obtain his friendship beforehand. If peace was made, the Emperor would dictate terms, and more was to be hoped from his help than from the French King. The Emperor was the enemy of the Allies, and sought to recover the honour which he lost by the sack of Rome by making himself protector of the Pope. Wolsey's dream was over, and with it the dreams of Lope de Soria, and Mysa Mai. The fine project to unite France and England in defence of the papacy was proving baseless as the sand on which it was built. Henry VIII was to lead the reform of the church in England. Charles, instead of beheading cardinals, was to become the champion of the Roman hierarchy. The air was clearing. The parties in the great game were drifting into their natural situations. The fate which lay before Wolsey himself, the fate which lay before the Church of England, of the worst corruptions of which he himself was the chief projector and example, his own conscience enabled him too surely to foresee. Mendoza was recalled, and before leaving had an interview with the king. The emperor, he said, was obliged to defend his aunt. It was a private affair, which touched the honour of his family. The king answered that the emperor had no right to interfere. He did not meddle himself with the private affairs of other princes. Mendoza was unable to guess what was likely to happen. The suit was to go on, and if a prohibitory mandate arrived from the Pope, it was uncertain whether Wolsey would obey it, and it was doubtful also whether any such mandate would be sent. He suspected Clement of possible deliberate treachery. He believed that orders had been sent to the legate to proceed and give sentence in virtue of the first commission. In that case, the sentence would certainly be against the Queen, and not a moment must be lost in pressing an appeal to Rome. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Frood This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle Chapter 6 the great scene in the hall at the Blackfriars, when the cause of Henry the Eighth and Catherine of Aragon was pleaded before Wolsey and Campeggio, is too well known to require further description. To the legates it was a splendid farce. They knew that it was to end in nothing. The world outside, even the parties chiefly concerned, were uncertain what the Pope intended, and waited for the event to determine their subsequent conduct. There was more at issue than the immediate question before the court. The point really at stake was whether the interests of the English nation could be trusted any longer to a judge who was degrading his office by allowing himself to be influenced by personal fears and interests, who, when called on to permit sentence to be delivered by delegates whom he had himself appointed, yet confessed himself unable or unwilling to decide whether it should be delivered or not. Abstractly, Henry's demand was right. A marriage with a brother's wife was not lawful, and no papal dispensation could make it so. But long custom had sanctioned what in itself was forbidden. The Pope could plead the undisputed usage of centuries, and if, when the case was first submitted to him, he had unequivocally answered that a marriage contract had bona fide under his predecessor's sanction could not be broken, English opinion, it is likely, would have sustained him even at the risk of a disputed succession, and the king himself would have dropped his suit. But the Pope, as a weak mortal, 
had wished to please a powerful sovereign. He had entertained the king's petition. He had hesitated, had professed inability to come to a conclusion, finally had declared that justice was on the king's side, and promised that it should be so declared. If he now drew back, broke his engagements, and raised new difficulties in the settlement of a doubt which the long discussion of it had made serious, if he allowed it to be seen that his change of purpose was due to the menaces of another secular prince, was such a judge to be any longer tolerated? Was not the papacy itself degenerate, and unfit to exercise any longer the authority which had been allowed to assume? This aspect of the matter was not a farce at all. The papal supremacy itself was on its trial. On the 16th of June, the king and queen were cited to appear in court. Catherine was unprepared. She had been assured by the emperor that her cause should not be tried in England. She called on Campeggio to explain. Campeggio answered that the Pope, having deputed two legates for the process, could not revoke their commission without grave consideration. He exhorted her to pray God to enlighten her to take some good advice, considering the times. He was not without hope that, at the last extremity, she would yield and take the vows. But she did not in the least accede to his hints, and no one could tell what she meant to do. She soon showed what she meant to do. On the 18th, the court sate. Henry appeared by a proctor, who said for him that he had scruples about the validity of his marriage, which he required to be resolved. Catherine, attended in person, rose and delivered a brief protest against the place of trial and the competency of the judges. Wolsey was an English subject. Campeggio held an English bishopric. They were not impartial. She demanded to be heard at Rome, delivered her protest in writing, and withdrew. It was at once answered for the king that he could not plead in the city where the emperor was master. The court adjourned for three days that the cardinals might consider. On the 21st, they say it again. The scene became more august. Henry came now himself, and took his place under a canopy at the legate's right hand. Catherine attended again, and sate in equal state at their left. Henry spoke. He said he believed that he had been in mortal sin. He could bear it no longer and required judgment. Wolsey replied that they would do what was just, and then Catherine left her seat, crossed in front of them, and knelt at her husband's feet. She had been his lawful wife, she said, for twenty years, and had not deserved to be repudiated and put to shame. She begged him to remember their daughter, to remember her own relations, Charles and Ferdinand, who would be gravely offended. Crowds of women gathered about the palace gates had cheered her as she came in, and bade her care for nothing. If women had to decide the case at the French ambassador, the queen would win. Their voices availed nothing. She was told that her protest could not be admitted. She then left the court, was thrice summoned to come back, and, as she refused, was pronounced contumacious. For the king to appear as a suitor at Rome was justly regarded as impossible. Casalus was directed to tell Clement that, being in the emperor's hands, he could not be accepted as a judge in the case, and that sovereign princes were exempted by prerogative from pleading in courts outside their own dominions. If he admitted the queen's appeal, he would lose the devotion of the king and of England to the sea apostolic, and would destroy Wolsey forever. Had the legates been in earnest, there would have been no time to learn whether the appeal was allowed at Rome or not. They would have gone on and given sentence under their commission. It appeared as if this was what they intended to do. The court continued sitting. and Catherine being contumacious, there was nothing left to delay the conclusion. She was in despair. She believed herself betrayed. Mendoza, who might have comforted her, was gone. She wrote to him that she was lost unless the emperor or the pope interposed. Even Campeggio seemed to be ignorant how he was to avoid a decision. Campeggio, the French ambassador wrote, was already half conquered. If Francis would send a word to him, he might gather courage to pass sentence, and Henry would be brought to his knees in gratitude. The very pope, 
Perhaps in his heart would not have been displeased if the legates had disobeyed the orders which he had given, and had proceeded to judgment, as he had often desired that they might. My surmise accounts to Charles of the shifts of the poor old man, as the accounts from England reached him, were almost pathetic. Pope, cardinals, canon lawyers, my regarded as equally feeble, if not as equally treacherous. One reads with wonder the Spaniard's real estimate of the persons for whose sake, and in whose names, Charles and Philip were to paint Europe red with blood. Salviati, said Mai, who, though a great rogue, has not wit enough to hide his tricks, showed me the minute of a letter they had written to Campeggio. A more stupid or rascally composition could not have been concocted in hell. Campeggio was directed in this letter to reveal to no one that he had received orders not to give sentence. He was to go on making delays, which was what those people desired, because if he was to say that he would make no declaration in the affair, the Archbishop of York would act by himself, the Pope's mandate having been originally addressed to the two legates conjointly, or to one individually. The letter had gone on to direct Campeggio, if he could not manage this, to carry on the proceedings until the final sentence, but not to live a sentence without first consulting Rome. If possible, he was to keep this part of his instructions secret, for fear of displeasing the king. I lost all patience, Mai continued. Andrea de Burgo and I went to the Pope, and told them we had seen the instructions sent to Campeggio, which were of such a nature that if we were to inform your majesty of their contents, you would undoubtedly resent the manner in which you were being treated. We could not do that, but we could speak our minds plainly. The letter to Campeggio was a breach of faith so often pledged by his holiness to your majesty that the divorce suit should be advocated to Rome. The violation of such a promise and the right into Campeggio to go on with the proceeding was a greater insult and offence to your majesty than the commission given to him in the first instance. It was a wonder to see how lightly his holiness heard promises made in accordance with justice and reason. An offence of such a kind bore so much on the honour of your majesty and the princes of the imperial family that your majesty would not put up with it. The king would have but to ask Campeggio whether he would or would not give sentence, and if he refused, the duty would then devolve on the other legate. His holiness should be careful how he added fuel to the fire now raging in Christendom. It was not enough for Mai that the cause should be revoked to Rome. The English agent said that if an independent sovereign was to be forced to plead at Rome, the Pope must at least hear the suit in person. He must not refer it to the Rota. Mai would not hear of this. To the Rota it must go, and nowhere else. The Pope might be well, but he might die and be succeeded by a Pope of another sort, or the English might regain the influence they once had, and indeed had still, in the papal court. They were great favourites, bribing right and left and spending money freely. What was a miserable Pope to do? Casalis and Dr. Bennett, who had joined him from England, pointed out the inevitable consequences if he allowed himself to be governed by the emperor. The Pope replied with lamentations that none saw that better than he, that he was so placed between the hammer and the anvil that, though he wished to please the king, the whole storm would fall on him. The emperor would not endure an insult to his family, and had said that he regarded the cause more than all his kingdoms. Those were only ornaments of fortune, while this touched his honour. He would postpone the advocation for a few days, but it could not be refused. He was in the Emperor's power, and the Emperor could do as he pleased with him. The few days' respite meant that a hope that news of some decisive act might arrive meanwhile from England. The King must determine, Casalis and Bennett thought, whether it would be better to suspend the process at his own request, or to proceed to sentence before the advocation. The Pope, the commissioners added, was well disposed to the king and would not refuse to shed his blood for him. But in this cause and at this time, he said it was impossible. While matters were going thus at Rome, the suit in England went forward. The cardinals availed themselves of every excuse for delay, but in the presence of Catherine's determined refusal to recognise the court, delay became daily more difficult. The king pressed for judgment. Formal obstacles were exhausted, and the Roman legate must either produce his last instructions, which be in order not to reveal, or there was nothing left for him to urge as a reason for further hesitation. 
It was not supposed that in the face of a distinct promise the Pope would revoke the commission. Campeggio and Wolsey were sitting with full powers to hear and determine. Determine, it seemed, they must. When, at the fifth session, uncalled on and unlooked for, the Bishop of Rochester rose and addressed the court. The king, he said, had declared that his only intention was to have justice done, and to relieve himself of a scruple of conscience, and had invited the judges and everyone else to throw light upon a cause which distressed and perplexed him. He, the bishop, having given two years' diligent study to the question, felt himself bound in consequence to declare his opinion, and not risk the damnation of his soul by withholding it. He undertook, therefore, to declare and demonstrate that the marriage of the king and queen could be dissolved by no power, human or divine, and for that conclusion he was ready to lay down his life. The Baptist had held it glorious to die in a cause of marriage, when marriage was not so holy as it had been made by the shedding of Christ's blood. He was prepared to encounter any peril for the truth, and ended by presenting his arguments in a written form. The bishop's allusion to the Baptist was neither respectful nor felicitous. It implied that Henry, who as yet at least had punished no one for speaking freely, was no better than a herod. Henry's case was that to marry a brother's wife was not lawful, and the Baptist was of the same opinion. The legates answered quietly that the cause had not been committed to Fisher, and it was not for him to pronounce judicially upon it. Wolsey complained that the bishop had given him no notice of his intended interference, they continued to examine witnesses as if nothing had happened. But Fisher's action was not without effect. He was much respected. The public was divided on the merits of the general question. Many still thought the meaning of it to be merely that the king was tired of an old wife and wanted a young one. Courage is infectious, and comment grew loud and unfavourable. The popular voice might have been disregarded, but Campeggio who had perhaps really wavered, not knowing what Clement wished him to do, gathered heart from Fisher's demonstration. We are hurried on, he wrote to Salviati on the 13th of July, always faster than a trot, so that some expect a sentence in ten days. I will not fail in my duty or office, nor rashly or willingly give offence to anyone. When giving sentence, I will have only God before my eyes and the honour of the Holy See. A week later, Dubillet, said that things were almost as the king wished, and the end was expected immediately, when Campeggio acted on the Pope's last verbal instructions at their parting at Rome. He was told to go on to the last, but must pause at the final extremity. He obeyed. When nothing was left but to pronounce judgment, he refused to speak it, and said that he must refer back to the Holy See. Wolsey declined to act without him, and Campeggio, when pressed, if we can believe his own account of what he said, answered, Very well. I vote in favour of the marriage and the Queen. My colleague agrees, well and good. If not, there can be no sentence, for we must both agree. Wolsey's feelings must be conjectured, for he never revealed them. To the commissioners at Rome, he wrote, such discrepancies and contrariety of opinion have ensued here that the cause will be long delayed. In a week the process will have to cease, and two months of vacation ensue. Other counsels, therefore, are necessary, and it is important to act as if the advocation was granted. Campeggio unites with me to urge the Pope, if it must be granted, to qualify the language. For if the King be cited to appear in person or by proxy and his prerogative be interfered with, none of his subjects will tolerate it. Or, if he appears in Italy, it will be at the head of a formidable army. A citation of the king to Rome on threat of excommunication is no more tolerable than the whole loss of the king's dignity. If, therefore, the Pope has granted any such advocation, it must be revoked. If it arrives here before such a revocation, no mention of it shall be made, not even to the king. This was Wolsey's last effort. Before his dispatch could reach Rome, the resolution was taken. Had it arrived in time, it would have made no difference while Maisa Mai was able to threaten to behead cardinals in their own apartments. The cause was advoked, as it was called, reserved to be heard in the rota. The legate's commission was cancelled, 
The court of Blackfriars was dissolved, as Campeggio said, in anger, shame, and disappointment. He had fulfilled his orders, not without some alarm for himself, as he thought of his bishopric at Salisbury. And Catherine, springing from despondency into triumph, imagined that all was over. The suit, she thought, would be instantly recommenced at Rome, and the Pope would give judgment in her favour without further form. She was to learn a harsher lesson, and would have consulted better for her happiness if she had yielded to the Pope's advice and retired into seclusion. While the legates were sitting in London, another conference was being held at Cambrai, to arrange conditions of European peace. France and the Empire adjusted their quarrels for another interval. The Pope and the Italian princes were included, England was included also, and the divorce, the point of central discord between Henry and the Emperor, was passed over in silence as too dangerous to be touched. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Freud This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle Chapter 7 On the collapse of the commission, it was at once announced that the king would summon a parliament. For many years Wolsey had governed England as he pleased. The king was now to take the reins in his own hands. The long-suffering laity were to make their voices heard, and the great cardinal understood too well that he was to be called to account for his stewardship. The queen, who could think of nothing but her own wrongs, concedes that the object must be some fresh violence to herself. She had requested the Pope to issue a military brief, forbidding Parliament to meddle with her. She had mistaken the purpose of its meeting, and she had mistaken the king's character. Important as the divorce question might be, a great nation had other things to think of which had waited too long. It had originated in an ambitious scheme of Wolsey to alter the balance of power in Europe, and to form a new combination which the English generally disliked. Had his policy been successful, he would have been continued in office, with various consequences which might or might not have been of advantage to the country. But he had failed miserably. He had drawn the king into a quarrel with his hereditary ally, he had entangled him by ungrounded assurances in a network of embarrassments, which had been made worse by the premature and indecent advancement of the Queen's intended successor. For this, the Cardinal was not responsible. It was the King's own doing, and he had bitterly to pay for it. But Wolsey had misled his master into believing that there would be no difficulty. For the last critical moment, he had not stood by him as the King had a right to expect, and in the result... Henry found himself summoned to appear as a party before the Pope, the Pope himself being openly and confessedly a creature in the hands of the Emperor. No English sovereign had ever before been placed in a situation so degrading. The Parliament was to meet for other objects, objects which could not be attained while Wolsey was in power and were themselves of incalculable consequence. But Anne Boleyn was an embarrassment, and Henry did for the moment hesitate whether it might not be better to abandon her. He had no desire to break the unity of Christendom, or to disturb the peace of his own kingdom for the sake of a pretty woman. The Duke of Norfolk, though he was Anne's uncle, if he did not oppose her intended elevation, did nothing to encourage it. Her father, Lord Wiltshire, had been against it from the first. The peers and the people would be the sufferers from a disputed succession but they seemed willing to encounter the risk, or at least they showed no eagerness for the king's marriage with this particular person. If Reginald Pole was to be believed, the king did once inform the council that he would go no further with it. The emperor, to make retreat easy to him, had allowed nothing to be said on the subject at Cambrai, and had instructed the pope to hold his hand and make no further movement. He sent a new ambassador to England, on a mission of douceur et amitié. Ernest Chapuis, the minister whom he selected, was not perhaps the best selection which he could have made, and Lord Paget, who knew him well, has left an account of him not very favourable. For Chapuis, he said, I never took him for a wise man, but for one that used to speak cum summa licentia, whatsoever came in Bochum, without respect of honesty or truth, so it might serve his turn and of that fashion it is small mastery to be a wise man. He's a great practice, sir, 
with which honest term we cover tale-telling, lying, dissimulating, and flattering. Chapuy, being the authority for many of the scandals about Henry, this description of him by a competent observer may be borne in remembrance. But there can be no question that Charles sent him to England on an embassy of peace. Now, one diplomatist is not always perhaps the fairest judge of another of the same trade. The king's hesitation, if he ever did hesitate, was not of long duration. He had been treated like a child, tricked, played with, trifled with, and he was a dangerous person to deal with in so light a fashion. Chapuis reached London at the beginning of September. On landing, he found the citation to Rome had not been officially notified to the king, as a morsel too big for him to swallow. The king received him politely, invited him to dine in the palace, and allowed him afterwards to be introduced to Catherine, who was still residing at the court. Three days after, he had a long interview with Henry. His commission, he said, was to smooth all differences between the king and his master. And the king responded with equal graciousness, but turned the conversation upon those differences themselves. The emperor, he said, had not used him well. The advocation to Rome was absurd. He had written himself to the Pope with his own hand, telling it was not only expedient but absolutely necessary that the cause should be tried in England. The Roman territories were still in the occupation of the imperial troops. The Pope had committed it to two of his cardinals, had solemnly promised that it would not be revoked, and that he would confirm any sentence which the legates should pronounce. These engagements the Emperor had obliged the Pope to break. He himself had not proceeded upon light grounds. He was a conscientious prince, he said, who preferred his own salvation to all worldly advantages. This appears sufficiently from his conduct in the affair. Had he been differently situated and not attentive to his conscience, he might have adopted other measures, which he had not taken and never would take. Chapuis attempted to defend Clement. Enough of that, Pope, Henry sharply interrupted. This is not the first time that he has changed his mind. I have long known his versatile and fickle nature. The Pope, he went on, would never dare pronounce sentence unless it favoured the Emperor. Catherine was eagerly communicative. Chapuis learned from her that the king had offered that the case should be heard at Cambrai, which she had, of course, refused. She was much alarmed about the Parliament. The king, having played his cards so well that he would have a majority of votes in his favour, was quite certain that he meant to persevere. She professed outwardly that she was personally attached to the king, yet she desired Chapuis expressly to caution the emperor against believing that his conduct had anything to do with conscience. The idea of separation, she said, had originated entirely in his own iniquity and malice. And when the Treaty of Cambrai was completed, he had announced it to her with the words, My peace with the emperor is made. It will last as long as you choose. Chapuis had been charged to ascertain the feeling of the English people. He found them generally well affected to the Queen, but the Lutheran heresy was creeping in. The Duke of Suffolk had spoken bitterly of papal legates, and Chapuis believed if they had nothing to fear but the Pope's malediction, there were great numbers who would follow the Duke's advice and make Popes of the King and Bishops, or to have the divorce case tried in England. The Queen was afraid of pressing her appeal, fearing that if the Commons and Parliament heard that the King had been summoned to Rome, measures injurious to her might easily be proposed and carried. Even the Duke of Norfolk was not satisfactory. He professed to be devoted to the Emperor. He said he would willingly have lost a hand so that the divorce question should never have been raised. But it was an affair of theology and canon law, and he had not meddled with it. If the Emperor had remained neutral instead of interfering, it would have been sooner settled. But for the instant... The interests of the people of England were fixed on a subject more immediately close to them. The sins of the clergy had at last found them out. They pretended to be a supernatural order, to hold the keys of heaven and hell, to be persons too sacred for ordinary authority to touch. Their vices and their tyranny had made them and their fantastic assumptions no longer bearable, and all Europe was in revolt against the scandals of the church and churchmen. The ecclesiastical courts as the pretended guardians of morality, had the laity at their mercy, and every offence, real or imaginary, 
was converted into an occasion of extortion. The courts were themselves nests of corruption, while the lives and habits of the order which they represented made ridiculous their affectations of superiority to common men. Clement's conduct of the divorce case was only a supreme instance of the methods in which the clerical tribunals administered what they called justice. An authority equally oblivious of the common principles of right and wrong was extended over the private lives and language of every family in Catholic Christendom. In England, the cup was full, and the day of reckoning had arrived. I have related in the first volume of my history of the period the meeting of the Parliament of 1529, and I have printed there the petition of the commoners to the Crown with the bishop's reply to it. I need not repeat what has been written already. A few more words are needed, however, to explain the animosity which broke out against Wolsey. The great cardinal was the living embodiment of the detested ecclesiastical domination, and a representation in his own person of the worst abuses complained of. He had been a vigorous minister, full of large schemes and high ambitions. He had been conscious of much that was wrong. He had checked the eagerness of the bench of bishops to interfere with opinion, they had suppressed many of the most disorderly smaller monasteries, and had founded colleges out of their revenues. But he left his own life unreformed, as an example of avarice and pride. As legate, he had absorbed the control of the entire ecclesiastical organisation. He had trampled on the peers. On himself, he had piled benefice upon benefice. He held three great bishoprics, and in addition to them, the wealthiest of the abbeys. York or Durham he had never entered. Winchester he may have visited in intervals of business, and he resided occasionally at the manor of the moor, which belonged to St. Albans. But this was all his personal connection with offices to which duties were attached, which he would have admitted to be sacred, if perhaps with a smile. As legate and Lord Chancellor, he disposed of the whole patronage of the realm. Every priest or abbot who needed a license had to pay Wolsey for it. His officials were busy in every diocese. Every will that was to be proved, every marriage within the forbidden degrees, had to pass under their eyes, and from their courts, streams richer than Pacticlus, flowed into Wolsey's coffers. Foreign princes, as we have seen, were eager to pile pensions upon him. His wealth was known to be enormous. How enormous was now to be revealed. Even his own son, for a son he had, was charged upon the commonwealth. The worst iniquity of the times was the appointing children to the cure of souls. Wolsey's boy was educated at Paris, and held benefices worth 1,500 crowns a year, or 3,000 pounds of modern English money. A political mistake had now destroyed his credit. His enemies were encouraged to speak, and the storm burst upon him. A list of detailed complaints against him survives, which is curious alike from its contents, the time at which it was drawn up, and the person by whom it was composed. The old Lord Darcy of Templehurst, the leader afterwards in the Pilgrimage of Grace. Darcy was an earnest Catholic. He had fought in his youth under Ferdinand at the conquest of Granada. He was a dear friend of Ferdinand's daughter, and an earnest supporter against Wolsey of the Imperial Alliance. His paper is long, and the charges are thrown together without order. The date is the 1st of July, when the legate's court had begun its sittings. It was to end, as he might well suppose, in Catherine's ruin. They expressed the bitterness of Darcy's feelings. The briefest epitome is all that can be attempted of an indictment which extended over the whole of Wolsey's public career. It commences thus. Hereafter followeth, by protestation, articles against the Cardinal of York, showed by me, Thomas Darcy, only to discharge my oath and bounden duty to God and the King, and of no malice. 1. All articles that touches God and his church and his acts against the same. 2. All that touches the King's estate, honour and prerogative, and against his laws. 3. Lack of justice in using himself by his authority as Chancellor, faculties legatine and cardinal, what wrongs, exactions he hath used. 4. All his authorities, legatine and others, purchased of the Pope, and offices and grants that he hath of the King's grace, special commissions and instructions sent into every shire. 
he and the cardinal's servants to be straightly examined of his unlawful acts. Following vaguely this distribution, Darcy proceeds with his catalogue of wrongs. Half the list is of reforms commenced and unfinished, and everything disturbed and nothing set right, to the ruffling of the good order of the realm. Of direct offences, we find Wolsey unexpectedly accused of having broken the Premier statute by introducing faculties from Rome and allowing the Pope to levy money in the realm contrary to the King's prerogative royal, while for himself, by colour of his powers as Cardinal Legate a Latere and faculty spiritual and temporal, he had assembled marvellous and mighty sums of money. Of bishops, abbots, priors, deans, etc., he had received other sums, for promotion spiritual since his entry. He had appropriated the plate and jewels of the suppressed abbeys. He had raised the probate duty all over the realm, the duty going into his own coffers. He had laid importable charges on the nobles of the realm. He had towered, fleeted, and put to the walls of Calais a number of the noblemen of England, and many of them for light causes. He had promoted none but such as served about the king to bring to pass his purposes, or were of his counsel in such things as an honest man would not vouchsafe to be acquainted with. He had hanged, pressed, and banished more men, since he was an authority, than had suffered death by way of justice in all Christendom besides. He had wasted the king's treasure, etc. He had levied mighty sums of other houses of religion, some for dread to be pulled down, and others by his feigned visitations under colour of virtuous reformation. As Chancellor, he has taken up all the great matters depending in suit to determine after his discretion, and would suffer no way to take effect that had been devised by other men. In other times, the best prelate in the realm was contented with one bishopric. Darcy demanded that the duties of bishops should be looked into. They should hold no temporal offices, nor meddle with temporal affairs. They should seek no dispensation from the Pope. The tenure of land in England should be looked into, to find what temporal lands were in spiritual men's hands, by what titles, for what purposes, and whether it was followed or no. The King's grace should proceed to determine all reformations of spiritual and temporal within his realm. Never more legate nor cardinal should be in England. These legacies and faculties should be clearly annulled and made frustrate, and search and inquiry be made what had been levied thereby. He recommended that at once and without notice Wolsey's papers and accounts should be seized. Then matters much unknown would come forth, surely concerning his affairs with the Pope, Emperor, the French King, other princes, and within the realm. Many of Darcy's charges are really creditable to Wolsey. Many more are exaggerated but of the oppressive character of his courts and of the immense revenue which he drew from them, no denial was possible. The special interest in the composition, however, is that it expresses precisely the temper of the Parliament of 1529. It enables us to understand how the Chancellorship came to be accepted by Sir Thomas More. It contains the views of conservative Catholic English statesmen who, while they had no sympathy for changes of doctrine, were weary of ecclesiastical domination, who desired to restrict the rights of the Pope in England, within the limits fixed by the laws of the Plantagenets, to relieve the clergy of their temporal powers and employments, and to reduce them to their spiritual functions. Mysamai and Desoria had said the same thing. Charles V, likely enough, shared their opinion, though he could not see his way towards acting on it. In England it could be acted upon, and it was. There is no reason to repeat the well-known tale of the fall of Wolsey. He resigned the seals on the 18th of October, his property was seized and examined into, the Venetian ambassador reported that his ordinary income was found to have been 150,000 crowns, besides pensions, gifts from foreign princes, and irregular contributions from home. His personal effects were worth half a million more. He said that it had all been gathered for the king, the king was pleased to take it before his end. The king was welcome to it. The king was thenceforward his own first minister. The Duke of Norfolk became president of the council. Suffolk was vice president, and Sir Thomas More Lord Chancellor. But the king intended to rule with Parliament to advise and to help him. 
Catherine told Chapuis, in fear for herself, that the elections to the lower house had been influenced to her own injury. She was mistaken. For the elections had not turned on the divorce. The object of the meeting of the legislature was to reform the clergy, and upon this all parties among the laity were agreed. It may be, though the Queen could not know it, that exertions were made to counteract or control the local influences of individual nobles or prelates. If the object was to secure a real representation of popular feeling, it was right and necessary to protect the electors against the power of particular persons. But it is at least clear that this Parliament came up charged with the grievances of which Darcy's indictment was the epitome. The Houses met on the 3rd of November, and went at once to business. I can add nothing to what I have written elsewhere on the acts of the first session. Wolsey was impeached, the peers would have attainted him, or sent him to trial for high treason. The Commons were more moderate, listening to Cromwell, who faced unpopularity by defending gallantly his old patron. But the King himself did not wish the fallen Cardinal to be pressed too hard, and it is said that, determined to protect him, he forbade the attainder. He had determined to pardon him and an attainder would have made pardon more difficult. Very interesting accounts of Wolsey's own behaviour and his calamity are found in the letters of the foreign ambassadors. Du Bellay saw him on the 17th of October, the day before he surrendered the great seal, and found him entirely broken. He wept. He hoped the French king, Madame, would have pity on him. His face had lost its fire. He did not desire legateship, seal of office, or power. He was ready to give up everything, to his shirt, and live in a hermitage if the king would not keep him in his displeasure. He wished Francis to write to Henry in his favour. He had been the chief instrument of the present amity with France, and such a service ought not to have given a bad impression of him. Suspicions were abroad that he had received large presents from the French court. They were probably true, for he said, He hoped madam would not do him an injury if it was spoken of. Nothing could be more piteous. The poor old man was like a hunted animal, lately lord of the world, and now none so poor to do in reverence. Darcy had raised the question of the premier. The ancient statue of provisors had forbidden the introduction of bulls from Rome, and the statute was awake again. He was made to confess that the penalties of premier, confiscation of goods and imprisonment, had been incurred by him when he published the bull which made him legate and by the use of which he had unlawfully vexed the greater number of the prelates of the realm and the king's other subjects. His brother Legate, Campeggio, had remained for some weeks in London after the dissolution of the court. But England was no place for him in the hurly-burly which had broken loose. He went and had to submit to the indignity of having his luggage searched at Dover. The cause alleged was a fear that he might be taking with him some of Wolsey's jewels, Tradition said that he had obtained possession of the letters of the king to Anne Boleyn, and that it was through him that they reached the Vatican. At any rate, the locks were forced, the trunks inspected, and nothing of importance was found in them. Campeggio complained to the king of the violation of his privilege as ambassador. Henry told him ironically that he had suffered no wrong. His legateship was gone when the cause was revoked. He had no other commission. He was an English bishop and so far, therefore, an English subject. But a courteous apology was made for the unnecessary violence which had been used. Campeggio's ruffled plumes were smoothed, and he wrote to Salviati from Paris with the latest news of Wolsey, telling him that the king would not go to extremes, but would act considerately in the matter, as he was accustomed to do in all his actions. Although no mention was made in Parliament of the divorce, the subject, of course, could not sleep. The question of the succession to the crown having been made so prominent, it would, and must, sooner or later, come before the legislature to be settled, and had already become a topic of general consideration and anxiety. Mary's legitimacy had been impugned. Falieri, writing from London, reporting what he heard in society, said that, by English law, females were excluded from the throne. Custom might say so, for no female had, in fact, ever sat on the throne but enacted law or rule there was none. It was only one uncertainty the more. At any rate, Falieri said that the king had determined to go on with the divorce, that he might have a legitimate male heir. 
Henry's experience of Clement had taught him that he need not fear any further immediate steps. The advocation of the cause implied of itself a desire for longer delay, and with more patience than might have been looked for in such a disappointment, he had resolved to wait for what the Pope would do. That an English sovereign should plead before the Rota at Rome was, of course, preposterous. The suggestion of it was an insult, but other means might be found. He had himself proposed Cambrai as a neutral spot for a first commission. He really believed that the Pope was at heart on his side, and therefore did not wish to quarrel with him. When Campeggio was leaving England, the king wrote to Clement more politely than might have been expected. He did not insist that the English commission should be renewed. We could have wished, he said, and not less for your sake than our own, that all things had been so expedited as corresponded to our expectation, and not rashly conceived, but according to your promises. As it is, we have to regard with grief and wonder the incredible confusion which has arisen. If a Pope can relax divine laws at his pleasure, surely he has as much power over human laws. We have been so often deceived by your Holiness's promises that no dependence can be placed on them. Our dignity has not been consulted in the treatment which we have met with. If your holiness will keep the course no advoke to Rome in your own hands, until it can be decided by impartial judges, and in an indifferent place, in a manner satisfactory to our scruples, we will forget what has passed, and repay kindness by kindness. As the Pope had professed to be ignorant of the extent of his dispensing power, the king proposed to submit this part of the question to the canon lawyers of Europe, the nuncios, meanwhile, in Paris and London, advised that the Pope and the Emperor should write in a friendly way to the King. Charles was believed in England to have said that the King should stick to his wife in spite of his beard. He had not used such words, nor to disclaim them, but he might endeavour to persuade the King to let the divorce drop. The Parliament, meanwhile, had been fiercely busy in cutting down the church courts, abolishing or limiting the various forms of extortion by which the laity had been plundered. The clergy were required to reside upon their benefices. Pluralities were restricted. The business of the session had been a series of clergy discipline acts. The Bishop of Rochester especially clamoured over the want of faith which such acts exhibited. But nothing had been done of which the Pope could complain. Nothing of which perhaps he did not secretly approve. And Catherine, through her agents at Rome, demanded instant sentence in her cause. The Pope's inclination seemed again on Henry's side. He described an interview with the Emperor who had urged Catherine's case. He professed to have replied that he must be cautious when the case was not clear. Many things, he said, made for the King. All the divines were against the power of the Pope to dispense. Of the canon lawyers, some were against it, and those who were not against it considered that the dispensing powers could only be used for a very urgent cause as to prevent the ruin of a kingdom. The Pope's function was to judge whether such a cause had arisen, but no such inquiry was made when the dispensation of Julius was granted. The Emperor must not be surprised if he could do no more for the Queen. The Emperor himself thought of nothing less than taking his uncle by the beard. He wished to be reconciled to him if he could find a way to it. For one thing, he was in sore need of help against the Turks, and Chapuis was directed to ascertain if Henry would give him money. Henry's reply was not encouraging, and sounded ominously, as if his mind was making perilous progress on the great questions of the day. He said it would be a foolish thing for him to remit money to the Emperor, and help him to maintain three armies in Italy which ought to be elsewhere. He consulted his Parliament, and had found he could not grant it. The said money might be turned to other use and be employed to promote dissension among Christian princes. At a subsequent interview, the conversation was renewed and took a more general turn. The king spoke of the court of Rome, the ambitious magnificence of which, he said, had been the cause of so many wars, discords and heresies. But the Pope and cardinals, he said, observed the precepts of the gospel and attended to the example of the fathers of the church, several of whom the king mentioned to Chapuis' surprise, they would have led a different life and not have scandalised Christendom by their acts and manners. So far, Luther had told nothing but the truth, and had Luther limited himself to inveighing against the vices, abuses and errors of the clergy, instead of attacking the sacraments of the church, everyone would have gone with him. 
He would himself have written in his favour and taken pen in hand in his defence. Into the church in his own dominions, he hoped, little by little, to introduce reforms and end the scandal. These expressions were dangerous enough, but there was worse to follow. Henry maintained that the only power which churchmen had over laymen was absolution from sin. Chapuis found that he had told the Queen that he was now waiting for the opinions of the foreign doctors. When he obtained these, he would forward them to Rome, and should not the Pope, in conformity with the opinions so expressed, declare the marriage null and void, he would denounce the Pope as a heretic and marry whom he pleased. The Lady Anne, Chapuis said, was growing impatient, complaining that she was wasting her time and youth to no purpose. The House of Commons had already clipped the claws of the clergy. It was not impossible that, on the plea of the various and contradictory judgments on the matter, they and the people might consent to the divorce. The hope that the king might be held back by national disapproval was thus seen to be waning. The national pride had been touched by the citation of an English sovereign to plead before a foreign court. Charles V feared that the Pope, alarmed at the prospect of losing England, would commit some new folly, which might lead to war. The English nuncio, in fact, informed Chapuis, much to the latter's astonishment, the Pope had ordered him to find means to reconcile the King and the Emperor. Chapuis thought the story most unlikely. The Emperor would never have trusted the Pope with such a commission, nor was the Pope a promising mediator seeing that he was more hated in England than might have been supposed. There were evident signs now that the country meant to support the king. The Duke of Norfolk told the ambassador that unless the emperor would permit his master to divorce the queen and take another wife, there was no remedy left. The king's scruples of conscience, instead of abating, were on the increase, owing to the opinions of others who thought as he did, and no one in the world could turn him. Chapuis thought it was more likely than not that this question would be introduced at once into Parliament, where he had heard that a majority had been bribed or gained over to the king's side. With the consent of the commons, he would consider himself secure all round. Should the Pope pronounce in favour of the queen, the English would say that the sentence was unjust, for besides the suspicion and ill-will they had towards the Pope and other ecclesiastical judges, they would allege that in confirming the bull of Pope Julius, the Pope and the Cardinals would be only influenced by their own interest to increase the authority of the Pope and procure him money by such dispensations. At this moment, Chapuis feared some precipitate step on Henry's part. Norfolk, whom he saw frequently, had told him that there was nothing which the King would not grant the Emperor to obtain his consent, even to becoming his slave forever. The reform of the clergy was partly owing to the anger of the people at the advocation of the cause to Rome. Nearly all the people hated the priests, Chapuis said, an important testimony from an unwilling witness. Peers and commons might be brought to agree that popes could grant no dispensations and marriages or anything else, and so save their money. If there was nothing to restrain them but respect for the pope, they would not care much for him, and the Holy See would have no more obedience in England then in Germany. The Duke of Norfolk talked as menacingly as the rest. He said publicly to the ambassador that the Pope himself had been the first to perceive the invalidity of the marriage, had written to say that it could not stand, and would so declare himself or have it legally declared. And now, being in the Emperor's power, the same Pope would have the case tried and determined only as the Emperor wished. Under these circumstances, Chapuis could only advise that means should be taken to weaken or defer the action of Parliament. The Combray proposal might be revived, or a suggestion made that the cause should be argued before the Sorbonne at Paris. The Duke of Norfolk could perhaps be gained over, but unfortunately he and Queen Catherine were not on good terms. The Duke was afraid also, the words show how complicated were the threads which ruled the situation, that should the King dismiss the Lady Anne, the Cardinal would in all probability regain his influence, owing to his uncommon ability and the King's readiness to restore him to favour. And everyone perceived the King bore the Cardinal no real ill will, but should the King's affection for the Lady abate in the least, the Cardinal would soon find means of settling the divorce in a manner which would cost the opposite party their lives. 
In this letter of Chapuis is the first allusion which I have found to the Mary Boleyn scandal, then beginning to be heard of in circles opposed to the divorce. And people say, he wrote, that it is the king's evil destiny that impels them. For had he, as he asserts, only attended to the voice of conscience, there would have been still greater affinity to contend with in this intended marriage than in that of the queen his wife. The story is referred to as a fresh feature of the case, which had not before been heard of. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Frood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 8 The momentous year of 1529 wore out. Parliament rose before Christmas, peers and commons dispersed to their homes, and the chief parties in the drama were still undetermined what next to do. The Duke of Norfolk was afraid of Wolsey's return to power. It was less impossible than it seemed. A parliamentary impeachment, though let fall, ought to have been fatal. But none knew better than Wolsey by how transitory a link the parties who had combined for his ruin were really held together. Moore and Darcy had little sympathy with the advanced reformers, whose eyes were fixed on Germany. They agreed in cutting down the temporal encroachments of the clergy. They agreed in nothing besides. The king had treated Wolsey with exceptional forbearance. He had left him the Archbishopric of York, with an income equal in modern money to eight or ten thousand pounds a year, and had made him large presents besides of money, furniture and jewels. Finding himself so leniently dealt with, the cardinal recovered heart, and believed evidently that his day was not over. In the letter to Gardiner, written in January 1530, he complained as a hardship of having been made to surrender Winchester and St. Albans. He had not deserved to lose them, he said, and had not expected to lose them on his submission. His long services deserved at least a pension. The king agreed, or seemed to agree, for a further grant of three thousand crowns was allowed him, charged on the sea of Winchester. Anne Boleyn was furious. The Duke of Norfolk swore that sooner than suffer Wolsey's return to office he would eat him up alive. Though he had never seen his diocese, the cardinal was making no haste to go thither. He lingered on at Esher, expecting to be sent for, and it is evident from the alarm of his arrivals that there was a real likelihood of it. The Lady Anne so hated him that she quarrelled with her uncle Norfolk for not having pressed his attainder. And Catherine liked him equally ill, for she regarded him as the cause of her sufferings. He had been disevangelized, as Norfolk called it, but Henry missed at every turn his dexterity and readiness of hand. He had monopolized the whole business of the realm. The subordinate officials everywhere were his creatures, and the threads of every branch of administration had centred in his cabinet. Without him, there was universal confusion. The French court was strongly in his favour. He had himself made the Anglo-French alliance, and the Anglo-French alliance was still a necessity to Henry if he meant to defy the emperor and retain an influence at Rome. The king wished, if he could, to keep on terms with the Pope, and Wolsey, if anyone, could keep the papal court within limits of moderation. The situation was thus more critical than ever. Catherine knew not what to look for. Those among the peers who, like Norfolk, would naturally have been her friends and would have preferred that the divorce should never have been spoken of, yet saw no reason why, on a private ground, the emperor should light up a European war again. They conceived that by protesting he had done enough for his honour and that he ought to advise his aunt to give way. According to Chapuis, attempts were privately made to obtain a declaration of opinion from the House of Commons before Parliament rose. He says that the attempts were unsuccessful. It may have been so. But Chapuis could not hope that the unwillingness would last. Charles was determined to stand by Catherine to all extremities. Henry was threatening to marry his mistress whether the Pope consented or not, professing to care not a straw and almost calling the Pope a heretic. The Pope did not wish to be a party to a scandal, but would also be sorry to see the King lose all submission and reverence to the See of Rome. For himself, 
The emperor said he could not see how the affair would end, but he was certain that Henry would persist, and war would probably come of it. He directed his brother Ferdinand to avoid irritating the German Lutherans, as France might probably take part with England. Fresh efforts were made to persuade Catherine to take the veil. They were as unsuccessful as before. The emperor was now in Italy. He had gone to Bologna for his coronation on the conclusion of the Peace of Combray, and the Pope was to be made to feel the weight of his imperial presence. Henry used the occasion to send a deputation to Bologna, composed of the Earl of Wiltshire, Anne's father, who was personally known to Charles, Dr. Cranmer, then coming into prominence, and Stokesley, the Bishop of London, who, having been first on Catherine's side, had been converted. They were directed to lay before the Emperor the motives for the King's action, to protest against his interference, and to explain the certain consequences if he persisted in supporting the Queen. The Emperor gave a cold answer, and declined to hear the Earl's instructions. While the Pope, the Earl said, was led by the Emperor and dared not displease him. The second act of the drama was now to open and Clement was made to strike the first blow. In consequence of the reports from Catherine and Chapuy that Henry was collecting the opinions of the canonists of Europe and intended to act on them if favourable, a brief was issued on the 7th of March ordering the king to restore Catherine to her rights and prohibiting him from making a second marriage while the suit was undetermined. The divines and lawyers of Catholic Europe were at the same time threatened with excommunication if they presumed to declare themselves favourable to the divorce. Though the voice was Clement's, the hand was the Emperor's. Clement was being dragged along against his will, and was still facing both ways in honest or dishonest irresolution. While issuing the brief under compulsion, he said precisely the opposite in his communication with the French ambassador, the Bishop of Darb. The ambassador was able to assure his own master that the Pope would never give sentence in Catherine's favour. In direct contradiction of the brief, the bishop wrote that the Pope had told him more than three times in secret he would be glad if the marriage between Henry and Anne was already made, either by dispensation of the English legate or otherwise, provided it was not by his authority or in diminution of his powers of dispensation and limitation of divine law. In England, the Pope still had his own nuncio. A nuncio who, as Chapuy declared, was heart and soul with the king. He was the brother of Sir Gregory Casalis, Henry's agent at Rome, and Henry was said to have promised him a bishopric as soon as his cause should be won. The Pope could not have been ignorant of the disposition of his own minister. Chapuy reported a mysterious state secret which had reached him through Catherine's physician. The small Chaldic League was about to be formed among the Protestant princes of Germany. Francis was inviting the king to support them, and to join with himself in encouraging them to dethrone the emperor. The king was said to have agreed on the ground that the pope and the emperor had behaved ill to him, and the probability was that both France and England, in the end, would become Lutheran. Had there been nothing else, the queen's sterility was held as sufficient ground for the divorce. If she had been barren from the first, the marriage would be held invalid at once. Now that the hope of succession was gone, the Pope, it said, ought to have ended it. The King had been busy all the winter carrying out his project of collecting the opinions of the learned. The Pope's prohibition not having been issued in England, his own bishops, the universities, and the canonists had declared themselves in favour of the divorce. The assent had not, in all instances, been given very willingly. Oxford and Cambridge had attempted a feeble resistance, and at Oxford the commissioners had been pelted with stones. Still, given it had been, and the conservative peers and gentry were coming to the same conclusion. The king was known to be wishing to recall Wolsey. The return of Wolsey to power might imply the acceptance of the French policy, perhaps the alliance with the Lutherans, at any rate, war with the Emperor. The Duke of Norfolk and his friends were English aristocrats, adherents of the old traditions, dreading and despising German revolutionists. But they believed that the King and the Emperor could only be drawn together by Charles's consent to the divorce. 
The king, Norfolk said to Chapuis, was so much bent on it that no one but God could turn him. He believed it imperative for the welfare of the realm that his master should marry again and have male succession. He would give all that he possessed for an hour's interview with the emperor. If his majesty would but consent to the marriage, the friendship between him and the king would then be indissoluble. The divorce was nothing by the side of the larger interests at issue. The king, it was rumoured, had written, or was about to write, to the Archbishop of Canterbury, that if the Pope persisted in refusing justice, his own and all church authority would be at an end in England. The nobles and the people, provoked and hurt at the advocation of the suit to Rome, were daily more and more incensed against churchmen, and would become Lutherans in the end. The Pope had confessed that the presence of the imperial army in Italy left him no liberty. If revolution came, the Emperor would be the cause of it. The Duke spoke with the indignation of an Englishman at rumour that the Emperor had threatened to use all his power and the Queen's support. Such menaces, he said, were useless, and the nation would not endure them. Foreign princes had no authority over English kings. Chapuis did not mend matters by saying that the Emperor was not thinking of employing force, for he did not believe that the king would give occasion for it. The emperor's interference, indeed, would be unnecessary, for the duke must be aware that if the divorce was proceeded with, there would be a civil war in England. Chapuis was vain of his insight into things and characters. Like so many of his successors, he mistook the opinion of a passionate clique of priests and priest-ridden malcontents for the general sentiment of the nation. They told him, as they told other Spanish ambassadors after him, that all the world thought as they did. Fanatics always think so, and the belief that they were right proved in the end the ruin of the Spanish Empire. In the present instance, however, Chapuis may be pardoned for his error. Norfolk imagined that Wolsey was scheming for a return to power on the old anti-imperial lines. Wolsey was following a more dangerous line of his own. Impatient with the delay in his restoration, he imagined that by embroiling matters more fatally, he could make his own help indispensable, and he was drifting into what can only be called treachery. Treachery specially dishonourable to him. Wolsey, the originator of the divorce and the French alliance, had now become the friend of Catherine and the secret adviser of Chapuis. He had welcomed had perhaps advised, the issue of the prohibitory papal brief. Copies of it were sent for from Flanders to be shown in England. The Queen, wrote Chapuis on the 10th of May, is now firmer than ever, and believes the King will not dare make the other marriage. If he does, which may God prevent, I suspect he will repent and be thankful to return to his first marriage, if by so doing he could be freed from his second. This is the opinion of Cardinal Wolsey and of many others. The Cardinal would have given his archbishopric that this had been done two years ago. He would have been better revenged on the intrigue which has ruined him. These words, taken by themselves, proved that Wolsey was now in the confidence of Catherine's friends, but would not justify further inference. Another letter which follows leaves no room for doubt. On the 15th of June, Chapuis writes again, I have had a letter from the Cardinal's physician, which he tells me that his master, not knowing exactly the state of the Queen's affairs, cannot give any special advice upon them, but with fuller information would counsel and direct as if he was to gain paradise by it, as on her depended his happiness, honour, and peace of mind. As things stood, he thought that the Pope should proceed to the weightier censures, and should call in the secular arm, there was want of nerve in the way in which things were handled. The calling in the secular arm meant invasion and open war. To advise it was treasonable in any English subject. There may be circumstances under which treason of such a kind might be morally defended. No defence, moral or political, can be made for Wolsey. And it was the more discreditable, because at this time he was professing the utmost devotion to his king, and endeavouring to secure his confidence. Three different petitions Norfolk discovered him to have sent in, desiring as much authority as ever he had. 
Norfolk no doubt watched him, and may have learnt enough to suspect what he was doing. The whispers and messages through the intriguing physician had not gone unobserved. The king persisted in his generous confidence, and could not be persuaded that his old friend could be really treacherous, but he consented to send him down to his diocese. Wolsey went, still affecting his old magnificence, with a train of six hundred knights and gentlemen. But he never reached his cathedral city. Chapuy heard to his alarm that the physician was arrested and was in the tower. He congratulated himself that, were all revealed which had passed between him and Wolsey, nothing could be discovered which would compromise his own safety. But it was true that Wolsey's physician had betrayed his master, revealing secrets which he had bound himself never to tell. He confessed, so Chapuy learnt, that the cardinal had advised the Pope to excommunicate the king if he did not send away the lady from the court, hoping thus to raise the country and obtain the management. Too evidently, the cardinal had been intriguing, and not honourably, merely for his own purposes. He might have persuaded himself that the divorce would be injurious to the country, but after the part which he had played, it was not for him to advise the Pope to strike at his master, whom he had himself tempted to go so deep with it. The king was convinced at last. Orders were sent down to arrest him and bring him back to London. He knew that all was now over with him, and that he would not be again forgiven. He refused to take food, and died on his way at Leicester Abbey on St Andrew's Day. He was buried, it was observed, in the same church where the body lay of Richard III. One report said that he had starved himself, another that he had taken poison. Chapuy says that he died like a good Christian, protesting that he had done nothing against the king. His designs had failed, whatever they might have been, and he ended his great career struggling ineffectually to conjure back into the vase the spirit which he had himself let loose. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 9 The question whether the Pope had power to license marriages within the forbidden degrees affected interests immeasurably wider than the domestic difficulties of Henry the Eighth. Innumerable connections had been contracted in reliance upon papal dispensations the issue of which would be illegitimate if the authority was declared to be insufficient. The emperor himself was immediately and personally concerned. Emmanuel of Portugal had been three times married. His first wife was Isabel, daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, Catherine's sister, and Charles's aunt. His second wife was her sister Maria. His third, Charles's sister Eleanor. Charles's own empress was the child of the second of these marriages and they had all been contracted under dispensations from Rome. A sudden change of the law, or the recognition in a single instance that the Pope's authority in such matters might be challenged, would create universal disturbance. And it was not for Catherine's sake alone that the Emperor had so peremptorily resisted Henry's demand. The difficulty would have been evaded had Catherine agreed to take the vows, and Henry himself, when Catherine refused, had been so far conscious of the objection that he had hitherto based his demand on the irregularity of the original bull of Pope Julius. Clement had said often that a way could be found if Charles would consent, but Charles had not consented. In England, the marriage having been once challenged, a decision of some kind was necessary to avoid a disputed succession, and larger issues had now to be raised. The Emperor, having dismissed the English embassy at Bologna with scant courtesy, the Pope, as we have seen, had fallen back secretly on his old wish that Henry would take the matter into his own hands, disregard the inhibition, and marry as he pleased, without throwing the responsibility on himself. Henry, however, after the assurances which the Pope had given him, was determined that he should not escape in this way. He had gained or extorted a favourable opinion from his own learned corporations. Francis had assisted him to a similar opinion from the University of Paris. Confident in these authorities, the great body of English peers, spiritual and temporal, now presented a formal demand to Clement 
that the king's petition should be conceded. It intimated that if it was again refused, they must seek a remedy for themselves. Wolsey himself signed, for the petition was drawn in the summer before his death. Archbishop Warham signed, followed by bishops, abbots, dukes, earls, and barons. Some doubtless had to strain their consciences, but the act as a whole must be taken as their own. The king, unless he was supported by the people, had no means of forcing them or of punishing them if they refused. Norfolk still laboured desperately to work upon Chapuy. He told him, before the address was dispatched, that, as there seemed no other way of bringing the business to an end, he would sacrifice the greater part of what he owned in the world if God would be pleased to take to himself the queen and his niece also, for the king would never enjoy peace of mind till he had made another marriage, for the relief of his conscience and the tranquillity of the realm, which could only be secured by male posterity to succeed to the crown. The king, Norfolk said, could not plead at Rome, which was garrisoned by a Spanish army, and the Pope would do the Emperor's bidding if it was to dance in the streets in a clown's coat. The Queen objected to a trial in England, but could not a neutral place be found with impartial judges? Might not the Cardinal of Liège be trusted, and the Bishop of Tarbes? The blunt and honest Norfolk was an indifferent successor to the dexterous Cardinal. To wish that Catherine and Anne Boleyn were both dead was a natural but not a valuable aspiration. A neutral place of trial was no doubt desirable, and the Cardinal of Liège might be admissible, but de Tarbes would not do at all. He had been one of the first, Chapuis remarked, to put the fancy in the king's head. At Rome the diplomatic fencing continued, the Pope secretly longing to commit some folly and to come to terms with Henry while the imperial agents kept their claws fixed upon him. In October, Mai reported that Henry's representatives were insisting that Clement should dissolve the marriage of that legal process, on the ground that the kingdom must have an heir, because the king protested that he was living in mortal sin. If this could not be done, the Pope should at least promise that if the king married he should not be proceeded against. The Pope seemed too much inclined to listen, but with Mai at his shoulder, he could not afford to be valiant. He was made to answer that he had done his best, but he could not reject the Queen's appeal. The King had not named a proctor to appear for him, and therefore delay had been unavoidable. The threat of the peers in their address, that unless the divorce was granted they would seek a remedy elsewhere, was unworthy of them, and could not have been sanctioned by the King. He had always wished to comply with the King's requests when it could be done with justice. True to his policy of doing nothing and trusting to time, Clement hoped to tire Henry out by smooth words and hopes indirectly conveyed. But he was slowly swept on by the tide, and when forced to act at all, had to act at Mai's dictation. The nuncio in England had been too openly on Henry's side. A change was necessary. John Casalis was recalled. The Baron de Burgo was sent to succeed him, who was expected to be a sterner material. Chapuy had ascertained from two legal friends in the House of Commons that, when the next session opened, the divorce would be brought before Parliament, and that Parliament would stand by the King. Also that Monsieur du Billet had come from Paris with promises from Francis to settle matters with the Pope afterwards, if the King cut the knot and married. Unless the Emperor gave way, of which there was no hope, or unless the Pope dared the Emperor's displeasure, to which Clement was as disinclined as ever, a breach with the papacy seemed now unavoidable. His Holiness still hoped, however, that there might be a third alternative. The new nuncio reached England in the middle of September. He reported briefly that at his first interview the King told him that unless the cause was committed to the Archbishop of Canterbury and the English bishops, he would act for himself since he knew that the Pope had promised the Emperor to declare for the Queen. Chapuy supplied the Emperor with fuller particulars of the interview. The nuncio had declared to the King that, in view of the injury likely to ensure to the authority of the Church, His Holiness would rather die or resign the papacy than that the cause should not be settled to the mutual satisfaction of those concerned in it. The King, instead of replying graciously as the nuncio expected, had broken into violent abuse of the Pope himself and the whole Roman court. 
The church, Henry had said, required a thorough reformation, and the church should have it. The Pope alone was to blame for the difficulty in which he found himself. He had sent him a brief from Orvieto, admitting the divorce to be a necessity, and now he had promised the Emperor, as he knew from good authority, that judgment should be given for the Queen. He would not endure such treatment. He would never consent that the cause should be decided at Rome, or in any place where either Pope or Emperor had jurisdiction. It was an ancient privilege of England that no cause having its origin in that kingdom should be advoked to another. If the Pope would not do him justice, he would appeal to his Parliament, which was about to assemble, and if the Emperor threatened him with war, he hoped to be able to defend himself. The nuncio had deprecated precipitate action. If the king would only do nothing, the Pope, he said, would pause also, till an amicable settlement could be arrived at. But the king would promise nothing. He would act as seemed best to himself. Henry, being thus peremptory, Chapuis and the nuncio had to consider what was to be done. The Pope, before the nuncio's dispatch, had received private advices from Wolsey, of which the Baron de Burgo had been informed. The evil, Wolsey had admitted, was too far gone for gentle treatment, it needed cautery and incision, but they must proceed cautiously. If the Pope used threats, the King would go at once to Parliament. There would then be war in which France would take a part. Might not a personal interview be brought about between the King and the Emperor? The Nuncio could not see his way, but was willing to be guided by Chapuis. Chapuis was for instant action on the Pope's part. Moderation, he said, was useless. He believed, of course Wolsey had told him so, that if the Pope would deliver sentence at Rome immediately, the King would find no one in the realm or out of it to help him in a quarrel against the Church. Responsibility ought not to be thrown upon the Emperor. The Pope must speak, and all good Catholics would be at his side. The Nuncio agreed. The clergy in England were irritated and alarmed, and the opportunity was favourable. The nuncio and the ambassadors decided between them that the Pope was to be advised to end the cause at once, threaten the King with excommunication, and let a copy of the brief be in England before Parliament opened. Chapuis, well as he thought that he understood England, had something to learn about it which was to be a disagreeable surprise. He had imagined that the Pope's authority, when boldly asserted there, had never been successfully resisted. Tradition remembered Anselm and Beckett had forgotten the legislation of the Edwards and of Richard II. According to Chapuis, the Pope was to issue a brief forbidding Parliament to meddle in the divorce case. There were laws on the statute book which forbade the interference of the Pope under any circumstances in the internal affairs of the English realm. Should the Pope, by bull or brief, by presentation to officers of the Church or by delegation of his authority, attempt to exercise direct jurisdiction in England to the prejudice of the rights of the Crown, all persons who introduced such bulls or briefs, who recognised the Pope's pretensions or acted on his orders, fell under premonir. A vague but terrible consequence, almost as fatal as a proved charge of treason. The statutes had been long obsolete. The sword was in its scabbard. Wolsey had forgotten their existence when he sought and accepted the position of legate of the Holy See. Henry had forgotten them when he applied for a legatine commission to try his cause in London. The clergy would claim to be independent of the state, to be an imperium in imperio, with the Pope at their head. The officials who had made the name of a church court execrated in every county in England, all had forgotten them. But the acts themselves were unrepealed, and survived as a monument of the spirit of a past generation. Doubtless it was known that the Pope was being urged to violence. Doubtless it was known that large numbers of the clergy were prepared to stand by him in terror at the threatened reformation. The blow was to be parried by an appeal to the historical precedence of the realm. These impatient persons were to learn that, instead of joining an attack upon the king, they had of enough to do to purchase their pardons for their own offences. The well-tempered steel sprang to light again bright as ever, and while the nuncio was dreaming of excommunication and interdict, he learnt to his astonishment that the subject coming before Parliament was not the divorce of the Queen, 
but the position of the whole spirituality of the realm. By recognising Wolsey's legate from the Holy See, the entire clergy were found to be under prima near. On the divorce, perhaps, or on excommunication arising out of it, there might still have been a difference of opinion in Parliament, but the papal authority was now to be argued there on the lines of the past development of English liberty. Notice of what was coming was given at the beginning of October by a proclamation warning all persons of the illegality of introducing briefs from Rome. The nuncio rushed to the council chamber. He saw the dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk. He asked passionately what was meant. What was the Pope accused of? What English privileges had he violated? Why had he not been warned beforehand? The two dukes answered that they cared nothing for Pope or Popes in England, not even if St. Peter himself came to life again. The king was emperor and pope in his own dominions. The pope was alienating the English people, and if he wished to recover their affection, he must deserve it by attending to their petitions. The nuncio assumed a bold face, and told them they would find themselves mistaken if they thought they could intimidate the Holy See. He applied to the king. Henry told him that nothing had been published to the pope's injury. He was merely using his prerogative to guard against opposition to the ordinances which he had made, or was about to make, for the reformation of the clergy. He had gone promptly to work, lest the Pope should issue an inhibition. The nuncio knew not what to make of it. Queen Catherine was greatly disturbed. She feared the edict was a proof that the King was not afraid of the Pope after all. On the whole, the nuncio considered that an attempt was being made to frighten him, and he sent off fresh letters advising the Pope to proceed at once to pass sentence. Henry was, in fact, checkmating them all. With the help of the revived statute of provisors, he was able to raise the whole question of the Pope's authority in England without fresh legislation on present points of difference. Parliament, which was to have met in October, was prorogued until January to mature the intended measures. The king went to Hampton Court. He sent for the nuncio to come to him. He told him that by the citation to Rome the Pope had violated the privileges of sovereign princes and had broken the promise which he had given him in writing at Orvieto. If the Pope showed no more consideration for him, he would have to show that the Pope's pretension to authority was a usurpation and very serious consequences would then follow. The king, the nuncio said, spoke with much show of regret and with tears in his eyes. He added that the present parliament had been called at the request of the nation for the restraint of the clergy. They were so hated throughout the realm, both by nobles and people, that, but for his protection, they would be utterly destroyed. He should wait to take action till February, to see whether the Pope would meanwhile change his conduct towards him. Norfolk, to whom the nuncio went next, gave him no comfort. He said that, though Queen Catherine was a good woman, her coming to England had been the curse of the country. God had shown his displeasure at the marriage by denying the king a male heir. If the king should die without a son, old feuds would be reopened, and the realm would be plunged into misery. It was not tolerable that the vital interests of England should be sacrificed to the emperor. He advised the nuncio to use his influence to the pope, King's severity might then perhaps be modified. One more direct appeal was made by Henry himself to Clement. Finding his just demands neglected, the requests of the King of France unattended to, and the address of his nobles despised and derided, he perceived, he said, that the Pope was wholly devoted to the Emperor's will and ordained, prorogued, and altered to serve the times. He required the Pope, therefore, to set down in writing his grounds for rejecting his suit. He demanded once more that the cause should be heard in England before indifferent judges. The laws of the realm would not suffer the contrary. He abhorred contention, but would not brook denial. Queen Catherine was in despair. The hearing of the cause had again been postponed at Rome. A party in her favour had been formed in the House of Commons, but were at a loss what course to follow. If the Pope would give a decision, they would know what to do. But the delay of sentence seemed to imply that he was himself uncertain where the right really lay. 
They questioned Chapuy whether any directions had arrived from Rome in which to rest their opposition, hoping perhaps that an inhibitory brief had been issued. Opposition, they feared, would be useless without further action at the papal court. The Pope, Chapuy said, had been so dilatory and so dissembling that he was not in favour with either side. The change was passing over public feeling. Every day gave strength to the king's cause. Archbishop Warham, who had been hitherto for the queen, was beginning to waver, and even to think that he might try the suit in his own court. The queen, the nuncio, the bishop of Rochester, and the friends who remained staunch to her agreed unanimously that the boldest course would be the wisest. Immediate sentence at Rome in the queen's favour was the only remedy. Gentleness was thrown away. Let the king see that the Pope was really in earnest, and he would not venture to go further. Catherine herself wrote to Clement with the passion of a suffering woman. Delay, she said, would be the chorus of a new hell upon earth, the remedy for which would be worse than the worst that has ever yet been tried. She did not blame the king. The fault was with the wicked counsellors who misled him. Once delivered out of their hands, he would be as dutiful a son of the church as he had ever been. It is noticeable throughout that each of the two parties assumed that the Pope's judgment, when he gave it, must be on its own side. The king demanded a sentence in favour of the divorce. The queen and the emperor sentenced that the marriage was good. The Pope was to try the cause, but neither admitted that the right or the wrong was doubtful, or that the Pope must hear the arguments before he could decide. Doubtless they were justified in so regarding the Pope's tribunal. A trial would be undertaken, if a trial there was to be, with a foregone conclusion. But what kind of a court of justice could the rota be if it could be so spoken of and its master so addressed? Most idolatries pass through the same stage. The idol is whipped before he is finally discarded. The Holy Ghost is still invited to assist the cathedral chapters in the choice of a bishop, but must choose the person already named by the Prime Minister under pain of premonier. Men should choose their idols better. Reasonable beings are not fit objects of such treatment. Much is to be said in favour of stuffed straw or the graven image which the scourge itself cannot force to speak. Anne Boleyn was jubilant. She is braver than a lion, wrote Chapuis. She said to one of the Queen's ladies that she wished all the Spaniards in the world were in the sea. The lady told her such language was disrespectful to her mistress. She said she cared nothing for the Queen, would rather see her hang than acknowledge her as her mistress. Clement, goaded by Mysa May, issued at last a second brief, repeating the terms of the first, again forbidding the second marriage, and threatening parliaments, bishops, and divines in England if they dared to interfere. But between a brief and the execution of it was a long interval. Sentence on the original cause he would not pass, and in leaving his final decision doubtful, he left opinion free to the rest of the world. The brief was to be presented by the nuncio. The Pope accompanied it with a deprecatory and not undignified letter to Henry from himself. Chapuy feared that, by his loose talk, Clement was secretly encouraging the king. The brief might bring on a crisis. He did not relish the prospect of remaining in England and the boiling vortex likely to be opened, but as the Queen insisted that he should stay, he pressed unceasingly for excommunication and interdict. The Emperor then might make effectual war with the English. They would lose their trade with Spain and Flanders, and the disaffection to the King and Council would be greatly increased. On the spot, and surrounded by an atmosphere of passion, Chapuy was in favour of war. The Emperor, still unwilling to part with the hereditary friendship of England, was almost as reluctant as Clement. He had supposed that Henry was influenced by a passing infatuation, that by supporting Catherine he would please the greater part of the nation, and ultimately, perhaps, secure the gratitude of Henry himself. He had not allowed for the changes which were passing over the mind of the English people. He had not foreseen the gathering indignation of a proud race jealous of their liberties when they saw him dictating to the spiritual judge of Europe on a question which touched their own security. But he had gone too far to draw back. He found himself sustained, not only by Spanish opinion, but by the part of his subjects about whom he felt most uneasy. The Italian universities had, for the most part, gone with Paris, 
and declared against the dispensing power. In Germany, Henry had been disappointed. The King of England had been an old antagonist of Luther. Sir Thomas More, as Chancellor, had been enforcing the heresy laws against Luther's English proselytes with increased severity. Lutherans, in turn, declared decidedly against Henry's divorce. The emperor was their feudal sovereign, and they saw no reason for entering into a new quarrel with him on a cause which, so far as they understood, was none of their own. Henry was evidently alarmed. Chapuis reported that he was busy building ships, casting cannon, repairing fortresses, and replenishing the tower arsenal, as if conscious that he might have serious work before him. The emperor still clung to the belief that he would be afraid to persevere, and Chapuis himself began to think that the emperor might be more right than himself, that the storm might pass off. No sign, however, appeared of yielding. The new brief was known to have been issued, and to have been forwarded to the nuncio. Not contented with the warning already given by proclamation, Norfolk on the 13th of January sent for Chapuis to draw his attention once more to the law. The introduction of briefs from Rome, touching the honour and authority of the crown, was forbidden by Act of Parliament. It was understood that certain decretals had been procured by the Queen's friends, and were about to be published. The Duke desired the ambassador to know that if the Pope came in person to present such briefs, he would be torn to pieces by the people. It was not a new question. Popes had tried in past times to usurp authority in England. The king's predecessors had always resisted, and the present king would resist also. Kings were before popes. The king was master in his own dominions. If any such decretal came into the ambassador's hands, the duke warned him not to issue it. Imperialist officials were more accustomed to dictate to others than to submit to commands. Chapuis was brave, and when occasion required, could be haughty to insolence. He thanked the Duke for giving him the notice. He would not argue, he said, on the authority possessed by popes over disobedient kings and kingdoms. It was a notorious fact and full practice at that very time. His curiosity had not extended so far as the study of the English statute book. On such points he must refer the council to the nuncio. For himself he could only say he thought they would have done better if they had not given occasion for such briefs from the Pope. The Emperor would not consent to an unreasonable sentence against the King, for he regarded him as his ally and friend. But he could assure the Duke that if his master was to direct him to assist in the publication of any papal brief in England, he would unquestionably execute His Majesty's commands. As to the nation at large, he did not think they would resist the Pope's decretals. He thought, on the contrary, they would help their execution with all their power. Truth and justice must reign everywhere, even among thieves and in hell. The Church of Christ was never so unprovided with defenders as to be unable to carry the world with her, and the English would have no right to complain if the Emperor, having exhausted all means of conciliation, caused justice to take her cause. Such language could bear but one meaning. Chapuis perhaps intended to frighten Norfolk, the Duke was suspected to be less staunch in support of the King than he professed to be in council. The Duchess was a fiery partisan of Catherine, and a close intimate of the ambassador himself. He thought that he had produced an impression, but Norfolk answered at last that if the King could take another wife, he certainly would. The Pope had no business to interfere except in cases of heresy. To the nuncio, the Duke gave the same warning which he had given to the ambassador, drawing special attention to the pains and penalties to which disobedience would make him liable. The nuncio answered, like Chapuis, that at whatever cost he would obey the Pope's orders, and would die if necessary for his lord and master. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froder This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle. Chapter 10 A struggle was now inevitable between the King and the Pope, and the result of it would depend on the sentiments of the English nation. Chapuis and the Nuncio believed the majority of the people to be loyal attached to the See of Rome. To the Pope, as Pope, the King and Council were willing to submit. 
but a pope who was the vassal and mouthpiece of another secular sovereign, they believed the country would support them in refusing to acknowledge. Was Chapuis right, or was the king? The parliament, about to open, would decide. In the clergy of England, the pope had a ready-made army completely at his devotion. In asserting their independence of civil control, the clerical order had been conscious that they could not stand alone, and had attached themselves with special devotion to their spiritual sovereign at Rome. They might complain of annates and first fruits and other tributes which they were made to pay, but the Pope's support they knew to be essential to the maintenance of their professional privileges. In any contest which might arise, they were certain to be found on the side of the Holy See. The hero of the imagination of every English priest was Becket of Canterbury. In theory, he regarded the secular prince as ruling only by delegation from the supreme pontiff, and as liable, in case of contumacy, to be deposed. In case of quarrel between the clergy and the state, the enormous influence of the church was pledged to the order and to its chief at Rome. The spirituality were already exasperated by the clipping of their claws in the last section. From the Bishop of Rochester, who represented clerical opinion in its most accentuated form, from great ladies and from a party of the nobles to whom, as Catherine's friends, he mainly associated, Chapuis heard unanimous censures of the king's conduct. These persons told him that the whole nation agreed with them, and certainly the opposition of a body so powerful as the clergy was by itself formidable. Before it came to war, therefore, with the pontiff, the king had prepared his measures to disarm the pontiff's legionaries. To clip their claws was not enough. Their mouths had to be held with bit and bridle. Parliament, after repeated prorogations, was opened at last in January. Convocation, which was called simultaneously, was put formally in possession of a fact which had appeared on the first rumour of it incredible, that the whole body of the clergy lay under premonier for having recognised Cardinal Wolsey's legation and the papal bull by which it was instituted. It was an intimation that the old English laws were awake again. The clergy were subjects of the crown, not of the pope, and to impress the fact upon their minds they learnt that legally their property was forfeited, that they would obtain their pardon only on paying a fine of a hundred thousand pounds, and on distinctly acknowledging the king as the supreme head of the Church of England. Chapuis' correspondence explained the motives of the government in extorting the confession, and justified the arbitrary use which was made of the premonier. The Pope was being urged to excommunicate the king and declare him deposed. The clergy, through whom the Pope would act, were to be forced to admit that they were subjects of the crown and were bound to obey the laws of their country. It was in no idle vanity, no ambitious caprice, that Henry the Eighth demanded the title which has been so much debated. It was as a practical assertion of the unity and independence of the realm. England was to have but one sovereign supreme within her own limits, with whom no foreign prince, secular or spiritual, had a right to interfere, and an acknowledgment of their obligation was demanded in ample form from the order which looked elsewhere for its superior. The black regiments were to be compelled to swear allegiance to the proper sovereign. Clement's mind had always misgiven him that, if he pushed Henry too far, mischief would befall him. He had refused the last brief till it was extorted from him. As if Mai had not been pressing and vehement enough, Catherine had now at Rome a special representative of her own, Dr. Ortiz, a bitter Catholic theologian, with the qualities which belonged to that profession. Mai and Ortiz together listening to no excuse, drove the Pope on from day to day, demanding sentence with its inevitable consequence. The cardinals were alarmed. One of them told Mai that, in his opinion, the original dispensation really was void, that Julius had no faculty to dispense in such a case. The Pope suggested that the affair might be suspended for two years. It might then perhaps drop and be forgotten. He inquired whether, if the king consented to plead by proxy before him, the emperor would agree to any accommodation. 
should the case go on, it might last fifteen or twenty years. All the cardinals, said Mai. Nay, the Pope himself would like to put off the affair entirely to avoid trouble. The court of Rome had, in fact, discovered at last that matters were really serious, that Henry would not be played with, and that the quarrel must be peaceably settled. Mai and Ortiz were furious. They insisted on immediate action. Delay, they said, would be injurious to the Queen. Their orders were to urge the Pope to proceed and pass sentence whether the parties appeared or not. They hinted that very soon there would be no more trouble from England. They had been told, and they believed that, with the clergy on Catherine's side, a papal decree would end the whole business. Their confidence was shaken, and their activity rudely arrested by the news of the Premier and the demand for the submission of the English clergy. Too well the meaning of it was understood. En Chapuy and the nuncio it fell like a thunderbolt. They held an anxious consultation, and they agreed on the least wise measure that they could possibly have adopted. The nuncio, as representing the majesty of the Holy See, determined to go himself to convocation and exhort the bishops to uphold the church and resist the king in the House of Commons. He actually went and was much astonished at the reception which he met with. The right reverend body was so scandalized at his intrusion that they entreated him to withdraw without giving him time to declare his errand. They told him that, if he had anything to say, he must address himself to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was not then present. The nuncio had to withdraw precipitately. In his vexation he had not even the prudence to depart quietly, but insisted on thrusting on the Bishop of London the words which he had meant to speak. The bishops and clergy themselves were compelled to submit to the inevitable. The law under which they suffered had marked an epoch of successful resistance to papal usurpation. The revival of it was to mark another and a greater. They struggled long enough and violently enough to deprive their resistance of dignity, and then, swearing they would never consent, consented. They agreed to pay the hundred thousand pounds as the price of their pardon. They agreed, in accepting it, to acknowledge the king as the supreme head of the English church. And to ease their conscience, they were allowed to introduce as a qualifying phrase Quantum per legem Christi licet. But the law of Christ would avail them little for their special privileges. It would have to be interpreted by the rejection of another form which they had desired to substitute and were not allowed. For legem Christi, they had desired to read legem ecclesiae. The supposed claims of the church were precisely what they were compelled to disavow. It was done. The enchantment was gone from them. They had become as other men, shorn Samsons, and no longer dangerous. The Pope might say what he pleased. The clergy were now the king's servants and not the Pope's, and must either support the crown or become confessed traitors. Thus, when the brief arrived, the nuncio was allowed to present it. The king took it with a smile and passed it on to the Privy Council, talked to him good-humouredly of indifferent matters, and had never been more polite. In a light way, he told the nuncio that he knew of his attempt to persuade the bishops to agree to nothing to the Pope's prejudice, but his anxiety was unnecessary. No injury would be done to the Pope unless the Pope brought it upon himself. The King's graciousness was but too intelligible. To Catherine and Chapuy and all their friends, the meaning of it was that Henry had made himself Pope in England. The Queen foresaw her own fate as too sure to follow. She feared that since the King was not ashamed of doing such monstrous things, and there being no one who could or dared contradict him, he might, one of these days, undertake some further outrage against her own person. The blame of the defeat was thrown on the unfortunate Clement. The Pope's timidity and dissimulation, wrote Chapuy, had produced the effect which he had all along foretold. It had prejudiced the Queen's interests and his own authority. 
Her cause was making no progress. The Pope had promised Mai that if the King disobeyed his first brief and allowed Anne Boleyn to remain at court, he would excommunicate him. And now all that he had done had been to issue another conditional brief less strong than the first, and the lady was left defiant and with as much authority as ever. The Queen had begun to think that the Pope had no desire to settle the matter, and, as Norfolk observed to Chapuis, was glad that the princes should be at discord for fear they might combine to reform the clergy. If the Pope had directly ordered the King to separate from the Lady Anne, the King would never have claimed the supremacy which had caused such universal consternation. The Chancellor, Sir Thomas More, was so horrified at it, Chapuis said, that he would quit office as soon as possible. The Bishop of Rochester was sick with grief. He opposed as much as he could, but they threatened to fling him and his friends into the river, so that he had to yield at last and had taken to his bed in despair. The bishops, it was thought, would now do anything against the Queen which they were ordered, especially seeing how cold and indifferent the Pope seemed about her fate. The nuncio had questioned the King about the nature of his new papacy. The King told him that if the Pope showed him proper respect, he might retain his lawful authority, otherwise he knew what he would himself do. The last words were explained in another letter, in which Chapuis said that the Lady Anne was supporting the Lutherans. They had been treated to prison and stake while Moore had held the seals. On Moore's retirement, they were now to have an easier time of it. Between them and the king, there was the link of a common enemy in the Pope, and the king was showing a disposition to protect them. The revival of the Premier created embarrassments of many kinds. The Pope had officials of his own in England and Ireland, whom he appointed himself, and could not realise the extent of the change which he had brought on. It is amusing to find him in the midst of the storm peacefully soliciting Henry for help against the Turks, and the nuncio paying friendly visits to the palace. Henry told him that he had made a final appeal to Rome and was waiting to see the result. The Pope might excommunicate him if he pleased. He cared nothing for his excommunication. The Emperor might, no doubt, hurt him, but he was not sure that the Emperor desired to hurt him. Or if it came to that, he could defend himself in the realm. Norfolk was equally decided. They knew, he said, that the Queen and the Emperor were pressing the Pope for sentence, but it was time lost. If the Pope issued ten thousand excommunications, no notice would be taken of them. The Archbishop, and not the Pope, was the lawful judge in English causes. Chapuis expressed a hope that a day would come when the King would listen to his true friends again, etc., you will see before long, replied the Duke, that the Emperor will repent of not having consented to the divorce. In fact, the Emperor had begun to repent already. Or, if not to repent, yet to be perplexed with the addition which his action had brought upon him to his many burdens. The Premier and the successful establishment of the authority of the Crown over the clergy had startled all Europe. The King and Parliament, it had been universally supposed, would yield before a threat of excommunication. When it appeared that they were as careless of the Pope's curses as Luther and the Elector of Saxony, the affair wore another aspect. Even the imperialist cardinals in the consistory came round to the Pope's own view and wished to let the cause rest for two or three years. Mai feared that such a cause might lead to novedades, or revolution, but admitted that much might be said for it, especially considering the difficulties in Germany. He ceased to press the Pope for immediate sentence, and Dr. Ortiz, Catherine's passionate agent, complained that he found the Emperor's ambassador growing cold and less eager to support his own arguments. Catherine, seeing her clerical friends prostrated, could but renew her entreaties to her own relations. Her position was growing daily weaker, the nation, seeing the Pope confining himself to weak threats and unable or unwilling to declare her marriage valid, was rapidly concluding that on the main question the King was right, and that to throw the realm into a convulsion for an uncertainty was not tolerable. No appeal had as yet been made to Parliament, but the King of France, Catherine wrote to Charles, has asked the Pope to delay sentence. 
If this be allowed, the means now employed by these people to gain the consent of the nation to a second marriage are such that they will obtain what they desire and accomplish my ruin at the next session. If the delay be not already granted, I entreat your highness not to consent to it. Insist that the Pope shall give judgment before next October when Parliament will meet again. Forgive my importunity, I cannot rest till justice is done to me. For the love of heaven, let it be done before the time I name. I myself, if it must be so, shall go to Parliament and declare before its members the justice of my case. The harassed Pope was obstinately cautious, and occasionally even turned upon his persecutors. Mai now urged him to call a general council and settle all questions. The word council rang painfully in papal ears. Why did not the Emperor make war upon the Lutherans? he pettishly asked. Mai told him the Lutherans were rich and stubborn and strong, and it would be an endless work. Why not then, said Clement, begin with the Swiss, who were not so strong? Mai answered that it could not be. The heretics everywhere made common cause, and the emperor could not fight them all single-handed. The Pope sighed, and said he feared that there would be little help from France and England. In England, events moved steadily on, without hesitation, yet without precipitation. The bishops were not yet agreed on the divorce. At the close of the session, March 1531, Sir Thomas More read in the upper house the opinions which had been collected from the universities at home and abroad, and a debate ensued upon them. London and Lincoln were on the king's side. St. Asaph and Bath were of opinion that Parliament had no right to interfere. Norfolk cut the argument short by saying that the documents had been introduced merely to be read. There was no proposal before the House. More said briefly that the King knew what his opinion was and that he need not repeat it. The judgments were sent down to the House of Commons, where Chapuy persuaded himself that they were heard with more displeasure than approval. The session ended, and Parliament was prorogued to the following autumn. The Emperor himself wrote to More. The letter was forwarded through Chapuy, who wished to deliver it in person. More declined his visit and declined the letter. If it was placed in his hand, he said, he must communicate it to the king. Parliament having risen, there was again a breathing time. So far as the persons of the two ladies were concerned, who were the central figures in the quarrel, there was little difference of opinion in England. The Duke of Norfolk, who represented the feelings of the great body of the nation, thought that the interest of the succession made the divorce a necessity. The realm could not be left exposed to the risk of another civil war. He was jealous of the honour and liberties of the country, and ill liked to see a question which touched them so nearly left to the pleasure of the Emperor. But Norfolk as much admired Catherine as he disliked his niece, and there were probably few English statesmen who do not regret that a public cause should have been tainted by a love affair. All the leading men regretted that the King had fastened his choice upon a person neither liked nor respected. Anne's antecedents were unfavourable. Her elevation had turned her brain. She had made herself detested for her insolence and dreaded for her intrigues. And Catherine, on the other hand, was a princess of royal birth and stainless honour. The Duke observed to the Marquis of Exeter that it was a wonder to see her courage. Nothing seemed to frighten her. The devil and no other, he said, must have originated so wretched a business. The same view of the matter was growing at Rome and the Pope and among the cardinals. The Bishop of Tarp, who represented Francis at the papal court, warned Clement that the loss of England might be the loss of France also. If the King of England, he said, was driven to desperation, the miserable divorce suit would be the ruin of the world. Francis would and must stand by him if the Pope proceeded to excommunication. His impatience with his marriage might be unreasonable, but was no adequate ground for the convulsion of Catholic Christendom. Clement was at heart of the same opinion. The course which he wished to follow was to delay indefinitely. A formal suspension would not be needed. They had only to go on slowly. The king would then most likely marry, and the cause would drop. Andrea de Burgo, at Ferdinand's ambassador, said that the emperor was strong enough to settle the matter by himself. Not as strong as you think. Clement observed. Between the Turks and the Lutherans, the Emperor may have trouble enough of his own. The Pope's unwillingness was well understood in England. 
he made another faint effort to save Catherine. He ordered the nuncio to announce to Henry that the brief must be obeyed, or justice would have its cause. Believing that the message would be resented, the nuncio hesitated to deliver it, but encouraged by Chapuis, at last demanded audience and informed Henry, in the Pope's name, what he was to expect if he persisted. Henry shortly answered that the Pope was losing his time. He already knew what the nuncio had come to tell him, but once for all, he would never accept the Pope as his judge in an affair concerning himself and the English nation. The Pope may excommunicate me, he said. I care not a fig for his excommunication. Let him do as he wills at Rome. I will do here as I will. I take the Pope to be a worthy man on the whole, but ever since the last war he has been so afraid of the Emperor that he dares not act against his wishes. The most obvious resource was to adopt the suggestion already made that the case should be transferred to Combray, or to some other spot not open to objection, for it could be heard with impartiality. Clement himself was weary of the struggle, and eager to escape from it by any reasonable means. If Catherine would agree, Charles was unlikely to hesitate. But though weary and worn out with disappointments, she was a resolute woman, and as long as she persisted, the Emperor was determined not to desert her. With small hope of success, but as an experiment which it was thought desirable to try, a deputation of peers and bishops were commissioned to see Catherine, to ask her to withdraw her demand for an immediate sentence, and consent that the cause should be tried in a neutral place, while the Pope, through his legate in Spain, made a similar proposition to Charles. The Queen heard that they were coming, and prepared for them by causing several masses of the Holy Ghost to be said, that she might be enlightened how to answer. The delegates arrived shortly after the masses were completed. The two dukes, Lord Exeter, earls, barons, bishops and canon lawyers, thirty of them in all. Norfolk spoke for the rest. He said that the king had been treated with contempt and vituperation by the Pope on her account. He had been cited to appear personally at Rome, a measure never before enforced by any Pope against an English king. He could not go. He could not leave his kingdom nor could the dispute be settled by the Pope's insistence on it. A fitter place and fitter judges must be chosen by the mutual consent of the parties, or she would be the cause of trouble and scandal to them and their posterity. The Duke entreated her to consider the consequences of refusal, to remember the many good services which the King had rendered to her father and to the Emperor, and to allow the constitution of some other court before which the King could plead. In itself, the demand was reasonable. It was impossible for a king of England to plead before the Pope. In the power, as he was, of the Emperor, who was himself a party interested in the dispute. A neutral place might easily have been found. Neutral judges might be less easily procurable, but none could be less fit than His Holiness. The Queen, however, replied stoutly as ever that her cause should be judged by the Pope and no one else. Not that she expected any favour at his hands. So far the Pope had shown himself so partial to the King that more could not be asked of him. She, and not the King, had cause to complain of his holiness. But the Pope held the place and had the power of God upon earth, and was the image of eternal truth. To him, and only to him, she remitted her case. If trouble came, it would be the work of others, not of her. She allowed that in past times the king had assisted her relations. The emperor had not denied it, and was the king's true friend. With a scornful allusion to the supremum caput, she said, The king might be lord and master in temporal matters, but the pope was the true sovereign and vicar of God in matters spiritual of which matrimony was one. The Spanish legate had succeeded no better with Charles, who returned a peremptory refusal. But so little confidence had the Emperor in the true Sovereign and Vicar of God, he insisted not merely that the Pope should try the case, but should try it in his own presence, lest the Queen's interests should suffer injury. The request itself indicated a disposition on the Pope's part to evade his duty. Charles gave him to understand in language sufficiently peremptory that he intended that duty to be done. 
In this direction, there was no hope. Catherine had been even more emphatic with the deputation. After her reply to Norfolk, the bishops and lawyers took up the word. She always denied that she had been Prince Arthur's actual wife. She herself on all occasions courted the subject and was not afraid of indelicacy. The church doctors responded. They said she had slept with Prince Arthur and the presumptions were against her. She bade them go plead their presumptions at Rome, where they would have others than a woman to answer them. She was astonished, she said, to see so many great people gathered against a lone lady without friends or counsel. Among the great persons before her, she still had some staunch friends. Anne Boleyn was detested by them all, and those who, like Norfolk, wished her for her own sake to be less uncompromising, could not refuse to admire the gallant spirit of Isabella's daughter. But alas, the refusal to allow the cause to be heard in a free city before an impartial tribunal was equivalent to a consciousness that, unless by a court under the emperor's control, an unfavourable judgment was to be looked for. They could not, any one of them, allow their sovereign to plead where an imperial minister could threaten the lives of uncompliant cardinals. But, unless every knightly feeling had been dead in them, they could not have refused their sympathy. Had the Pope spoken plainly from the first, most of the peers would perhaps have stood by the lady before them with voice and sword. But the Pope had allowed that the King was in the right. He had drawn back only under compulsion even at that moment, was only prevented by fear from deciding on the king's side. Glad as they might have been, had the question never been raised, they could not submit their prince to the indignity of a condemnation by a coerced tribunal, a tribunal which was to be trusted to proceed only, as it now appeared, in the emperor's own presence. They carried the answer back to their master. I feared it would be so, he said, knowing as I do the heart and temper of the queen. We must now provide in some other way. Norfolk, who wished well to the Queen, regretted that she had taken a course was so little likely to profit her. The Emperor's action, he said, in causing the King to be cited to Rome was outrageous and unprecedented. The cause ought to be tried in England, and the Queen would be unwise in rejecting the advice of the peers. The Emperor, on reflection, considered his own first refusal to allow the cause to be transferred, to insist on the trial being conducted before himself, was really intolerable, and he drew a more moderate reply. But he still persisted that the Pope alone should hear the case, and decided in the Queen's favour. The affair, he said, was of such a nature as to admit of no solution, save the declaring that a marriage contracted with the authority and licence of the Holy See was valid and indissoluble, as the patron and defender of the apostolic see, he was more in duty bound than any other prince to remove and defend all such small offences and disputes. In fact, he still advanced a claim of sovereign jurisdiction which it was impossible for England to allow. And Catherine was well aware that the Pope had been a party to the request for the removal of her cause. Bitterly she railed at him. Charles sent her a copy of his own answer. It reassured her if she had doubted. If she saw that, let Clement struggle how he would, she could be confident that her nephew would compel him to decide for her. The Pope, she announced, was responsible for all that had happened by refusing to do her justice. This last move showed that he was as little disposed to apply the remedy as he had been. If the cause was removed from Rome, the judges, whoever they might be, would declare that black was white. Up to this time, Catherine had continued at the court with her own apartments, and with the Princess Mary as her companion. She had refused the only available means of a peaceful arrangement, and was standing out, avowedly resting on the Emperor's protection. She was not reticent. She spoke out freely of her wrongs and her expectations. To separate mother and daughter would have been a needless aggravation had the suit been between private individuals. But Mary was a public person with her own rights on the succession. It was found necessary to remove Catherine from London and to place the princess out of reach of her influence. Moorpark, which had been a country house of Wolsey's, was assigned for the Queen's residence, while Mary was sent to the palace at Richmond. 
Catherine was too proud to resist when resistance would be useless, but she said she would prefer the tower. The nuncio remonstrated. He advised the king to record her to the court and shot a hundred thousand tongues. The king replied, nearly in tears, that he had sent her away because she used such high words and was always threatening him with the emperor. Of Mary, Henry was personally fond. He met her one day in Richmond Park, spoke affectionately to her, and regretted that he saw her so seldom. She cannot be where the lady is, said Chapuis, because the lady has declared she will not have it nor hear of her. She would not even allow the king to speak to Mary without being watched on the occasion just mentioned. She sent two of her people to report what passed between them. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froder This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle Chapter 11 The unity of Christendom was not to be broken in pieces without an effort to preserve it. Charles V was attempting impossibilities in his own dominions, labouring for terms on which the Lutheran states might return to the Church. He had brought the Pope to consent to the communion in both kinds, and to the marriage of priests, a vast concession which had been extorted by Maisa Mai in the intervals of the discussions on the divorce. Efforts which fail are forgotten, but they represent endeavours at least honourable. Catherine was absorbed in her own grievances. Charles gave them as much attention as he could spare, but had other things to think of. As long as he could prevent Clement from taking any fatal step, he supposed that he had done enough. He had at least done all that he could, and he had evidently allowed Chapuis to persuade him that Henry's course would be arrested at the last extremity by his own subjects. He left Mai to watch the Pope, and Ortiz to urge for sentence. But when the pressure of his own hand relaxed, his agents could effect but little. The English Parliament was to open again in January. The king's commissioners at Rome informed the consistory that if it was decided finally to try the cause at Rome, they were to take their leave, and the king would thenceforth regard the Pope as his public enemy. The threat produced a great impression. The Pope had no wish to be Henry's enemy in order to please the Emperor. Mai and Ortiz told him that the English menaces were but words. He had but to speak, and England would submit. The Pope did not believe it, and became again lax and procrastinating. The English nobles made a last effort to move Catherine. Lord Sussex, Sir William Fitzwilliam, and Lee, Archbishop of York, who had been her warm supporter, waited on her at Moorpark to urge her, if she would not allow the case to be tried at Combray, to permit it to be settled by a commission of bishops and lawyers. The Pope confessedly was not free to give his own opinion, and English causes could not be ruled by the Emperor. If Catherine had consented, it is by no means certain that Anne Boleyn would have been any more heard of. A love which had waited for five years could not have been unconquerable, and it was possible, even probable, in the existing state of opinion, that some other arrangement might have been made for the succession. The difficulty arose from Catherine's determination to force the king before a tribunal where the national pride would not permit him to plead. The independence of England was threatened, and those who might have been her friends were disarmed of their power to help her. Unfortunately for herself, perhaps fortunately for the English race which was yet to be born, she remained still inflexible. The king's plea of conscience, she said, was not honest. He was acting on passion, pure and simple, and English judges would say black was white. Sussex and Fitzwilliam knelt to entreat her to reconsider her answer. She too knelt and prayed them for God's honour and glory to persuade the king to return to her, as she was his lawful wife. All present were in tears but there was no remedy. Chapuis said that the coldness and indifference with which the affair was treated at Rome was paralysing her defenders. The question could not stand in debate forever, and unless the Pope acted promptly and resolutely, 
he feared that some strong act was not far distant. She was destroying her own chance. She persisted in relying on a defence which was itself fatal to her. God knows what I suffer from these people, she wrote to the emperor, enough to kill ten men, much more a shattered woman who has done no harm. I can do nothing but appeal to God and your majesty, on whom alone my remedy depends. For the love of God, procure a final sentence from his holiness as soon as possible. The utmost diligence is required. May God forgive him for the many delays which he has granted, and which alone are the cause of my extremity. I am the king's lawful wife, and while I live I will say no other. The Pope's tardiness makes many on my side waver, and those who would say the truth dare not. Speak out yourself, that my friends may not think I am abandoned by all the world. Well might Catherine despair of Clement. While she was expecting him to excommunicate her husband, he was instructing his nuncio to treat that husband as his most trusted friend. He invited Henry to assist in the Turkish war. He consulted him about the protection of Savoy from the Swiss Protestants. He apologised to him for the language which he was obliged to use on the great matter. Henry, contemptuous and cool, not showing the passion which he had shown at other times, replied that the Pope must be jesting in inviting him, far off as he was, to go to war with the Turk. If Christendom was in danger, he would bear his part with the other princes. As to Savoy, the Duke had disregarded the wishes of France, and must take the consequences. For the rest, the message which he had sent through his ambassador at Rome was no more than the truth. If, said he to the nuncio, I ask a thing which I think right, and the answer is the law forbids. If the emperor ask a thing, law and rules are changed to please him. The pope has greatly wronged me. I have no particular animosity against him. After all, he does not bear me much ill will. The fear of the emperor makes him do things which he would not otherwise do. Proceedings may be taken against me at Rome. I care not. Sentence is given against me. I know what to do. The Pope never meant to give sentence if he could help it. Every day brought Parliament nearer, and he drove my distracted with his evasions. I have said all that I could to his holiness and the cardinals without offending them, he reported to Charles. Your Majesty may believe him when I say that these devils are to a man against us. Some take side openly, being of the French or English faction. Others will be easily corrupted, for every day I hear the English ambassador receives bills for thousands of ducats which are said to go in bribery. Promises were given in plenty, but no action followed, and Ortiz had the same story to tell Catherine. Your ambassador at Rome, she wrote to her nephew, thinks the Pope is cold and indifferent as when the suit began. I am amazed at his holiness. How can he allow a suit so scandalous to remain so long undecided? His conduct cuts me to the soul. You know who has caused all this mischief? Were well, the king, once free from the snare in which he has been caught, he would confess that God had restored his reason. His misleaders goad him on like a bull in the arena. Pity that a man so good and virtuous should be thus deceived. God enlighten his mind. To the emperor himself, perhaps, the problem was growing more difficult than he expected. He himself at last pressed for sentence. But sentence was nothing unless followed by excommunication if it was disobeyed, and the pope did not choose to use his thunder if there was to be no thunderbolt to accompany it. The cardinal legate in Spain assured him that the emperor would employ all his force in the execution of the censures, the Pope said that he prized that promise as a word from heaven. But though Charles might think the English king was doing what was wrong and unjust, was it so wrong and so unjust that fire and sword would be let loose throughout Christendom? Chapuis and Catherine were convinced that there would be no need of such fierce remedies. They might be right. But how if they were not right? How if England supported the king? The emperor could not be certain that even his own subjects would approve of a war for such an object. Three years later, when the moment for action had arrived, 
If action was to be taken at all, it will be seen that the Spanish Council of State took precisely this view of the matter, and saw no reason for breaking the peace of Europe for what, after all, was but a family quarrel. The Pope was cautious. He knew better than his passionate advisers how matters really stood. The Pope may promise, I said, but as long as the world remains in its troubled state, these people will be glad of any excuse to prolong the settlement. January came, when the English Parliament was to meet, and the note was still the same. The Pope says, wrote Mai, that we must not press the English too hard. I have exhausted all that I could say without a rupture. I told him he was discrediting the Queen's case and Your Majesty's authority. I made him understand that I should be obliged to apply elsewhere for the justice that was denied me at Rome. He owns that I am right, but consistory follows consistory, and more delays are allowed. We can but press on as we have always done and urge Your Majesty's displeasure. If a sentence could not be had, Ortiz insisted on the issue of another military brief. Anne Boleyn must be sent from the court. The king must be made to confess his errors. The Pope assented, said loudly that he would do justice, though England and France should revolt from the Holy See in consequence. A brief should go, and if it was disobeyed, he would proceed to excommunicate. The kings of England and France were so bound together that if he lost one, he lost both. But he would venture, notwithstanding. But like the cardinals who condemned Giordano Bruno, Clement was more afraid of passing judgment than Henry of hearing it passed. The brief was written and was sent, but it contained nothing but mild expostulation. All the distractions of the world were laid at the door of the well-meaning, uncertain, wavering Clement. La Pomeray, the French ambassador in London, said, Chapuis vouches for the words, that nothing could be so easy as to bring all Christian princes to agree, had not that devil of a pope embroiled and sown dissension throughout Christendom. In England alone was to be found clear purpose and steadiness of action. The divorce in England was an important feature in the quarrel with the papacy. But it was but a single element in the great stream of reformation, and the main anxiety of king and people was not fixed on Catherine, but on the mighty changes which were rushing forward. When a parliament was first summoned on the fall of Wolsey, the queen had assumed that it was called for nothing else but to empower the king to separate from her. So she thought at the beginning, so she continued to think, Yet session had followed session, and the legislature had found other work to deal with. They had manacled the wrists of her friends, the clergy. But that was all, and she was to have yet another year of respite. The blind passion, which is supposed to have governed Henry's conduct, was singularly deliberate. Seven years had passed since he had ceased cohabitation with Catherine, and five since he had fallen under the fascination of the impatient Anne. Yet he went on as composedly with public business, as if Anne had never smiled on him, and he was still content to wait for this particular satisfaction. As long as hope remained of saving the unity of Christendom without degrading England into a vassal state of the empire, Henry did not mean to break it. He had occupied himself, in concert with the Parliament, of reforming the internal disorders and checking the audacious usurpations of the National Church. He had so far been enthusiastically supported by the immense majority of the laity and was about to make a further advance in the same direction. The third session opened on the 13th of January, peers, prelates and commons being present in full number. By this time, a small but active opposition had been formed in the lower house to resist measures too violently anti-clerical. They met occasionally to concert operations at the Queen's Head by Temple Bar. The bishops, who had been stunned by the Premier, were recovering heart and intending to show fight. Tunstall of Durham, who had been reflecting on the royal supremacy during the recess, repented of his consent and had written his misgivings to the King. The King used the opportunity to make a remarkable reply. People conceive, he said, 
that we are minded to separate our Church of England from the Church of Rome, and you think the consequences ought to be considered. My Lord, as touching schism, we are informed by virtuous and learned men that considering what the Church of Rome is, it is no schism to separate from her and adhere to the word of God. The lives of Christ and the Pope are very opposite, and therefore to follow the Pope is to forsake Christ. It is to be trusted the papacy will shortly vanish away if it be not reformed, but, God willing, we shall never separate from the universal body of Christian men. Archbishop Warren also failed to realise the meaning of his consent to the royal supremacy. He had consecrated the Bishop of St. Asaph on the receipt of a nomination from Rome before the bulls had been presented to the king. He learnt that he was again under a premonere. The aged primate, fallen on evil times, drew the heads of a defence which he intended to make, but never did make in the House of Lords. Archbishops, he said, were not bound to inquire whether bishops had exhibited their bulls or not. It had not been the custom. The archbishop could not give the spiritualities to one who was pronounced a bishop at Rome till the king had granted him his temporalities. The spiritual powers of the archbishops would depend on the temporal power of the prince, who would be of little or of no effect, which was against God's law. In consecrating the bishop of St. Asaph, he had acted as the pope's commissary. The act itself was the pope's act. The point for which the king contended was one of the articles which Henry the Second sought to extort at Clarendon, and which he was afterwards compelled to abandon. The liberties of the church were guaranteed by Magna Charta, and the sovereigns who had violated them, Henry the Second, Edward the Third, Richard the Second, had come to an ill end. The lay peers had threatened that they would defend the matter with their swords. The lay peers should remember what befell the knights who slew St. Thomas. The archbishop said he would rather be hewn in pieces than confess this article for which St. Thomas died to be a premonier. Warren was to learn that the spirit of Henry II was alive again in the present Henry, that the constitutions of Clarendon, then premature, were to become the law of the land. Fisher of Rochester had received no summons to attend the present parliament, but he sent word to the imperial ambassador that he would be in his place, whether called up or not, that he might defend Catherine should any measure be introduced which affected her. He begged Chapuy not to mention his name in his dispatches, except in cipher. If they met in public, Chapuy must not speak to him or appear to know him. He, on his part, would pass Chapuy without notice till the present tyranny was overpassed. Bishop Fisher was entering upon dangerous courses, which were to lead him into traitorous efforts to introduce an invading army into England, and to bring his own head to the block. History has only pity for these unfortunate old men. It does not care to remember that, if they could have had their way, a bloodier persecution than the Marian would have made a swift end of the Reformation. I need not repeat what I have written elsewhere on the acts of this session. A few details only deserve further notice. The privilege of the clergy to commit felony without punishment was at last abolished. Felonious clerks were thenceforward to suffer like secular criminals. An accident provided an illustrative example. A priest was executed in London for clipping the coin, having first been drawn through the streets in the usual way. Thirty women sued in vain for his pardon. He was hanged in his habit without being degraded against the protest of the bishop. A thing never done before since the island was Christian. The constitutions of Clarendon were to be enforced at last. The archers' court and the bishops' courts were reformed on similar lines, their methods and their charges being brought within reasonable limits. Priests were no longer allowed to evade the mortmain acts by working on deathbed terrors. The exactions for mortuaries, legacy duties and probate duties, long a pleasant source of revenue, were abolished or cut down. The clergy and their synods had passed what laws they pleased and enforced them with spiritual terrors. The clergy were informed that they would no longer be allowed to meet in synod without royal license, that their laws would be revised by laymen. Chapuis wittily observed that the clergy were thus being made of less account than cordwainers, 
who could at least enact their own statutes. A purpose of larger moment was announced by Henry for future execution. Moore's chancellorship had been distinguished by heresy prosecutions. The stake in those three years had been more often lighted than under all the administration of Wolsey. It was as if the bishops had vented on those poor victims their irritation at the rude treatment of their privileges. The king said that the clergy's province was with souls, not with bodies. They were not in future to arrest men on suspicion, imprison, examine, and punish at their mere pleasure. There was an outcry in which the Chancellor joined. The king suspended his resolution for the moment, but did not abandon it. He was specially displeased with Moore, from whom he had expected better things. He intended to persist. May God, exclaimed the orthodox and shocked Chapuy, send such a remedy as the intensity of the evil requires. None of Henry's misdeeds shocked Chapuy so deeply as the tolerating heresy. The royal supremacy had been accepted by convocation. It was not yet confirmed by Parliament. Norfolk felt the pulses of the peers. He called a meeting at Norfolk House. He described the Pope's conduct. He insisted on the usual topics, that matrimonial causes were of temporal jurisdiction, not spiritual, that the king was sovereign in his own dominions, etc., etc. And he invited the peers' opinions. The peers were cold. Lord Darcy had spoken freely against the Pope in his indictment of Wolsey. It seemed his ardour was abating. He said the king in council must manage matters without letting loose a cat among the legs of the rest of them. The meeting generally agreed with Darcy and was not pressed further. Papal privilege came before Parliament in a more welcome form when a bill was introduced to withdraw annates or first fruits of benefices which had been claimed and paid as a tribute to the Holy See. The imposition was a grievance. There were no annates in Spain. The papal collectors were detested. The House of Commons made no difficulty. The nuncio complained to the king, and the king told him that it was not he who brought forward these measures. They were moved by the people, who hated the Pope marvellously. In the upper house, the bishops stood by their spiritual chief this time unanimously. Among the mitred abbots, there was a division of opinion. The abbeys had been the chief sufferers from enates, and had complained of the exaction for centuries. All the lay peers, except Lord Arundel, supported the government. The bill was passed, but passed conditionally, leaving power to the Crown to arrange a compromise as the Pope would agree to treat. For the next year, the Anates were paid in full, as usual, to give time for His Holiness to consider himself. Thus steadily the Parliament moved on. Archbishop Warham, who was dying broken-hearted, dictated a feeble protest from his bed against all which had been done by it in derogation of the Pope or in limitation of the privileges of the Church. Moore had fought through the session, but finding resistance useless, resigned the Chancellorship. He saw what was coming. He could not prevent it. If he retained his office, he found that he must either go against his conscience or increase the displeasure of the King. He preferred to retire. In this way, at least in England, the situation was clearing, and parties and individuals were drifting into definite positions. Montfalconet, writing to Charles in May, said that he had been in England and had seen Queen Catherine, who was still clamouring for the Pope's sentence. Everyone, he continued, speaking for the Catholic party, whom alone he had seen, was angry with the Pope, and angry with the Emperor for not pressing him further. Peers, clergy, Laity all loved the Queen. She was patient. She thought that if she could but see the King, all might yet be well. Were the sentence once delivered, she was satisfied he would submit. The French ambassador in London, on the other hand, recommended Francis to force the Pope to hold his hand. He told Chapuy that France must and would take Henry's part if a rapture came. The Emperor had no right to throw Europe to confusion for the sake of a woman. If the King of England wished to marry again, he should do as Louis XII had done under the same circumstances. Take the woman that he liked, and waste no more time and money. At Rome, the Pope had been fingering his briefs with hesitating heart. 
The first, which he had issued under Charles I at Bologna, had been comparatively firm. He had there ordered Henry to take Catherine back under penalty of excommunication. The last, though so hardly extracted from him, was meagre and insignificant. The king, when it was presented, merely laughed at it. The Pope, he said, complains that I sent the Queen away. His Holiness considers her as my wife. The right of punishing her for the rudeness of her behaviour belongs to me and not to him. Ortiz, finding it hopeless to expect a decision on the marriage itself from the Pope, demanded excommunication on the plea of disobedience to the Bologna brief. He had succeeded, or thought he had succeeded, in bringing the Pope to the point. The excommunication was drawn up, but when it was to be engrossed and sealed, the enemy of mankind prevented its completion in a manner known only to God. Ortiz continued to urge. The document could be sent secretly to the Emperor, to be used at his discretion. If the Emperor thought fit to issue it, bearing as it did God's authority, God in such cases would infallibly send his towers upon earth, and provide that no ill should come of it. The Pope was less certain that God would act as Ortiz undertook for him, and continued to offend the Lord by delay. In vain, Catherine's representative railed at him. In vain, told him that he would commit a great sin and offence against God if he did not excommunicate a king who was, in mortal sin, keeping a mistress at his court. The Pope rationally answered that there was no evidence for mortal sin. It was the custom in England for princes to converse intimately with ladies. He could not prove that, in the present case, there was anything worse. The king might allege his conscience as a reason for not treating the queen as a husband. Ortiz insisted that the devil had got hold of the king in the shape of that woman, and unless the pope obliged him to put her away, the pope would be damned. But it was an absurdity to excommunicate the king, and declare him to have forfeited his crown when the original cause of the quarrel was still undecided. The king might prove after all to be right, as modern law and custom has in fact declared him to have been. Charles himself felt that such a position could not be maintained. Henry was evidently not frightened. There was no sign that the English people were turning against him. If a bull of excommunication was issued, Charles himself would be called on to execute it. It was necessary to be sure of his ground. Ortiz raged on. I told his holiness, he wrote, that if he did not excommunicate the king, I would stand up at the day of judgment and accuse him before God. Charles was obliged to tell Ortiz that he must be more moderate. A further difficulty had risen in Rome itself. If the cause was tried at Rome, was it to be tried before the cardinals in consistory, or before the court of the Rota? The cardinals were men of the world. My surmise opinion was that from the Rota only a judgment could be with certainty expected in the Queen's favour. The winds are against us, he wrote to Secretary Corvos. What is done one day is undone the next. The cardinals will not stir, but quietly pocket the ducats which come from the emperor, and the larger sums which come from the English, who are lavish in spending. The pope will not break with France. He says he has so many ties with the kings of France and England that he must pretend good will to the latter for fear they both break off from the church as they have threatened to do. End of chapter 11《ジャプト12》The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Froude。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Read by Beeswax Candle。Chapter 12 The Pope had promised Ortiz that nothing should be said of the intended excommunication till the brief was complete. He betrayed the secret to the English agents by whom it was conveyed to Henry. The French ambassador had advised the king to hesitate no longer but to marry and end the controversy. The Pope himself had several times in private expressed the same wish. But Henry, in love though he is supposed to have been, determined to see Francis in person before he took a step which could not be recalled. He desired to know distinctly how far France was prepared to go along with him in defying the papal censures. An interview between the two kings at such a crisis would also show the world that their alliance was a practical fact, 
and that if the emperor declared war and execution of the censures, he would have France for an enemy as well as England. The intended meeting was announced at the end of August, and strange to say, there was still a belief prevailing that a marriage would come of it between the king and a French princess, and that Anne would be disappointed after all. If it be so, wrote Chapuis, the Lady Anne is under a singular delusion, for she writes to her friends that this interview, all that she has been so long wishing for, will be accomplished. One thing was clear, both to the imperial ambassador and the nuncio, that the Pope, by his long trifling, had brought himself into a situation where he must either have to consent to a judgment against Catherine, or encounter as best he could the combination of two of the most powerful princes in Christendom. The least that he could do was issue an inhibition against the king's marriage either with Anne or with the French woman. The Pope's danger was real enough, but Anne Boleyn had nothing to fear for herself. She was to form part of the cortege, she was to go, and to be received at the French court as Henry's bride-elect, and she was created Marchioness of Pembroke for the occasion. Queen Catherine believed that the marriage would be completed at the interview with the publicity which would make Francis an accomplice. The emperor was incredulous. Reluctantly, he had been driven to the conclusion that Henry was really in earnest, and he still thought it impossible that such an outrage as a marriage could be seriously contemplated while the divorce was still undecided. Yet contemplated it evidently was. Politically, the effect would have been important, and it is not certain that Francis would not have encouraged a step which would be taken as an open insult by Charles. The objection, so Chapuis heard, came from the lady herself, who desired to be married in state with the usual formalities in London. Invited to the interview, however, she certainly was by Francis. The French queen sent her a present of jewels. The sieur de Longue came with special compliments from the king to request her attendance. She had been a useful instrument in dividing Henry from the emperor, and his master, de Longue said, desired to thank her for the inestimable services which she had rendered, and was daily rendering him. He wished to keep her devoted to his interests. Wolsey himself had not been more valuable to him. He had not to pay her a pension of 25,000 crowns, as he had done to the cardinal. Therefore he meant to pay her in flattery, and in forwarding the divorce at Rome. In vain, Catherine poured out to Clement her wailing cries for sentence. Sentence without a moment's delay. Less than ever could the Pope be brought to move. He must wait, and see what came of the meeting of the kings, and whether the emperor got the better of the Turks was the harder to bear because she had persuaded herself and had persuaded Ortiz that if the king was once excommunicated the whole of England would rise against him for his contumacious disobedience. The interview which took place in October between the kings of France and England was a momentous incident in the struggle for it did in fact decide Henry to take the final step. The scene itself the festivities, the regal reception of Anne, the nun of Kent, and the discovery of the singular influence which an hysterical impostor had been able to exercise in the higher circles of English life, have already been described by me, and I can add nothing to what I have already written. A more particular account, however, must be given of a French commission, which was immediately after dispatched to Rome. Francis had not completely satisfied Henry. He had repeated the advice of his ambassadors, he had encouraged the king to marry at once. He had reiterated his promises of support if the emperor declared war. Even an engagement which Henry had desired to obtain from him to unite France with England in a separate communion should the Pope proceed to violence, Francis seemed to give, and had wished his good brother to believe it. But his language had been less explicit on this point than on the other. The Bishop of Tarbes, now Cardinal Gramont, was sent to Rome with Cardinal Tournon, direct from the interview, with open instructions to demand a general council, to inform the Pope that if he refused, the two kings would call a council themselves and invite the Lutheran princes to join them, and that, if the Pope excommunicated Henry, he would go to Rome for absolution so well accompanied that the 
Pope would be glad to grant it. If Catherine's friends in Rome were rightly informed, the cardinals had brought also a secret commission, which went the full extent of Henry's expectation. The Pope was to be required to fulfil at once the promise which he had given at Orvieto, and to give judgment for the divorce. Otherwise, the kings of France and England would abrogate the papal authority in their several realms. The Pope, confident that the alternative before him was the loss of the two kingdoms, was preparing to yield. Henry certainly returned to England, with an understanding that Francis and himself were perfectly united, and would adopt the same course, whatever that might be. A report went abroad that, relying on these assurances, he had brought his hesitation to an end, and immediately after landing, made Anne secretly his wife. The rumour was premature, but the resolution was taken. The Pope, the king said, was making himself the tool of the emperor. The emperor was judge and not the pope, and neither he nor his people would endure it. He would maintain the liberties of his country, and the pope, if he tried violence, would find his mistake. It's not easy to believe that on a point of such vast consequence, Henry could have misunderstood what Francis said, and he considered afterwards that he had been deliberately deceived. But under any aspect, the meeting was a demonstration against the papacy. My Samai, who watched the Pope from day to day, declared that his behaviour was enough to drive him out of his senses. My and Ortiz had at last forced another brief out of him. Not a direct excommunication, but an excommunication which was to follow on further disobedience. They had compelled him to put it in writing, that he might have committed himself before the French cardinal's arrival but when it was written, he would not let it out of his hands. He was to meet the emperor again at Bologna, and until he learnt from Charles's own lips what he was prepared to do, it was unfair and unreasonable, he said, to require an act which might fatally commit him. He was not, however, to be allowed to escape. Catherine, when she heard of the dispatch of the cardinals, again flung herself on her nephew's protection. She insisted that the Pope should speak out, the French must not be listened to. There was nothing to be afraid of. The English themselves carried no lightning except to strike her. Letters from Ortiz brought her news of the Pope's continued indecision, an indecision fatal, as she considered it, to the Church and to herself. Rumours reached her that the King had actually married, and she poured out her miseries to Chapuy. The letters from Rome, she said, reopen all my wounds. They show there is no justice for me or my daughter. It is withheld from us for political considerations. I do not ask his holiness to declare war. A war I would rather die than provoke. But I have been appealing to the vicar of God for justice for six years, and I cannot have it. I refuse the proposals made to me two years ago by the king in council. Must I accept them now? Since then I have received fresh injuries. I am separated from my lord, and he has married another woman without obtaining a divorce. This last act has been done while the suit is still pending, and in defiance of him who has power of God upon earth. I cover these lines with my tears as I write. I confide in you as my friend. Help me to bear the cross of my tribulation. Write to the emperor. Bid him insist that judgment be pronounced. The next parliament, I am told, will decide if I and my daughter are to suffer martyrdom. I hope God will accept it as an act of merit by us as we shall suffer for the sake of the truth. And Catherine might say, and might mean, that she did not wish to be the cause of a war. But unless war was to be the alternative of her husband's submission, the papal thunders would be as ineffectual as she had supposed the English to be. The emperor had not decided what he would do. He may still have clung to the hope that a decision would not be necessary, but he forced or persuaded the pope to disregard the danger. The brief was issued, bearing the date at which it was drawn and was transmitted to Flanders as the nearest point to England for publication. In removing the Queen from his company, without waiting for the decision of his cause and cohabiting with a certain Anne, Clement told the King that he was insulting divine justice and the papal authority. He had already warned him, but his monition had not been respected. 
Again, therefore, he exhorted him on pain of excommunication to take Catherine back as his queen and put Anne away within a month of the presentation of the present letter. If the king still disobeyed, the Pope declared both him and Anne to be ipso facto excommunicated at the expiration of the term fixed and forbade him to divorce himself by his own authority. It might seem that the end had now come. But in a month, the king, and the subjects who continued loyal to him, would incur all the consequences of the papal censures. But the proceedings of the court of Rome were enveloped in formalities. Conditional excommunications affected the spiritual status of the persons denounced, but went no further. A second bull of excommunication was still requisite, declaring the king deposed, and his subjects absolved from their allegiance before the secular arm could be called in. And this last desperate remedy could not decently be resorted to, with the approval even of the Catholic opinion of Europe, until it had been decided whether Catherine was really legal queen. The enthusiastic Ortiz, however, believed that judgment on the principal cause would now be immediately given, and that the victory was won. He enclosed to the Empress a letter from Catherine to him, to be preserved as a relic, since she would one day be canonised. May God inspire the King of England, he said, to acknowledge the error into which the enemy of mankind has led him, and amend his past conduct. Otherwise, it must follow that his disobedience to the Pope's injunction and his infidelity to God once proved, he will be deprived of his kingdom and the execution of the sentence committed to his imperial majesty. This done, all those in England who fear God will rise in arms, and the king will be punished as he deserves the present brief operating as a formal sentence against him. On the main course, there being no one in Rome to answer for the opposite party, sentence cannot long be delayed. Ortiz was too sanguine, and the vision soon faded. The brief sounded formidable, but it said no more than had been contained or implied in another which Clement had issued three years before. He had allowed the first to be disregarded, he might equally allow the last. Each step which he had taken had been forced upon him, and his reluctance was not diminished. Chapuis thought that he had given a brief instead of passing sentence, because he could recall one and could not recall the other. But he was playing both with the king and the emperor, and in England as well as elsewhere, it was thought that there was some secret intelligence between him and the king. The Pope and the Emperor had met at Bologna, and Charles's language had been as emphatic as Catherine desired. Yet even at Bologna itself, and during the conference, Clement had assured the English agents that there was still a prospect of compromise. It is even rumoured that the Emperor would allow the cause to be referred back to England, if securities could be found to protect the rights of the Princess Mary. Nay, that he had gone so far as to say that if the king made a suitable marriage, and not a love marriage, he would bring the Pope and Catherine to allow the first marriage to be annulled. In London, the talk continued of the removal of the suit from Rome to Combray. The nuncio and the king were observed to be much together and on improved terms, the nuncio openly saying that his holiness wished to be relieved of the business. It was even considered still possible that the Pope might concede the dispensation to the king which had been originally asked for, to marry again without legal process. If, wrote Chapuis, who thoroughly distrusted Clement, the king once gains the point of not being obliged to appear at Rome, the Pope will have the less shame in granting the dispensation by absolute power, as it is made out that the king's right is so evident, and if his holiness refuses it, the king will be more his enemy than ever. A sentence is the only of sovereign remedy, and the queen says the king would not resist, if only from fear of his subjects, who were not only well disposed to her and her your majesty, but for the most part are good Catholics, and would not endure excommunication and interdict. If a tumult arose, I know not if the lady, who is hated by all the world, would escape with life and jewels. But unless the Pope takes care, he will lose his authority here, and his censures will not be regarded. It was true that Anne was ill-liked in England, and the king, in choosing her, was testing the question of his marriage in the least popular form which it could have assumed. The Venetian ambassador mentions that one evening, seven or eight thousand women went out of London to see his Bolin's daughter, who was supping at a villa on the river, the king not being with her. 
Many men were among them in women's clothes. Henry, however, showed no sign of change of purpose. He had presented her to the French court as his intended queen, and on such a matter he was not to be moved by the personal objections of his subjects. The month allowed and the brief went by. She was still at the court, and the continued negotiations of the nuncio convinced Catherine's friends that there was mischief at work behind the scenes. Their uneasiness was increased by the selection which was now made of a successor to Archbishop Warham. Thomas Cranmer had been Lord Wiltshire's private chaplain, and had at one time been his daughter's tutor. He had attended her father on his embassy to the emperor, and had been active in collecting opinions on the continent favourable to the divorce, and had been resident ambassador at the imperial court. He had been much in Germany. He was personally acquainted with Luther. He had even married, and although he could not produce his wife openly, the connection was well known. Protestant priests, in taking wives, were asserting only their natural liberty. Luther had married, and had married a nun. An example laudable at Wittenberg could not be censurable in London by those who held Luther excused. The German clergy had released themselves from their vows, as an improvement on the concubinage which had long and generally prevailed. Wolsey had a son, and was not ashamed of him, even charging his education on English benefices. Clerical marriages were forbidden only by the church law, which Parliament had never been invited to sanction. And though Cranmer could not introduce a wife into society, he was at least as fit for archiepiscopal rank as the great cardinal. He was a man of high natural gifts, and ardent to replace superstition and corruption by pure teaching. The English liturgy survives to tell us what Cranmer was. His nomination to the primacy took the world by surprise for as yet he had held no higher preferment than an archdeaconry. But the reorganisation of the church was to begin. Parliament was to meet again in February, and the king needed all the help that he could find in the House of Lords. The bishops were still but half conquered. A man of intellect and learning was required at the head of them. King Henry loved a man, it was said. He knew Cranmer and valued him. The appointment was made known in the first month of the new year. Before the new primate could be installed, a bull of confirmation was still legally necessary from Rome. The king was in haste. The annates due on the vacancy of the See of Canterbury were dispatched at once, the king himself advancing the money and taking no advantage of the late act. Such unusual precipitancy raised suspicions that something more was contemplated in which Cranmer's help would be needed. The knot had, in fact, been cut, which Henry had been so long struggling to untie. The Lady Anne had aspired to being the central figure of a grand ceremony. Her nuptials were to be attended with the pomp and splendour of a royal marriage. Public feeling was in too critical a condition to permit what might have been resented. Lest the prize should escape her after all, she brought down her pride to agree to a private service. When it was performed, and by whom, was never known. The date usually received was on or before the 25th of January. Chapuy says that Cranmer himself officiated in the presence of the lady's father, mother and brother, two other friends of the lady, and a Canterbury priest. But Chapuy was relating only the story current at the time in society. Nothing authentic has been ascertained. The fact that the marriage had taken place was concealed till the divorce could be pronounced by a court protected by Act of Parliament, and perhaps with the hope that the announcement could be softened by the news that the nation might hope for an heir. Dispatch was thus necessary with Cranmer's bulls. He himself spoke without reserve on the right of the king to remarry, being ready to maintain it with his life. Chapuy and the nuncio both wrote to request the Pope not to be in a hurry with the confirmation of so dangerous a person. The Pope seemed determined to justify the suspicions entertained of him by his eagerness to meet Henry's wishes. It was certain that the warning had reached him. He sent the balls with all the speed he could. He knew, perhaps, what they were needed for. Henry, meanwhile, was preparing to meet the Parliament when the secret would have to be communicated to the world. The modern reader will conceive that no other subject could have occupied his mind. The relative importance of things varies with the distance from which we view them. He was king of England first. His domestic anxieties held still the second place. 
Before the opening, as the matter of greatest consequence, a draft act was prepared to carry out the object which in the last year he had failed in securing, an act to restrain bishops from citing or arresting any of the king's subjects to appear before them, unless the bishop or his commissary was free from private grudge against the accused, unless there were three or at least two credible witnesses, and a copy of the libel had in all cases been delivered to the accused, with the names of the accusers. Such an act was needed. It was not to shield what was still regarded as impiety, for Frith was burned a few months later for a denial of the real presence, which Luther himself called heresy. It was to check the arbitrary and indiscriminate tyranny of a sour, exasperated party, who were pursuing everyone with fire and sword who presumed to oppose them. Moore, writing to Erasmus, said he had purposefully stated in his epitaph that he had been hard upon the heretics. He so hated that folk that, unless they repented, he preferred their enmity. So mischievous were they to the world. The spirit of Moore was alive and dangerous. To Catholic minds there could be no surer evidence that the king was given over to the evil one than leniency to heretics. They were the more disturbed to see how close the intimacy had grown between him and the Pope's representative. The nuncio was constantly closeted with Henry or the council. When Chapuis remonstrated, he said, He was a poor gentleman, living on a salary, and could not do otherwise. The Pope had advised him to neglect no opportunity of promoting the welfare of religion. Practices, Chapuis ascertained, were still going forward, and the nuncio was at the bottom of them. The nuncio assured him that he had exhorted the king to take Catherine back. The king had replied that he would not, and that reconciliation was impossible. Yet the secret communications did not cease, and the astonishment and alarm increased when the nuncio consented to accompany the king to the opening of Parliament. He was conducted in state in the royal barge from Greenwich. Henry sate in the throne, the nuncio had a chair on his right, and the French ambassador on his left. The object was to show the nation how little was really meant by the threat of excommunication, to intimidate the bishops, and to make the clergy understand the extent of favour which they could expect from the nuncio's master. The nuncio's appearance was not limited to a single occasion. During the progress of the session, he attended the debates in the House of Commons. Norfolk gave him notice of the days on which the Pope would not be directly mentioned, that he might be present without scandal. The Duke admitted a wish for the world to see that the King and the Court of Rome understood each other. By this presumption, said Chapuis, they expect to make their profit as regards the people and the prelates who have hitherto supported the Holy See, who now, for the above reason, dare not speak, fearing to go against the Pope. The world wondered and was satisfied. The opposition was paralysed. The Bishop of Rochester complained to the nuncio and received nothing but regrets and promises which were not observed. Again, a council was held of peers, bishops, and lawyers to consider the divorce, when it was agreed at last that the cause might be tried in the Archbishop of Canterbury's court, and that the arrival of the bulls would be accepted as a sign of the Pope's tacit connivance. Chapuis had failed to stop them. The Queen, he said, was thunderstruck, and complained bitterly of his holiness. He had left her to languish for three and a half years since her appeal, and instead of giving sentence, had now devised a scheme to prolong her misery and bastardize her daughter. She knew the king's character. If sentence was once given, there would be no scandal. The king would obey, or if he did not, which she thought impossible, she would die happy, knowing that the Pope had declared for her. Her own mind would be at rest, and the princess would not lose her right. The Pope was entirely mistaken if he thought that he would induce the king to modify his action against the church. The lady and her father, who were staunch Lutherans, were urging him on. The sentence alone would make him pause. He dared not disobey, and if the people rose, the lady would find a rough handling. This, Chapuis said, was the queen's opinion, which he had commanded him to communicate to the emperor. For himself, he could only repeat his request that the balls for Canterbury should be delayed till the sentence was ready for delivery. If the Pope knew Cranmer's reputation as a heretic, he would be in no haste to confirm him. Clement knew well enough what Cranmer was. 
The bulls had been dispatched promptly before the emperor could interfere. The king, meanwhile, had committed himself, and now went straight forward. He allowed his marriage to be known. Lord Wiltshire had withdrawn his opposition to it. Lord Rochefort, Anne's brother, was sent at the beginning of March to Paris to say that the king had acted on the advice given him by his good brother at their last interview. He had taken a wife for the establishment of his realm in the hope of having male issue. He trusted, therefore, that Francis would remember his promise. Inciting him to Rome, the Pope had violated the rights of sovereign princes. It touched them all, and if allowed, would give the Pope universal authority. The time was past when such pretenses could be tolerated. At home, he prepared for the worst. The fleet was further increased. New ships were put on the stocks. The yeomanry were armed, drilled, and equipped. And England rang with the sounds of preparation for war, while in Parliament... The famous act was introduced, which was to form the constitutional basis of national independence and to end forever the papal jurisdiction in England. From the time that convocation had acknowledged the king to be the head of the church, the question of appeals to Rome had been virtually before the country. It was now to be settled, and the English lawsuits were henceforth to be heard and decided within the limits of the empire. The Sibyl's pages were being rent out one by one. The Primonia had been revived, and the Pope's claim of independent right to interfere by bull or brief in English affairs had been struck rudely down. Tribute in the shape of annates went next. The appellate jurisdiction was now to follow. Little would then be left save spiritual precedence, and this might not be of long continuance. There had been words enough, the time had come to act. On the introduction of the Act of Appeals, the king spoke out to Chapuis as if the spirit of the Plantagenets was awake in him. He said a thousand things in disparagement of the Pope, complaining of the authority and power he unduly assumed over the kingdoms of Christendom. He professed to have seen a book from the papal library, in which it was maintained that all Christian princes were only feudatories of the Pope. He himself, he said, intended to put a remedy to such inordinate ambition and repair the errors of Henry the Second and John, who had been tricked into making England tributary to the Holy See. The Emperor, he said, not only demanded justice, but would have justice done in his own way and according to his own caprice. For himself, he thought of resuming to the crown the lands of the clergy, which his predecessors had alienated without right. Chapuis advised him to wait for a general council before he tried such high measures, but the king could not be persuaded that a council was needed for such a purpose. The act of appeals touched too many interests to be passed without opposition. Private persons, as well as princes, had appealed to the Roman law courts, and suits pending or determined there might be reopened at home and produce confusion less provided for. However complacent the Pope might appear, it could not be supposed that he would bear patiently the open renunciation of his authority. Excommunication was half perceived to be a spectre, but spectres had not wholly lost their terrors. The next communication pronounced in earnest might come interdict and stoppage of trade, perhaps war and rebellion at home, and one of the members for London said that if the king would refer the question between himself and the queen to a general council, the city of London were given two hundred thousand pounds. The arrival of Cranmer's bulls, while the act was still under discussion, moderated the alarm. The Pope evidently was in no warlike humour. At the bottom of his heart, he had throughout been in Henry's favour. He hoped probably that a time might come when he could say so, and that all this hostile legislation would then be repealed. When the excitement was at its hottest, and it was known at Rome, not only that the last brief had been defied, but the king was about to marry the lady, the Pope had borne the news with singular calmness. After all, he said to the Count of Sifuentes, if the marriage is completed, we have only to think of a remedy. The remedy, Sifuentes said, was for the Pope to do justice. The king had been encouraged in his rash course by the toleration with which he had been treated and the constant delays. Clement answered that he would certainly do justice, but if the marriage was a fact accomplished, he wished to know what the emperor meant to do. Sir Fuentes told him that his holiness must do his part first, 
then the emperor would act as became a powerful and wise prince. The pope had heard this language before. The emperor was afraid of going to war with England, and the pope knew it. The alternative, therefore, was to make either some concession to Henry, or to let him go on as he pleased, bringing the Holy See into contempt by exposing its weakness, and either course would be equally dispiriting to the Queen and his own friends in England. Everybody, wrote Chapuis, cries murder on the Pope for his delays, and for not detaining the Archbishop Bulls till the definitive sentence had been given. He was warned of the danger of granting them. There is not a lord in the court of either side who does not say publicly his holiness will betray the emperor. The dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk speak of it with more assurance, saying they know it well, and could give good evidence of it. The act of appeals, though strongly resisted in the House of Commons for fear of the consequences, was evidently to pass, and it was now understood that, as soon as it became law, Cranmer was to try the divorce suit, and to give final judgment. The Pope's extraordinary conduct had paralysed opposition. The clergy, like some wild animal hardly broken in, were made to parade their docility and to approve beforehand the archbishop's intended action. It was to be done in haste, for Anne was ancienne. The members of the synod were allowed scant time even to eat their dinners. They were so harassed that no one opened his mouth to contradict except the Bishop of Rochester, and Rochester had no weight, being alone against all the rest. So docile was the assembly, and so imperious the king, that the queen and all her supporters now regarded her cause as lost. Ortiz wrote from Rome to Charles that, though he was bound to believe the contrary, he feared the Pope had sent or might send absolution to the king. Something might be done underhand to revert the last brief, though the Pope knew what an evil thing it would be, and how ignominious to the Holy See. The reforming party in England laughed at the expected interdict. The Pope, they said, would not dare try it, or if he did, Christian princes would not trouble themselves about him. The king said, significantly, to the nuncio that he was only defending himself. If the Pope gave him occasion to reconsider the matter, he might undo what was being aimed at his authority. The bill passed more rapidly through its later stages. The papal jurisdiction was ended. Anyone who introduced briefs of excommunication or interdict into the realm was declared guilty of high treason. The Bishop of Rochester, becoming violent, was committed to friendly custody under the charge of Gardiner, now Bishop of Winchester. Appeals to the Pope on any matter, secular or spiritual, were forbidden thenceforward, and the act was made retrospective, applying to suits already in progress. All was thus over. The archbishop's sentence was known beforehand, and Anne Boleyn was to be crowned at Whitsuntide. Force was now the only remedy, and the constitutional opposition converted itself into conspiracy to continue in that form to the end of the century. The king was convinced that the strength and energy of the country was with him. When told that there would be an invasion, he said that the English could never be conquered as long as they held together. Chapuis was convinced equally that they would not hold together. The clergy, and a section of the peers with whom he chiefly associated, spoke all in one tone, and he supposed that the language which they used to him represented a universal opinion. Thenceforward, he and his English friends began to urge on the emperor the necessity of armed intervention, and assured him that he had only to declare himself to find the whole nation at his back. Englishmen, high and low, Chapuis wrote, desire your majesty to send an army to destroy the venomous influence of the lady and her adherents, and reform the realm. Forgive my boldness, but your majesty ought not to hesitate. When this accursed Anne has her foot in the stirrup, she will do the queen and the princess all the hurt she can. She boasts that she will have the princess in her own train. One day, perhaps, she will poison her, or will marry her to some varlet, while the realm itself will be made of the heresy. A conquest would be perfectly easy. The king has no trained army. All of the higher ranks and all the nobles are for your majesty, except the Duke of Norfolk and two or three besides. 
Let the Pope call in the secular arm, stop the trade, encourage the Scots, send to sea a few ships, and the thing will be over. No injustice will be done, and without this, England will be estranged from the holy faith and will become Lutheran. The king points the way, lends the wings, and the Archbishop of Canterbury does worse. There is no danger of French interference. France will wait to see the issue, and will give you no more trouble if this king receives his due. Again, forgive me. The pity for the queen and the princess obliges me to speak plainly. The king could hardly be ignorant of the communications between the disaffected nobles and the imperial ambassador, but no outward sign appeared that he was aware of them. Lord Mountjoy, however, was sent with a guard to watch Catherine's residence, and the decisive act being passed through Parliament, the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, with Lord Exeter and the Earl of Oxford, repaired to her once more to invite her, since she must see that further resistance was useless, to withdraw her appeal, and to tell her that, on her compliance, every arrangement should be made for her state and comfort, with an establishment suited to her rank. Chapuy demanded an audience of the king to remonstrate, and a remarkable conversation ensued. The ambassador said that he had heard of the proceedings in convocation and in Parliament. It was his duty to speak. If the king had no regard for men whom he despised, he hoped that he would have respect to God. God, in his conscience, Henry answered calmly, were on perfectly good terms. Chapuy expressed a doubt, and the king assured him that he was entirely sincere. Chapuy said he could not believe that at a time when Europe was distracted with heresies, the King of England would set so evil an example. The King rejoined that if the world found his new marriage strange, he found it more strange that Pope Julius should have granted a dispensation for his marriage with his brother's wife. He must have an heir to succeed him in the realm. The Emperor had no right to prevent him. The Ambassador spoke of the Princess. To provide a husband for the princess would be the fittest means to secure the succession. Henry said that he would have children of his own, and Chapuy ventured on a more dangerous ground that he was aware of by hinting that he could not be sure of that. Am I not a man? The king said sharply. Am I not a man like others? Am I not a man? Thrice repeating the words. But, he added, I will not let you into my secrets. The ambassador inquired whether he intended to remain on friendly terms with the emperor. The king asked him with a frown what he meant by that. On his replying that the emperor's friendship depended on the treatment of the queen, the king said coldly that the emperor had no right to interfere with the laws and constitution of England. Chapuy persisted. The emperor, he said, did not wish to meddle with his laws unless they personally affected the queen. The king wanted to force her to abandon her appeal, and it was not to be expected that she would submit to statutes which had been carried by compulsion. The king grew impatient. The statutes, he said, had been passed in Parliament, and the queen as a subject must obey them. The ambassador retorted that new laws could not be retrospective, and as to the queen being a subject, if she was his wife, she was his subject. If she was not his wife, she was not his subject. But this was true, and Henry was to be made to feel the dilemma. He contented himself, however, with saying that she must have patience and obey the laws of the realm. The emperor had injured him by hindering his marriage and preventing him from having male succession. The queen was no more his wife than she was Chapuise's. He could do as he pleased, and if the emperor made war on him, he would fight. Chapuy inquired whether, if an interdict was issued, and the Spaniards and Flemings resident in England obeyed it, his statutes would apply to them. The king did not answer. But, turning to someone present, he said, You have heard the ambassador hint at excommunication. It is not that I am excommunicated, but the emperor who has kept me so long in mortal sin. That is an excommunication which the Pope cannot take off. To the lords who carried the message to Catherine, she replied as she had always done. That queen she was, and she would never call herself by any other name. As to her establishment, she wanted nothing but a confessor, a doctor, and a couple of maids. If that was too much, she would go about the world and beg alms for love of God. The king, Chapuis said, was naturally kind and generous. 
but the Lady Anne had so perverted him that he did not seem the same man. Lest the Emperor acted in earnest, she would make an end of Catherine, as she had done of Wolsey, whom she did not hate with half as much intensity. Oh, seems like a dream, he said. Her own party do not know whether to laugh or cry at it. Every day people ask me when I am going away. As long as I remain here, it will always be thought your majesty has consented to the marriage. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Divorce of Catherine of Aragon by James Anthony Frood This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Beeswax Candle Chapter 13 if circumstances can be imagined to justify the use of the dispensing power claimed and exercised by the papacy, Henry the Eighth had been entitled to demand assistance from Clement the Seventh in the situation in which he had found himself with Catherine of Aragon. He had been committed, when little more than a boy, for political reasons, to a marriage of dubious legality. In the prime of his life, he found himself fastened to a woman eight years older than himself, the children whom she had borne to him all dead, except one daughter, his wife passed the age when she could hope to again be a mother, the kingdom with the certainty of civil war before it should the king die without a male heir. In hereditary monarchies, where the sovereign is the centre of the state, the interests of the nation have to be considered in the arrangements of his family. Henry had been married irregularly to Catherine to strengthen the alliance between England and Spain. When, as a result, a disputed succession and a renewal of the civil wars was seen to be inevitable, the king had a distinct right to ask to be relieved of the connection by the same irregular methods. The causa urgentissima for which the dispensing power was allowed was present in the highest degree, and that power ought to have been made use of. That it was not made use of was due to a control exerted upon the Pope by the Emperor, whose pride had been offended and that such an influence could be employed for such a purpose vitiated the tribunal which had been trusted with a peculiar and exceptional authority. The Pope had not concealed his conviction that the demand was legitimate in itself, or that, in refusing, he was yielding to intimidation, and the inevitable consequences had followed. Royal persons who receive from birth and station remarkable favours of fortune occasionally have to submit to inconveniences attaching to their rank, and when the occasion rises, they generally meet with little ceremony. At the outset, the utmost efforts have been made to spare Catherine's feelings. Both the king and the pope desired to avoid a judgment on the validity of her marriage. An heir to the crown was needed, and from her there was no hope of further issue. If at the beginning she had been found incapable of bearing a child, the marriage would have been dissolved of itself. Essentially, the condition was the same. Technical difficulties could be disposed of by a papal dispensation. She would have remained queen, her honour unaffected, the legitimacy of Mary unimpugned, the relations between the Holy See and the Crown and Church of England undisturbed. The obstinacy of Catherine herself the Emperor's determination to support her and the Pope's cowardice prevented a reasonable arrangement, and thus the right of the Pope himself to the spiritual sovereignty of Europe came necessarily under question, when it implied the subjugation of independent princes to another power by which the court of Rome was dominated. Such a question once raised could have but one answer from the English nation. Every resource had been tried to the extreme limit of forbearance, and all had failed before the indomitable will of a single woman. A request admitted to be just had been met by excommunication and threats of force. With entire fitness, the king and parliament had replied by withdrawing their recognition of a corrupt tribunal, and determining thenceforward to try to judge their own suits in their own courts. Thus, on the 10th of May, Cranmer, with three bishops as assessors, sat at Dunstable under the royal licence to hear the cause which had so long been the talk of Europe, and Catherine, who was at Ampthill, was cited to appear. She consulted Chapuis on the answer which she was to make. Chapuis advised her not to notice the summons. "'Nothing done by such a court could prejudice her,' he said. 
unless she renounced her appeal to Rome. As she made no plea, judgment was promptly given. The divorce was complete so far as English law could decide it, and it was doubtful to the last whether the Pope was not at heart a consenting party. The sentence had been, of course, anticipated. On the 27th of April, Chapuis informed the Emperor how matters then stood. Had his earliness done as he was advised, and inserted a clause in the Archbishop's bulls forbidding the Archbishop to meddle in the case, he would have prevented much mischief. He chose to take his own way, and thus the English repeat what they have said all along, that in the end the Pope would deceive your Majesty. The thing now to be done is to force from the Pope a quick and sudden decision of the case, so as to silence those who affirm that he is only procrastinating till he can decide in favour of the King, or who think that your Majesty will then acquiesce, and that there will be no danger of war. I have often tried to ascertain from the Queen what alternative she is looking to, seeing that gentleness produces no effect. I have found her hitherto so scrupulous in her profession of respect and affection for the King, that she thinks she will be damned eternally if she takes a step which may lead to war. Latterly, however, she has let me know that she would like to see some other remedy tried, so she refers everything to me. The proceedings at Dunstable may have added to Catherine's growing willingness for the other remedy. She was no longer an English subject in the eye of the law, and might hold herself free to act as she pleased. Simultaneously, however, a consultation was going forward about her and her affairs in the Spanish cabinet, which was not promising for Chapuis's views. The Spanish ambassador in London, it was said, was urging for war with England. The history of the divorce case was briefly stated. The delay of judgment had been caused by the king's protest that he could not appear at Rome. That point had been decided against the king. The Pope had promised the Emperor that he would proceed at once to sentence, but had not done it. Brief on brief had been presented to the king, ordering him to separate from Anne Boleyn pedente lite, but the king had paid no attention to them, had married the lady and divorced the queen. The emperor was the queen's nearest relation. What was he to do? There were three expedients before him. Legal process, force, and law and force combined. The first was the best, but the king and the realm would refuse the tribunal and the Pope always had been, and still was, very cold and indifferent in the matter, and most tolerant to the English king. Open force in the existing state of Christendom was dangerous. To begin an aggression was always a questionable step. Though the king had married Anne de Boulins, he had used no violence against the queen, nor done anything to justify an armed attack upon him. The question was a private one and the emperor must consider what he owed to the public welfare. Should the third course be adopted, the pope would have to pronounce judgment and call in the secular arm. All Christian princes would then be bound to help him, and the emperor, as the first among them, would have to place himself at the head of the enterprise. But would it not be better and more convenient to avoid, for the present, harsh measures which might bring on war and injure trade, and insist only on further censures and a sentence of deposition against the king. Should the Pope require to know beforehand what the Emperor would do to enforce the execution, it would be enough to tell the Pope that he must do his part first. Any further engagement would imply that the sentence on the principal cause had been decided beforehand. Finally, it would have to be determined whether the Queen was to remain in England or to leave it. These were the questions before the Cabinet. A privy councillor, perhaps Granville, the name is not mentioned, gave his own opinion, which was seemingly adopted. All these ways were to be tried. The Pope must proceed with the suit. Force must be suspended for the present, the course being a personal one and having already begun when peace was made at Combray. The Pope must conclude the principal matter, or at least insist on the revocation of what had been done since the suit commenced. And then, perhaps, force would not be required at all. The advice of the consulta on the answer to be given to the Pope, should he require to know the Emperor's intentions, was exactly right. Nothing more need be said than that the Emperor would not forget the obligations devolved on him as an obedient son of the Church. 
The Queen, meanwhile, must remain in England. If she came away, a rupture would be inevitable. The Speaker advised further that a special embassy should be sent to England to remonstrate with the King. This, however, if unsuccessful, it was felt would lead to war. And opposite to the words, the Emperor himself wrote on the margin an emphatic no. The mention of the Peace of Combray is important. The divorce had reached an acute stage before the peace was concluded. It had not been spoken of there, and the Emperor was diplomatically precluded from producing it as a fresh injury. Both he and the Council were evidently unwilling to act. The Pope knew their reluctance, and did not mean, if he could help it, to flourish his spiritual weapons without a sword to support them. The King wrote to inform Charles of his marriage. In the face of the Scotch pretensions to the succession, he said, other heirs of his body were required for the security of the crown. The thing was done, and the Pope must make the best of it. This was precisely what the Pope was inclined to do. Sifuentes thought that, though he seemed troubled, he was really pleased. He said positively, if he was to declare the King of England deprived of his crown, the Emperor must bind himself to see the sentence executed. Charles had no intention of binding himself, nor would his cabinet advise him to bind himself. The time was past when most Catholic princes could put armies in motion to execute the decrees of the Bishop of Rome. The theory might linger, but the facts were changed. Philip II tried the experiment half a century later, but it did not answer to him. A fresh order of things had risen in Europe, and passionate Catholics could not understand it. Dr. Ortiz shrieked that the king, by his marriage, was guilty of heresy and schism. The emperor ought to use the opportunity without waiting for further declarations from the pope, and unsheath the sword which God had placed in his hands. English peers and prelates, impatient of the rising strength of the commons, and of the growth of Lutheranism, besieged Chapuy with entreaties for an imperial force to be landed, they told him that Richard III was not so hated by the people as Henry, but that, without help from abroad, they dared not declare themselves. Why would they not dare? The king had no janissaries about his throne. Why could they not stand up in the House of Lords and refuse to sanction the measures which they disapproved? Why? Except that they were not the people. Numbers might still be on their side, but the daring, the intellect, the fighting strength of England was against them and the fresh air of dawning freedom chilled their blood. The modern creed is that majorities have a right to rule. If, out of every hundred men, four-fifths will vote on one side, but will not fight without help from the sword of the stranger, and the remaining fifth will both vote and fight, fight domestic cowards and foreign foes combined, which is the right to rule? The theory may be imperfect, but it is easy to foresee which will rule in fact. The marriage with Anne was formally communicated in the House of Lords. There were some murmurs. The king rose from the throne and said it had been necessary for the welfare of the realm. Peers and commons acquiesced, and no more was said. The coronation of the new queen was fixed for the 19th of May. If the great men who had been so eager with Chapuis were poltroons, Chapuis himself was none. Rumours were flying that the Emperor was coming to waste England, destroy the royal family, and place a foreign prince on the throne. The ambassador addressed a letter to Henry, saying that he held powers to take action for the preservation of the Queen's rights, and he gave him notice that he intended to enter immediately on the duties of his office. Henry showed no displeasure at such a bold communication, but sent Thomas Cromwell to him, who was now fast rising into consequence, to remind him that, large as was the latitude allowed to ambassadors, he must not violate the rights of the crown, and to warn him to be careful. He was then summoned before the Privy Council. Norfolk had previously cautioned him against introducing briefs or letters from the Pope, telling him that if he did, he would be torn in pieces by the people. The Council demanded to see the powers which he said that he possessed. He produced directions which he had received to watch over the Queen's rights, and he then remarked on the several briefs by which the king was virtually excommunicated. 
Lord Wiltshire told him that if any subject had so acted, he would have found himself in the tower. The king wished him well, but if he wore two faces and meddled with what did not concern him, he might fall into trouble. Chapuis replied that the council liked the eels of Melun, which cried out before they were skinned. He had done nothing so far. He had not presented any apostolic letters. As to two faces, the earl meant, he supposed, that he was about to act as the queen's proctor as well as ambassador. He was not a lawyer. He had no such ambition. Then, speaking in Latin, because part of the council did not understand French, he dwelt on the old friendship between the emperor and the king. He said that the part which the emperor had taken about the divorce was as much for the sake of the king and the realm as for the sake of the queen although the queen and princess were as a mother and a sister to him. He went through the case. He said their statutes were void in themselves, and even if valid, could not be retrospective. The archbishop had been just sworn to the pope. He had broken his oath, and was under excommunication, and was therefore disqualified to act. He reminded the council of the Wars of the Roses, and told them they were sharpening the thorns for fresh struggles. Dr. Fox the king's armourer, afterwards bishop, replied that the king could not live with his brother's wife without sin, and therefore left her. It was a fact accomplished, and no longer to be argued. To challenge the action of the archbishop was to challenge the law of the land, and was not to be allowed. The pope had no authority in England, spiritual or temporal. The introduction of bulls or briefs from Rome was unlawful, and could not be sheltered behind immunities of ambassadors. Chapuy was the representative of the emperor, not of the pope, and Fox cautioned him against creating disturbances in the realm. To this, Chapuy quietly answered that he would do his duty, let the consequences be what they might. Again, being warned, he said he would wait for two or three days, within which he looked for a satisfactory reply from the king. In leaving the council room, he said, in imperious fashion, as if he was addressing a set of criminals, that reports were current about the emperor which he desired to notice. Some declared that he consented to the marriage with the Lady Anne, others that he meant to make war. Both allegations alike were false and malicious. So far from wishing to injure England, the emperor wished to help and support it, and could not believe that he would ever be obliged to act otherwise. As to consenting to the divorce, if the Pope declared for it, he would submit to the Pope's judgment. Otherwise, the world would not turn him from the path which he meant to follow. He was acting as the king's best friend, as the king would acknowledge if he could forget his passion for the lady and consider seriously his relations with the emperor. He begged the council, therefore, to prevent such rumours from being circulated if they did not wish Chapuis to contradict them himself. The ambassador was keeping within the truth when he said that Charles was not meditating war. Chapuis' instructions, when first sent to England, had been not to make matters worse than they were, not to threaten war, nor to imply in any way that there was danger of war. He had himself, however, insisted that there was no alternative. He had encouraged Catherine's friends with hope of eventual help, and continued to convey to the emperor their passionate wish that his majesty's hand would soon reach England, before the accursed woman made an end of the queen and of them, to tell him that, were his forces once on land, they might raise as many men as they pleased, and the London citizens would stand by, keep the enlistment money, and wait to see which party won. As long, however, as his master was undecided, he would not, he said, take measures which would do no good, and only lead to inconvenience. He had merely given the council a piece of his mind, and had said what no one else would say for fear of Lady Anne. The answer to his letter, which he expected from the king, did not arrive, but instead of it an invitation to dinner from the Duke of Norfolk, which he refused lest his consent should be misconstrued. Ultimately, however, Cromwell came to him with the king's permission. Cromwell, strange to say, had been a strong advocate for the imperial alliance, in opposition to the French, and with Cromwell, the ambassador's relations were more easy than with the Duke. Their conversations are intimate and confidential. Chapuis, 
professed a hope that the king's affection for the lady would pass off, and promised for himself to pour no more oil on the fire till he received fresh orders. If they wished for peace, however, he said they must be careful of their behaviour to the queen, and he complained of the removal of her arms from her barge in the river. Such petty acts of persecution ought to be avoided. The removal of the arms was the work of some too zealous friend of Anne. Cromwell had not heard of it, and said that the king would be greatly displeased. Meanwhile, he trusted that the Spanish notions of honour would not interfere with a friendship so useful to both countries. If it came to war, England would not be found an easy conquest. He defended the king's action. The Pope would not do him justice, so he had slapped the Pope in the face. No doubt he had been influenced by love for the lady. Neither the king himself nor all the preachers in the world would convince him that love had nothing to do with it. But the king was well read in the canon law, and if his conscience was satisfied, it was enough. As Cromwell was so frank, Chapuy asked him when and where the marriage with Anne had been concluded. Cromwell either would not, or could not, tell him, saying merely that Norfolk had not been present at the ceremony, but others of the council had, and there was no doubt that it had really taken place. So matters stood in England, everyone waiting to hear how the Emperor would act. Anne Boleyn was duly crowned at Whitsuntide, a splendid official pageant compensating for the secrecy of her marriage. The streets were thronged with curious spectators, but there was no enthusiasm. The procession was like a funeral. The Pope was about to meet the King of France at Nice. Norfolk was commissioned to attend the interview, and as Henry still hoped that the Duke would bring back an acquiescence in his wishes from Clement, Chapuis saw him before his departure. The Duke said the peace of the world now depended on the Emperor. He repeated that his niece's marriage had been no work of his, her father and he had always been against it, and but for them it would have happened a year before. She had been furious with both of them. She was now enciente, and had told her father and himself and Suffolk that she was in better plight than they wished her to be. To attempt to persuade the king to take Catherine back, either by threat or argument, would be labour thrown away. Such were his scruples of conscience and his despair at having male succession by her. At Cromwell's intercession, the Bishop of Rochester was now released from confinement, and politics were quiet, till the effect was seen at the Nice Conference. Anxious consultations were held at Rome before the Pope set out. The Cardinals met in consistory. Henry's belief had been that Francis was prepared to stand by him to the uttermost, and would carry Clement with him. He was now to find either that he had been misled, or had willfully deceived himself. Cardinal Dunon, who was supposed to have carried an ultimatum from the meeting at Calais, had required the Pope to suspend the process against Henry. If the Pope replied that the offence was too great and that he must deprive him, Francis did not say that he would risk excommunication himself by taking an open part, but had directed the Cardinal to urge the removal of the suit to a neutral place, as had often been proposed. The Pope told the Count de Sifuentes that this suggestion had already been discussed with the Emperor, and that the Emperor had not entirely disapproved. But the cunning and treacherous Clement had formed a plan of his own, by which he thought he could save England and punish Henry. Francis being less firm than he had feared, he thought that, by working on French ambition, he could detach Francis completely from his English ally. The French were known to be eager to recover Calais, what if Calais could be offered them as a bait? They might turn their coats as they had so often done before. Cunning and weakness generally go together. It was an ingenious proposal and throws a new light on Clement's character. Nothing came of it, for the Emperor, with a view to the safety of Flanders and the eventual recovery of the English alliance, declined to sanction a change of ownership on his own frontier. Finding no encouragement, Clement relapsed into his usual attitude. The imperialists continued to press for the delivery of sentence before the Pope should leave Rome. The Pope continued to insist on knowing the Emperor's intentions. A Spanish lawyer, Rodrigo de Valloz, had been sent to Rome to dissuade the Pope from the Nice interview, and to quicken the action of the Rota. 
Queen Catherine Stuart, he said, had been carried on as if it was that of the poorest woman in the world. Since the winters and he had been there, the process had been pushed on, but the advocates and proctors had not received a real. The hands required anointing to make them stick to their business. The cardinals were at sixes and sevens and refused to pull together. Do what the Valoth would. De Valoth, being a skilful manipulator and going the right way to work, pressed the process forward in the rota without telling the Pope what he was doing, since Clement would have stopped it if he had not been kept in ignorance. But, God helping, no excuse was left. The forms were all concluded. Nothing remained but to pass the long talked of sentence. The Pope was so importuned by the French and English ambassadors to suspend it until after the meeting at Nice that de Valos could not say whether he would get it after all. But he told the Pope that further hesitation would be regarded by the Emperor as an outrage and would raise suspicion throughout the whole world. The Pope promised, but where goodwill was wanting, trifles or obstacles. De Valos confessed that he had no faith in his promise. He feared the Pope must have issued some secret brief which stood in his way. Clement, however, was driven on in spite of himself. Judgment on the principal cause could not be wrung from him. Cardinal Salviati was of opinion that they would never give it till the Emperor would promise that it should be executed. But a brief super attentatus, which was said to be an equivalent, Clement was required to sign, and did sign, a bull on which Charles could act if occasion served, the Pope himself swearing great oaths that Henry had used him ill, and that he would bribe Francis to forsake him by the promise of Calais. One more touch must be added to complete the comedy of distraction. A proposal of the Spanish Council to send a special embassy to London to remonstrate with the king had been definitely rejected by the emperor. It was revived by Chapuis, with whom it had probably originated. He imagined that the most distinguished representatives of the Spanish nation might appear at the English court and protest against the ill usage of the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. If the king refused them satisfaction, they might demand to be heard in Parliament. The king would then be placed in the wrong before his own people. The nobles of Aragon and Castile would offer their persons and their property to maintain the queen's right. And Chapuis said, Not a Spaniard would hesitate. If they were privately assured first, as they would not be taken at their vert. Leaving the Catholic powers in confusion and uncertainty, we returned to England. Catherine had rejected every proposal which had been made to her. There could not be two queens in the same country, and after Anne's coronation, a deputation waited upon her to intimate that her style must be changed. She must now consent to be turned Princess Dowager, when an establishment would be provided for her as the widow of the king's brother. Her magnificent refusal is well known to history. Cromwell spoke with unbounded admiration of it. Yet it was inconvenient, and increased the difficulty of providing for her, since she declined to accept any grants which might be made to her under the new title, or to be attended by any person who did not treat her and address her as Queen. It would have been better if she had been required to be allowed to return to Castile, both the Spanish Council and the Emperor had decided that she must remain in England. The Princess had been allowed to rejoin her. The mother and daughter had made short expeditions together, and had been received with so much enthusiasm that it was found necessary again to part them. Stories were current of insulting messages which Catherine had received from the Lady Anne, a false probably, and meant only to create exasperation. The popular feeling was warmly in her favour. She was personally liked as much as Anne was hated, and the king himself was not spared. As a specimen of the license of language, a Mrs. Amadas, witch and prophetess, was indicted for having said that the Lady Anne should be burned, for she was a harlot. Master Norris, Sir Henry Norris, equerry to Henry, was bored between her and the king. The king had kept both the mother and the daughter, and the Lord Wiltshire was bored to his wife and to his two daughters. In July, the news arrived from Rome of the brief de attentatus, and with it the unpleasant intelligence that Francis could not be depended on, and that the hopes expected from the meeting at Nice would not be realised. 
The disappointment was concealed from Anne for fear of endangering the expected child. Norfolk, who had waited in Paris to proceed in the French king's train, was ordered to return to England. Henry was not afraid, but he was discovering that he had nothing to rely upon but himself and the nation. The terms on which France and the Emperor stood towards each other were so critical that he did not expect the Emperor to quarrel with England if he could help it. Chapuy seemed studiously to seek Cromwell. Of Cromwell's fidelity to himself, Henry was too well assured to feel uneasy about their intimacy, and therefore they met often and as freely exchanged their thoughts. Chapuy found Cromwell a man of sense, well versed in affairs of state, and able to judge soundly with not too good an opinion of the Lady Anne, who returned his dislike. Anne was French, Cromwell was imperialist beyond all the rest of the council. I told him, wrote the ambassador to Charles, after one of these conversations, I often regretted your majesty had not known him in Woolsey's time. He would have been a greater man than the cardinal, and the king's affairs would have gone much better. He seemed pleased, so I continued. Now was the time for him to do his master better service than ever man did before. Sentence had been given a home against the king, and there was no further hope that your majesty and the pope would agree to the divorce. I presume that the king, being so reasonable, virtuous, and humane a prince, would not persist any longer and blemish the many gifts which God had bestowed on him. I prayed him to move the king. He could do more with him than any other man. He was not in the council when the accursed business was first mooted. The queen trusted him, and when reinstated would not forget his service. Cromwell took what I said in good part. He assured me that all the council desired your majesty's friendship. He would do his best, and hopes that things would turn out well. If I can believe what he says, there is still a hope that the king may change. I will set the net again, and try if I can catch him. One cannot be too cautious. The king is disturbed by what is past the home. He fears the Pope would seduce the French king from him. Who is this Cromwell that has grown to such importance? Granville had asked. He is the son, replied Chapuis, of a farrier in Chelsea, who was buried in the parish church there. His uncle, father of Richard Cromwell, who was cooked as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Is this Thomas Cromwell is vile in his youth, and had to leave the country. He went to Flanders and to home. Turning sense, he married the daughter of a wool merchant and worked at his father-in-law's business. After that, he became a solicitor. Woolsey, finding him diligent and a man of abilities for good or ill, took him into service and employed him in the suppression of religious houses. When Woolsey fell, he behaved extremely well. The king took him into his secret council. Now he is above everyone, except the lady, and is supposed to have more credits than ever the cardinal had. He is hospitable and liberal, speaks English well, and Latin, French, and Italian tolerably. The intimacy increased. Cromwell, though imperial in politics and no admirer of Anne Boleyn, was notoriously Henry's chief adviser in the reform of the clergy. But to this aspect of him, Chapuy had no objection. Neither the ambassador, nor Charles, nor any secular statesman in Europe was blind to the enormities of churchmen, or disposed to lift a finger for them, if reform did not take the shape of Lutheranism. Charles himself had said that, if Henry had no objects beyond the correction of the spirituality, he would rather aid than obstruct him. Between Chapuy and Cromwell there was thus common ground, and Cromwell's hint that the king might perhaps reconsider his position may not have been wholly groundless. The action of the Chota, pressed through by de Valos, had taken Henry by surprise. He had not expected that the Pope would give a distinct judgment against him. He had been equally disappointed in the support which he expected from Francis. That he should now hesitate for an instant was natural and inevitable. But the irresolution, if real, did not last. Norfolk wrote to the King from Paris, to care nothing for the Pope. There were men enough at his side in England to defend his right with a sword. Henry appealed to a general council when a council could be held which would be more than a papal delegacy. The revenues of the English seas, which were occupied by Campeggio and Giannucci, he sequestrated as a sign of the abandonment of a detestable system. His own mind, meanwhile, was fastened on the approaching confinement of Anne. 
With the birth of a male heir to the crown, he knew that his difficulties would vanish. Nurses and doctors had assured him of a son, and the event was expected both by him and by others with passionate expectation. A Prince of Wales would quiet the national uncertainty. It would be the answer of heaven to Pope and Emperor, and a divine sanction of his revolt. There is danger in interpreting providence before the event. If the anticipation is disappointed, the weight of the sentence may be thrown into the opposing scale. To the bitter mortification of the king and the lady, to the reproach of physicians, astrologers, sorcerers and sorceresses, who affirmed that the child would be a male, to the delight of Chapuis, and the perplexity of a large section of the English people who were waiting for Providence to speak, on the 7th of September, the girl who was afterwards to be Queen Elizabeth was brought into the world. This was the worst blow which Henry had received. He was less given to superstition than most of his subjects, but there had been too much of appeals to heaven through the whole of the controversy. The need of a male heir had been paraded before Christendom as the ground of his action. He had already discovered that Anne was not what his blindness to her faults had allowed him to believe. He was fond of the Princess Mary, and Anne had threatened to make a waiting maid of her. The new queen had made herself detested in the court by her insolence. There had been lovers' quarrels, from which Catherine's friends had gathered hopes, and much must have passed behind the scenes of which no record survives. A lady of the bedchamber had heard Henry say that he would rather beg from door to door than forsake her. On the other hand, Anne acknowledged afterwards that his love had not been returned, and she could hardly have failed to let him see it. Could she be the mother of a prince, she was safe, but on this she might well think her security depended. All Henry's male children, except the Duke of Richmond, had died at the birth or in infancy, and the words she had let fall to her sister-in-law, Lady Rochford, implied a suspicion that the fault was in the king. It was not without significance than the subsequent indictment of Sir Henry Norris. It was alleged that on the 6th of October, 1533, less than a month after Anne's confinement, she solicited Norris to have criminal intercourse with her, and that on the 12th the act was committed. But to this subject, I shall return hereafter. Anyway, the king made the best of his misfortune. The first adventure had failed, and the second might be more successful. The unwelcome daughter was christened amidst general indifference, without either bonfires or rejoicings. She was proclaimed princess, and the title was taken away from her sister Mary. Chapuis, after what Cromwell had said to him, trusted naturally that the king's mind would be affected by his disappointment. They met again. Chapuis urged that it would be easier to set things straight than at an earlier stage. The king, being of a proud temper, would have felt humiliated if he had been baffled. He might now listen to reason. It was said of Englishmen that when they made a mistake they were the more ready to confess it than other people, and so far from losing in public esteem, he would only gain if he now admitted that he had been wrong. The emperor was sent an embassy requesting him affectionately to take Catherine back. His compliance would thus lose all appearance of compulsion. The expectation was reasonable. Cromwell, however, had to tell him in earnest language that it could not be, and that the Catholic party in England, who had hoped as Chapuis hoped, and had found themselves only further embittered by the exclusion of Mary from the succession, became desperate in turn. From this period, their incipient treason developed into definite conspiracy. The leader among the disaffected, and the most influential from his reputed piety and learning, being Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, whose subsequent punishment has been the text for so many eloquent invectives. Writing on the 27th of September to the Emperor, Chapuis says, The good Bishop of Rochester has sent to me to notify that the arms of the Pope against these obstinate men are softer than lead and that your majesty must set your hand to it, in which you will do a work as agreeable to God as a war against the Turk. This was not all. The bishop had gone on to advise a measure which would lead immediately and intentionally to a revival of the Wars of the Roses. If matters come to rupture, the bishop said that it would be well for your majesty to attach to yourself the son of Sir Princess Mary's governess, the Countess of Salisbury, mother of Reginald Pole. 
daughter of Sir Duke of Clarence, to whom, according to the opinion of many, the kingdom would belong. He is now studying at Padua. On account of the pretensions which he and his brother would have to the crown, the queen would like to bestow the princess on him in marriage, and the princess would not refuse. He and his brothers have many kinsmen and allies, of whose services your majesty might make use and gain the greater part of the realm. The Bishop of Rochester might plead a higher allegiance as an excuse for conspiring to dethrone his sovereign, but those who play such desperate games stake their lives upon the issue. If they fail, must pay the forfeit. The Bishop was not the only person who thus advised Chapuy. Rebellion and invasion became the settled thought of the King's opponents, and Catherine was expected to lend her countenance. The Regent's Council at Brussels, bolder than the Spanish, before immediate war. A German force might be thrown across the Channel. The Flemish nobles might hesitate, but would allow ships to carry an army to Scotland. The army might then march south. Catherine would join it and appear in the field. Catherine herself, Bay Chapuy, charged the Pope in her name to proceed to the execution of the sentence in the most rigorous terms of justice possible. The king, she said, would then be brought to reason when he felt the bit. She did not advocate violence in words, though what she did advocate implied violence and made it inevitable. Fisher was prepared for any extremity. The good and holy Bishop of Rochester, Chapuy repeated, would like your majesty to take active measures immediately, as I wrote in my last, which advice he has sent to me again lately to repeat. Without this, they feared this order. The smallest force would suffice. Knowing Charles's unwillingness, the ambassador added a further incitement. Among the preachers, he said, was one who spread worse errors than Luther. The prelates all desired to have him punished, but the Archbishop of Canterbury held him up. The king would not listen to them, and were it not that he feared the people, would long since have professed Lutheranism himself. End of chapter 13